Iowa post game with coach Don Patterson here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. I'm your host, Corey Bratta. Coming to you at about 6.37 p.m. Central Time here in Central Iowa. Um, the Hawkeyes uh, taking an L in the uh, win-loss uh, record this year. Iowa with the 12-10 to 10, uh, fall against Minnesota at home. And... I don't know how to unpack this, and I, I, it took me a little longer to jump on here because I don't really know where to start with all this. And, of course, we're going to have Tom Ta Tom Kaker joining us of HawkeyeReport.com. We'll have uh, Coach John Patterson here shortly as well. I want to be very careful with my words. and I, Maybe I'm not always careful with my words, but I try to be. And I want to make sure I make something clear before I say what I'm going to say in my kind of opening dialogue here. Um. The offense is bad. <laughs> it's it's bad, right? We know this. That's it's it's not like um, what I'm about to say about about the Cooper to Gene play. You know that doesn't take away from how bad the offense is. Um, this game should have never been this close. Um, to to think that a team could even be in a position to win a game when you basically get zero yards offensively until. Well, actually, negative yards offensively until like the second to last drive of the game, at least in that second half. They had negative yards offensively up until that second to last drive that actually kind of flipped the field, got a couple of first downs on that drive. But the offense is just unbelievably bad. And you knew Minnesota was going to load the box more than we've seen from anyone else after what they did last week actually showed Iowa showed life in the run game. But I just want to say this about that that play. And I mean, I, I'm already through like, <laughs> it's been like, what, 25 minutes since that all transpired. I've been watching football my entire life. I've never seen anything like that. And I know we're a society of hyperbole and exaggeration and living in the moment. I've never seen anything like it. And it was honestly, and I know people are, are upset and they have every right to be upset. 
Uh, let me just say something. This is my opinion. You can disagree if you want. I really don't care. Uh, you have every right to be upset, regardless of if you think that Iowa deserved to be in the position, or if you are an en endorser of the Kirk Ferentz era and the Brian Ferentz offense. Both can be true at the same time. You, you, at the same time, you can be upset about the offense and how, I mean, basically the passing game is completely non-existent. The run game did literally nothing in the second. Basically, the offense is right back where we were. At least it feels that way. But you can also say, man, I feel so freaking bad for Cooper DeGene. And, and maybe this maybe this means that I'm a little heartless with this or I'm a little callous with this coaching staff right now. But I don't really feel bad for the coaches. I don't really feel bad for anyone besides Cooper DeGene. Uh, maybe that's unfair to some of the people that were in on special teams. Frankly, I feel bad for the whole team. I, I feel bad for all the players. But Cooper DeGene deserved better on that last play. That play, that punt return. And here we go with the, people are going to accuse me of living in the moment and using hyperbole. That punt return would have been one of the greatest plays in Iowa football history. Is that exaggerating? I, I don't think it is. I, I don't think it is. And you can say, well, you're a generational, Corey. You're, you know, whatever. It would have been one of the greatest plays in Iowa history. I think Cooper DeGene will end up being looked at as one of the greatest players ever to play at Iowa. I think he's that good. And, you know, it's one thing, like, if that play happens and Cooper takes it back to the house – and, you know, by the way, if, if that touchdown had counted, I was winning the game. I think we can all agree Minnesota's not going the length of the field and scoring a touchdown. I think we can all agree on that. All right. You want to argue that you have every right. Didn't sniff the end zone more than what once today and didn't get into the end zone a single time. So they, they were not scoring. The game was over at that point, pretty much de facto. But if he had stepped out, like that's what we all thought the review was for at first, right? That was what was conceivable at first was that Cooper DeGene potentially stepped out of bounds. It was clear he did not. So I don't know about everybody else on here, but when I, you know, when the officials are hovering around that monitor longer than five, 10 seconds or whatever it takes to see that he clearly didn't go out of bounds, my spidey sense went off right away and I started to sweat. But that call, all right, I would have felt bad enough if he had stepped out of bounds and they and had gotten called back. It would have felt terrible for him, but he stepped out of bounds. That is what it is. I've, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a worse call in such a situation. And we've seen terrible calls at every level. So I don't want to say it's the worst call I've ever seen. It's one of the worst calls I've ever seen. I don't know how you explain the call. I don't know how you explain having gone to replay and upholding, not even upholding the call. There was no flag on the field. Let me make sure that's clear. There was no flag on the field. Not that there should have been, but the play was not blown dead. The officials did not call. Well, they did not signal that Cooper DeGene had called for a fair catch, which Cooper did not. <laughs> go back to, go look at the tape. And by the way, I'd love to, sh I'd love just to show this on screen like seven or eight times because I know people, I know it'd be a great talking point. I don't want to risk getting this whole thing demonetized this evening. All right. Um, because somebody else claims rights to the video. I'm not, I'm not going to do that. It's one of the worst calls I've ever seen and one of the worst thefts from any player I've ever seen at any level. And I'm going to stick to that opinion. You can say I'm living in the moment if you want. It's disgraceful. And my thought, honestly, after it happened was, oh, my gosh. I am actually scared for the officials leaving that game. That's That was my thought. And isn't that sad that we're in a society where football means you know, people take it so seriously that you're you're – fearing for the safety of, of some guys in stripes. But I that literally was my my thought. I thought, you know, that you saw the students throwing stuff on the field, bad look for the students. But the reality is that was my thought after that occurred is they need to do everything they can to get these refs out of there safely. And uh, it appeared that they got the stadium cleared, at least from the NBC telecast. And with without any incident, I just hope that people aren't uh, – I hope that this is where it ends, even though I, I shouldn't say where it ends. I hope this is where the fan interaction with and the fan response to this ends. I sure hope Iowa does everything it can with the Big Ten and the NCAA, wherever they need to go, to challenge this. Not that the game the game's not going to get overturned. 
Okay. This is a loss, regardless of how you look at it. They're not going to come back and say, well, you know, Minnesota wouldn't have scored. So it's a, you know, we're, we're going to pick the game up with a minute and a half left. No, it's a loss. But I think for this, the sake of uh, the sake of the dignity of the game, the professionalism of the game, the integrity of the game, I sure hope that it's looked at because it's uh, one of the most disgraceful series of events. One of the most disgraceful calls I've ever seen in my life not just being an Iowa fan, but watching football as a whole. And that comes on the heels of one of the greatest plays I've ever seen, given the moment, given the situation. Would have been one of the greatest plays in Iowa history, taken away from Cooper DeGene. Iowa falls to 6-2 and two on the season. They are still in control of their own destiny, I think. I'd have to look at the standings. Maybe not. Maybe that's not true. Not going to control their own destiny. Kyle's in the Kyle's in the queue shaking his head, but I'm pretty sure they're in control of their own destiny. Let's go to Kyle, who's our first on their Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Kyle. Oh, Kyle just went bye bye. Um, Kyle wanted to double check, I guess. All right. We'll see if we can get Kyle back and hundreds of comments in the chat, folks. I promise we're going to get to as many as we possibly can. As I say, each and every postgame show, we're going to have Coach Patterson joining us shortly. I can guarantee all of our super chats will be thrown up on the screen and acknowledged i cannot guarantee that for the hundreds of chats um that are left non-super chats because uh first of all the response i appreciate everybody being here i know a lot of upset frustrated angry depressed fans right now and i get that and the next two to three hours are hopefully going to be some therapy because i know i need it from a football standpoint after what we witnessed first of all mike was the first in here with the super chat quite simply he says uh quite um Quite to the point, Mike says, fire Kirk. He said it, not me. Mike, thank you for the super chat. Fire Kirk, exclamation mark, times three. Eric says, offensive line play, especially in the second half, was our slit Achilles heel. A good team shouldn't need a gene miracle to win. That is also true, Eric. Again, multiple things can be true at the same time. Multiple things can be true at the same time. Thank you for the super chat. Mike adds in, he says, held Minnesota to 12. Great field position in four-down territory, intercepted. 10 points doesn't win games. Blame the Ferentz family. Correct call, by the way. Correct call. Um, well, I had 13-10 Iowa. That was my call. I don't know if that's what he's referring to. But ultimately, these games aren't hard to predict anymore, are they? <laughs> they're, just, they're just not hard to predict. Like, anybody can do it. By the way, anybody know the score last year of Minnesota-Iowa? It was 13-10. You want to know who predicted 13-10 last year? Me. So uh, it was not hard. It was not going out on a limb with that prediction. Mike, another super chat. Thank you, Mike. The only one robbing Iowa is Brian Ferentz. Dollar sign, dollar sign, dollar sign. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate the super chat. Thank you for being here. Lemansky, please watch our language tonight for the sake of our two hosts. Thank you, Lemansky. And yes, um, I know Kyle is with us now. He's our one moderator that we've got on right now. And I know we've talked about getting multiple moderators on the show. It's something that we should look at with, you know, we're, we're over 700 people between our two shows, our two streams live right now, which is great, but I simply can't get through all the comments. So please don't be hard on Kyle. Don't be hard on other people. And if I miss something, just please be respectful to one another and understand that it is just a game, as frustrating as it is. And I know people don't want to hear that, but it is true. Lemansky adds in, thank you for the super chat. Because of the Kinnick legacy, we deserve major changes in the offseason. It's more than uh, just the Kinnick legacy. Iowa football is bigger than one any one person. That's what I would say. I get what you're, what you're saying, Lemansky, and you're absolutely right. Iowa football is bigger than any one person. And... Had that Cooper to Gene play not had. So that ball bounces a different direction. It goes straight out of bounds. And that play never happens. Likely what happens, and we don't know this, right? We're, the, we're just theorizing. Likely what happens is Iowa fails to get in field goal range and they lose anyways, right? That's probably likely to happen. Now, maybe that took the wind out of the sails, but I mean, the offense didn't really show life at any point in this game. I mean, minus a couple of heroic catches by Addison Estringa. You notice... The only real offense for Iowa, especially in the passing game, is by way of just heroics. It's heroics. That's all it is. It's either Cooper DeGene making a heroic special teams play that creates points or Deontay Vines making an unbelievable catch in the sidelines in the first half 
or it's Addison Estringa making two incredible catches, one of which was called back for illegal touching because he stepped out of bounds. Incredible. Thank you for the super chat, Lemansky. And he adds in, please consider visiting RTI Threads for Cooper merch. What an athlete. I salute Odebolt and their community. I put the link in the chat. The link is in the chat, folks. And the ticker's going at the bottom of the screen. And that's not just for RTI Threads. They're sponsoring the show, folks. Go buy some Cooper to Gene merch. Go support that young man. Um, again, I just don't know what else to say. Thank you, Lemansky. And he adds in, Cooper just woke up the Nile Kinnick ghost of yesteryear. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your support, as always. Jared with the Super Chat. Iowa got hosed, but if we can't get 30 yards in a minute and a half at the end of the game to kick a field goal, we deserve this L. Frankly, all they needed, Jared, I would agree with you, all they needed was 20. All they needed was 20. I'm telling you right now, and I, I said this to somebody I was watching the game with, late in the game, we were talking when they were actually in that first drive trying to press the ball and flip the field like five, six minutes to go. How many yards did they need? And they were at their like own 13-yard line. And I made the comment, I think they probably only need like 40, 45, maybe 50. And my friend laughed at me. He's like, I oh, need 60. Drew Stevens has a 60-plus yard leg. All right? And let me ask you this. If I was down to 12 to 10 with one second to go, and they have an option of a Hail Mary, from the 45 yard line from the Minnesota 45 are you throwing the Hail Mary or are you kicking with Drew Stevens I'm kicking with Drew Stevens every time every single time so your your comment is valid Jared thank you for the super chat but man I think all they needed was 20 to give Iowa a chance a real chance given Drew Stevens leg and he never got that opportunity given multiple opportunities Iowa's offense was given multiple opportunities Mike thank you for the super chat if you wave you shouldn't be able to advance period uh, not true, Mike. I appreciate the super chat. That is not a wave. Okay. We're not going to, I'm not even going to argue. Do I even need to argue about this? Uh, I can show you the official rule. And I tweeted this out here a few minutes ago. Let, let's go ahead and look at the official rule. Just so there's no, no doubt in anybody's mind. Let's take a look at the official rule per the NCAA. All right. Let me see if I can get this here. Per the NCAA. Article two. Uh, let's see here. I believe this is section two, article two, uh, subsection A. Let me pull up the share screen option here so I can show everybody. And again, if you saw me, on, if you saw this on Twitter, you already, uh, you already saw it. Um, a valid signal is a signal given by a player of team B who has obviously signals his intention by extending one hand only clearly above his head clearly above his head and waving that hand from side to side of his body more than once. An invalid signal, Article 3, an invalid signal is any waving signal by a team of team, a player of Team B that A does not meet the requirements of Article 2 above. I don't, I, how is that hard? Why is this hard? <laughs> Why is it hard? It's not hard. The, the, I, I don't even, again, we can't look at it here. Everybody's seen it probably a million times in the last half hour. It's not that difficult. So um, I understand what you're saying, Mike, but that's not what the rule says. Screenwriting scribe. The NCAA needs to come out and make a statement about this because they have uh, they need to have more clarity for players and for referees. Well, I think it probably ends up falling on the Big Ten. I think when situations like this come up and, and potential mistakes are uh, under review, etc. I think the conference has to step in first, I think. Don't quote me on this. Don Patterson will be able to give us a better feel for the situation here in a bit. But thank you for the super chat, uh, screenwriting scribe. Springtime uh, 0502. This is Alex, I believe. He says, all the way from Germany, currently 150 here. My heart broke for Cooper. Feel the same way. Feel the same way. Feel bit bad for that young man who's a great young man and a great, great football player. Thank you, Alex, for the super chat. Mike, do you mind talking through the rule? I think I just did, Mike. We're going to talk about that rule more when Coach Patterson gets here. I'm sure we'll talk with Tom Cakert about it as well. Um, and people I know are streaming in. Hang tight here. We're just about through with our super chats, and then we'll get to our phone line, um, and we'll talk more about the situation. Spencer in the chat, he says, the NCAA rule on the invalid fair catch is awful. The NFL rule requires a hand above the head to prevent this. I'm reading from the NCAA rule book. 
Spencer says Coop didn't fair catch under either. I'm I'm reading that from that is from screenshotted from the NCAA rule book. So unless the Big Ten has a different rule that outweighs what the NCAA has said, I just read what the invalid fair catch rule is. So I, I think I, I hope we're on the same page, Spencer, but we're gonna have time to talk this through. But I just again that was taken from the NCAA rule book. Alex adds also the fourth down and shorts not going for it. Your thoughts. Defeatist attitude. Defeatist attitude. That that's my those are my thoughts. And you know, I said it when it happened. Hey, if this works and Iowa wins, you know, 13 12, Kirk's not gonna probably even get asked about not going for it on fourth and inches twice. But if you, when you don't have the confidence to get up with a 260 pound quarterback and get half a yard from midfield, and you're that dependent, you're that scared to lose field position. That tells me you have such a big problem on your hands. I mean, I, I can't even really put it into to words. Um, so anyways, thank you for all the super chats. Keep them coming. Um, we'll, we'll get to all of them. But uh, again, we're, we're here to talk Iowa, Minnesota, the 12 to 10 loss at the hands of the Gophers. Let's try to go back to Kyle in our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Kyle, welcome. I'd ask how you're doing, Corey, but I already know. <laughs> Am, am I right? I'm assuming you probably, given who you are and how you operate, I'm guessing you probably went to look up the rule as well. Absolutely. And I've, I've got a couple things on this, but I, I just want to say there, there's there's two two different thoughts I had when this happened, okay? First of all, if that was the other way around and Cooper DeGene makes that signal and he gets absolutely destroyed by a Minnesota defender because they didn't see the fair catch signal either, no right. Hawk acted like they saw a signal, no right. Minnesota players acted like they saw a signal. So right. if a Minnesota defender just destroys him, are we calling a late hit there? No. No, we're not calling a late hit. Well, it, listen, here, here's the bottom line. The play was not blown dead. No, it wasn't blown dead. So I, I don't know how, if the play's not blown dead, how do we even go back and blow it dead? How do we blow it dead after the fact? Maybe I'm in the wrong frame of mind here, but how do you even blow it dead after the I don't understand anything and the fact that the officials are watching there's an official watching for this yeah. so what's I didn't even know you could review that no I didn't even know it was reviewable never seen it reviewed and I've watched I don't know 12 years of Hawkeye football every single game it's it's not listen it's as simple as this it's not a fair catch this is no. not a fair catch this is not a fair catch no <laughs> it's not a fair catch <laughs> they, they, they didn't give Cooper an explanation either. Cooper said right after the game, I was watching him. He said immediately after the game, they didn't, the refs didn't give me, usually if a call is that controversial, they will go to the coach and they'll go to the player and they'll give them an explanation. And Cooper said, they didn't even talk to me. They didn't say anything. Well, I saw Elliot Clough of uh, rivals tweet out. I wanted an investigation with every one of these officials. And I know people throw that around a lot and that never goes anywhere. Right. No. It never goes anywhere. It's there not. were some absolutely horrific calls. Iowa, Nebraska, I think it was back in 2019. I don't know if you remember that game, Kyle, but it was in Lincoln. Iowa won the game. Mm -hmm. And had they not, it was one of the worst officiated games I'd ever seen. But they won the game. Um, and so had had Iowa went down and and somehow gotten 20 yards, kick a game-winning field goal with Drew Stevens there at the end and win, this would be a huge talking point. But it, there, there would be less accountability needed. I guess <laughs> that sounds terrible because the moment was. Am, am I being am I being um, hyperbolic when I make the comment that I think that Absolutely. was one of the greatest plays in Iowa football history? I mean, he he put a sorry team on his back. And he's done he, it. He did it against Michigan State. He's done it multiple times. He Cooper DeGene had a longer scoring play than any of Iowa's scoring drives in the game at the end of a rivalry trophy game with the Big Ten West on the line. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, and I, I... Just to, and to keep, like, going on this as well, one thing that I think about as well, because I, I love football, I'm a huge football guy, but I also love basketball, and this is something that comes up a lot in basketball, is, like, yeah, we talk about letter of the law and, like, how we interpret these rules, but how about just the nature of the game? How many times have we seen when we go to the Final Four or, you know, the NCAA tournament – the NBA finals, the NBA playoffs, where the game gets a little more physical. 
or something something changes in the way the game's played. And we don't call things by the letter of the law. We call things on the nature of the game. The nature of that play was Cooper didn't signal for a fair catch. Whether he actually did or not, nobody interpreted it that way. When we go based on the letter of the law, we rob ourselves of allowing the sport to just play out. And those games, I understand, you know, comparing it to a championship game, whatever. The NBA playoffs, you know, we have 12 games in the season. These, every single one of these games are vital. These are not like one out of 82. And to make a, I mean, the refs knew this was a game deciding play. This was not a, you know, it might go one way or the other. They, they watched the game just like everybody else did. They knew it was a game deciding play. And they, I mean, I mean, do you know, do you understand what I'm saying? Like yeah, I do. We down to the end of the fourth quarter and, you know, there's a little bit of hand checking in a playoff game. Is anybody complaining that there's hand checking that's not called? Here, here's the deal. And here's the difference. Hand checking or, or arm bar, whatever we're talking about rule at any level. There is, I guess you could argue there are, there are some, there's some, um, there's some gray area, right? And you're going to allow some physicality. That's just, this is such an egregious miss according to the rule book, like based on what I just read, and I know somebody else said, well, the, the, the rule is different in the NCAA. I'm reading from the NCAA rule book that a valid signal is a signal given by a player of Team B who has obviously signaled his intention, obviously signals his, his intention by extending one hand only. So he was already moving both hands. So even if we want to argue the hand was up, he had both hands up, and that's an invalid signal. Yeah. He extended one hand only. He had to extend one hand only clearly above his head. And waving from side to side of his body more than once. He did not do that. He did not do that. Very simple. It's very simple. He did. And again, I don't I don't want this to take away from you know reflecting on how bad this performance was because like we we're gamming back and forth during the game. Like I was enraged before that play. Like watching that second half, how bad the execution was. I know. How bad the play calling was. I was irate before that play happened. And that added on to it. I mean, we're you're obviously in for a long couple of hours here, but like we that the whole the whole environment of everything that went into that play we'll never we'll never see anything like that ever again. I don't think. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I know this is just football, but someone like Cooper and this is kind of an old cliche thing, and I'm sure Don will say this when he gets on, but it's true. Th- these are the types of moments. Like, this is still going to be on his college tape. And oh. NFL scouts are going to see that, and they're not going to give a crap what the stupid Big Ten officials, you know, I'm not going to accuse them of anything um, disingenuous, but they're, they're not going to care about that. They're yeah. going to see one of one of the greatest plays in, in college football this year. Mm -hmm. Um, again given the moment too right i mean we have to understand the situation making guys miss and the fact that he's done it before the fact that you knew you basically we this is incredibly sad to say but we kind of knew iowa was not scoring and i even made the comment before that punt i'm like yeah well here we go they either need a blocked punt or they need a miracle from cooper to gene and i even said i said if i'm minnesota i'm kicking nowhere near cooper nowhere near nowhere you're kicking out of bounds if i if you know if i'm putting them at midfield they can't get a first down I would do that in the first quarter, given Iowa's offense. Yeah. Would you not? Yeah. It's it's one of their only chances to have a play longer than twenty yards. Yeah. No, I I uh, I was surprised they kept the ball in in the field of play, and you're right. Nobody, nobody on either side of the ball treated it as a fair catch. Nobody. And here's here's the other thing too. If there was any, if there was one percent of Minnesota that thought that was a fair catch. Cooper DeGene signaled for the fair catch, supposedly, running towards the Minnesota sideline and catching the ball at the Minnesota sideline. If he catches the ball after signaling for a fair catch and spins past five defenders and run for, runs for a touchdown, do you not think the entire Minnesota coaching staff is pointing at him saying, it was dead, it was dead? And I I, I would be curious. I, I'm just curious to know because it did, did they, and I asked this question to my buddies who were watching the game with, did they actually, did the, the NBC rules expert say anything when they were reviewing it? Did they bring him on? It when, was, uh, I, I don't know if it was the rules official or if it was just the announcer. I know somebody said that it, something about it not being an egregious call. It was like, um, 
he said there was some kind of judgment in it, but he said it something. It was the quote was by the letter of the law something. It was not a. I'm talking about before they even came back from the review. When they first went to review, everybody thought it was because he was maybe out of bounds. Yeah, no, they didn't didn't say anything about. I don't remember the. They brought in the rules official at that point, didn't they? Before the call was uh, was determined from the review. I I think so. I can't remember. I I could be wrong on that, but I know nobody, nobody, whether it be, uh, whether it be what's his face, Anthony Heron, or. The other key, the other guys an Iowa native who whose name escapes me, um, none of, nobody on the TV telecast even implied any chance of anything like that. So that's why I'm wondering who even generated that. Like I wonder if it was somebody in the Minnesota sideline, had somebody from the outside, maybe because I I know like they have um do they not have like the right somebody from an outside like wherever they're stationed wherever the headquarters are can um come into the main referee's headphones basically and, and tell them to review something. Yeah, but I want to, well, yes, but well, there's an official upstairs, right? But I want to know when they first went to review, who said what? Yeah. We, we got to stop this. Look to see if he went out of bounds or we got to stop this to see if he fair caught. Cause like yeah. you said, nobody else, nobody, nobody ex- even had the thought that maybe that was a fair catch. Nobody. No. So somebody at some point had to come up with the idea. Oh, this may have been a fair catch. And yeah. I'd love to know who that was. If that was someone on Minnesota's sideline that said something to the officials, I'm yeah. just curious how that happened. We'll never know. Yeah. So. I mean, it and yeah, it's it's just so incredibly frustrating. But I mean, beyond beyond the fair catch, I know it's so hard to get past that. That Minnesota defense was the 63rd ranked FBS defense in the country heading into this game. They gave up 350 yards to the Raging Cajuns, and they gave up 492 yards to Northwestern. Yeah. And we had 127 yards, two in the second half, 11 rushing yards, and not even half a yard per carry. And you know what, Kyle? I was going to come on this show if Iowa won this game. I was going to come on this show, praise Cooper to Gene, talk about how unbelievable he was, and yet at 7-1 – Criticism or not, I was going to come on this show and say, we are in trouble moving forward. Because I, this is not sustainable. And there's a there's a faction of the fan base that gets actually physically mad, angry, when you say anything critical about the team when they're 6-1 and one or 7-1. and one. There's yeah. a faction of the fan base that just thinks you're a, just a, a traitor to the state. I heard, I heard people, multiple, and it was, uh, it was uh, you had this conversation on from the Voice of College Football, but... It was multiple people that were saying there's a path to the college football playoff. I mean, I even said that from a from a from an actual practical standpoint, there was right. You win out and it's possible. But we also laughed. We also laughed because of how ridiculous the notion was. I I told you before the game, they're going to lose another game. And I wouldn't be surprised if this is the if if this is not the last one. The offense. The defense is so good it wins you games. The offense is so bad it loses you games. You can't get away with doing this week after week after week. They're walking a tightrope against a 500 football team. And guess what? I'm going to say the same thing I've said. I said last year and the year before. And for the people that say, well, you're just, you always want the next guy. No. If you've known me for a long, long time, you'll know that I never, I never did this with Nate Stanley, never did it with Ricky Stanzi. Even when Ricky Stanzi was throwing pick after pick after pick, never did it with Jake Rudock, actually. I was actually a Jake Rudock fan when everybody was on him to switch to CJ Beathard. The idea that, and it's nothing against Deacon Hill. I mean, I don't have anything against Deacon Hill. I, I'm done criticizing players. It, I don't. Yeah, it's, it's exactly, exactly. And, Deacon's got some upside. He's got an arm and he's got some tools. I just think it's so egregious and inexcusable that there seems to be no creativity whatsoever. None. I mean, there's no ingenuity at all. No desire to be creative. Like you look at what Jeff Brom did against Iowa in 2021, bringing out three quarterbacks against an undefeated Iowa team in Kinnick and beating down on the Hawkeyes. That's called creativity. He did it with three t- uh, quarterbacks, and yet there's Iowa people who will tell you, <laughs> if you have three quarterbacks, you don't have one. A little bull. Nobody, n- anybody, listen, anybody with a pulse realizes that Deacon Hill, first of all, he had two turnovers today. I felt bad for him, but he had two strip sacks today. Th- I'm three sorry, turn. three. Had the three at the interception. The end, but the yeah. two strip sacks today, one of which cost, cost some points directly. Yeah. So what is he giving you 
that any of the other guys couldn't give you. What's the number one excuse that they would tell you if they said, if they were to give you a reason for not running an exhaust? We heard it. We heard it last year, Kyle. We don't want to over. That's the excuse. I know. And that's what over. that's what Kirk said last week after the Wisconsin game is, oh, well, you, you know, the one thing Deacon didn't do is he didn't turn it over. So that's really good. What, what do you say tonight after that? What do you say tonight after that? You, you can't. They'll find, they'll find something. They'll find something that, and the, the punt return called back is like, it's like a microcosm for the whole season. It's just another way to squeeze your way out of something that you have screwed up. I mean, the whole coaching staff on the offensive side, including Kirk Ferentz have no excuse for this. And at the last second, they get something that he can go to the press conference and say, well, we were in position to win the football game bar one bad call, you know, I how okay. How many injuries would it take for Ohio State to host Minnesota, three and three Minnesota, and score ten points and have 127 yards? How many injuries would it take for them to have 127 total yards against that defense at home? I don't want to hear injuries. We're playing it. Players. We're, we're playing a different game. And by the way, I made the comment during the game today, Kyle, um, that if Cade McNamara were quarterbacking, things would be better, but they would be marginally better. They'd be marginally better. They would not be that much better. Like no, that's they, what I'm saying. So I'm not saying I'm not acting like oh Marco Linez or Joey Labus. Somebody's going to go in there and save the day. But I'm just talking about doing something different, being creative. All right. Yeah. As opposed to throwing the same screenplay five times in a row and it gaining negative one every time. Have Do you, something that's I, unique. In that play, I know more than five mm-hmm. yards one time this season. <laughs> Kyle, I got to let you slide, but. <laughs> Feel free. I know you're probably got to get to bed early. Feel free to jump on later with Coach Patterson if you stick around, but I appreciate you calling in. All right. Sounds good. Thank you, sir. All right. So so I, I see some comments in the chat. So James, or excuse me, Jared is in the chat. He said, read the invalid fair catch rule. It's an invalid fair catch signal. That was the call. I just read that. Invalid signal. Uh, an invalid signal is any waving signal by a player of Team B that does not meet the requirements of Article 2, which we just read, or B that is given after a scrimmage kick is caught beyond the neutral zone, strikes the ground, or touches another player beyond the neutral zone. Invalid signal. Or C that is given after a free kick is caught, strikes the ground, or touches another player. Somebody send me the official. If that's not the official rule, send me the official rule. I'm reading this from, this is the NCAA's rule book, official rule book. So unless there, unless I'm completely, unless there's a change, this was updated in 2017. So unless there's been a significant change to the rules since 2017, somebody send it to me. And I don't need somebody to tell me, oh, you're wrong. Or you're not. Send it to me. Send me the official rule book. Send me a link to it in the, in the chat, wherever. Send it to my email. I don't care what you do. Text it in and we'll talk about it. But I just read, this is from the NCAA's website. Anyways. All right, let's go back to our phone line. We've got uh, we've got a number of people waiting on TCU Hawkeye. Paul is uh, is on here with us. Let's go to our Iowa Smokehouse call-in line. TCU Hawkeye, how you doing, buddy? Good, Corey. How are you tonight? Doing good. Looks like you got a pool in the background. You're about to take a dip. Yeah, man. I I told my wife. She looked at me after everything that happened. She's like, I think you're in a state of shock right now. I said, I, I agree. Uh, what we saw tonight was a travesty. Uh, a miscarriage of justice. Um, I follow Go Iowa Awesome during the game. That's kind of the, the forum that I'm following. And, you know, all these guys come out after the game and say, oh, well, we deserve to lose. You know, the offense is trash. You know, none of that matters because it's a one-play game. I don't know if you watched – I don't know if it was the Monday night game with the the Saints when the guy dropped the touchdown in the end zone and yeah. he was real down on himself and – you know, he's kind of saying in his post-game interviews, it's it's a game of a hundred and however many plays, one play doesn't matter. But he kind of said it facetiously, saying, "No, one play does matter," and that play completely mattered. And as you said, that's probably the biggest play in Hawkeye history that I that I've seen. I'm, I turned forty in four four days, so I've been watching since '93, and Cooper. J- Cooper DeGene is the most electric, the best Hawkeye player that since I've been watching since, since Tim Dwight. Um, and I was sitting there, you know, obviously 
stoked out of my mind. Um, we we all were like nobody, oh. none of us in the moment, no real Hawkeye fan in the moment is sitting there saying, "Ah, oh, we didn't deserve this." Like, come on, everybody's no. going nuts over one of the, like you said, one of the greatest plays, and I don't know that it was one of the more or most impactful plays in Iowa history because this is still not a team that's going to win a championship or no. go to the play. I mean, we're going to go to the playoff probably anyways, even if they won tonight. But for from a game perspective, a single singular game perspective. It's one of the most incredible plays, given what Kyle talked about, what you just said in Iowa history. Best, best, most important play I've seen in my lifetime, you know, from 2005 LSU take to Holloway, extremely yeah. important. But, you know, is is LSU, I don't even remember the Outback Bowl, whatever it was. It was a great play. I was Capital one, yeah. Um, the number one play right now is 2015. Uh, Bethard to the wide receiver, 85-yard touchdown play in the Big Ten Championship. That would be number one as far as importance. But, uh, you know, what well, we thought tonight was the biggest play. Yeah, and the pro- problem with that is they, they lost that game. And they lost that game fair and square, right? I mean, this oh, was – 100%. This play happened, should have won them the game. I think we can all agree they were winning this game with that touchdown on the board. Was there any 100%. chance that Minnesota – Was there any chance Minnesota went down the field and scored a touchdown? Not a chance in hell. <laughs> what – what what I saw, I was sitting there, and you know they start reviewing it. And I'm like, oh, they're just they're just gonna see if he's stepping out of bounds. First replay showed he's nowhere. He, you know he's not within no. six inches of the the boundary. Um, and then I saw the play, or excuse me, I saw the the shot of the ref writing notes down. I said at that moment, I told my wife they're they're calling I'm bringing it back. It back. That's when they're that's yep. when they're putting. Oh, he was on the 50 yard line and. And when that hit, I said I knew it is coming back. And to the for for the life of me, I've I've never seen a play called back. Obviously, when he was um, when he was motioning his arm to the left, that, that was the clear out motion, right? That was a hey, everyone stay away. The ball's gonna bounce. We're waiting to see where that's at. That was not above his shoulders. That wasn't above his head, like you mentioned back to the rules. That was not above his head, saying fair catch and. It's a travesty, man. It's it's a miscarriage of justice. And uh, again, I follow those forums, and everyone says we deserve to lose this game. The offense is trash. We all know that. That that's not anything new. I told my wife when we started that drive before we punted with two minutes left. I said we either need a defensive turnover or a special teams miracle to happen to win this game, and we got it. We we absolutely got it. And with that one play, for it to be called back. You know, it's it's scary to think that whatever refs were looking at that and whatever it was New York or the Big Ten conference, you know, instant well, replay office. And let tell me just me make how that works. Difference. Let me make well, first of all, I don't know. I think the bit like I said, I think the Big Ten conference will most certainly look at this, but I want to make something clear. Um, let me just uh, get rid of this. So to our caller. Our caller on the phone line, I'm going to put you on hold. So you're going to, have to stay on hold. I know you just called and then you hung up and come back. Anyways, so Kyle, thank you for the super chat. Uh, and then he adds with another super chat. Corey, did you watch the TV explanation? I was at the game and the small snippet I saw seemed to indicate invalid. Didn't mean not a fair catch, but meant it was an infraction and dead ball. Based on what I just read, I don't see anything. I don't see the word infraction anywhere in this section of the rule book. I don't see infraction anywhere. So unless I'm missing something, I ju- I'm reading from the rule book. All I see is it says invalid signal. I'm just curious, and, and Kyle brought it up. If he doesn't, if he grabs the ball there and gets hit and, and a fumble occurs, what happens? If Minnesota recovers the fumble and takes it to the house, what happens? That's my question. Because I guarantee you they're not calling it back and saying he waved his left hand and so that's an infraction. I've just never heard that. And like I said, I'm, I, I don't read anything here. All I read is invalid signal, which would indicate to me that it's not a signal. It's a not a fair catch. Guys do this all the time. They can do that. Oh, I mean, you do that all the that's time. That's a clear out signal. Let's say stay away. Stay away. <laughs> get, yeah. get out of the area. That's not saying you don't fair catch a ball that's about to be hit and land in bounds. You you don't fair catch a ball when you plan on it hitting the ground. Yeah. And I think and I even noticed at one point he kind of pointed up. I, I know if you know if you saw that when you watched it back, but he he kind of gave the clear out signal and then he kind of went like this, but he was waving both arms, pointing up, never went above his head with the hand. 
So it was clearly never a valid signal. Now, um, based on Kyle's question, I, I can't answer that. We'll see what Don Patterson, we'll see what Tom Kakert has to say when they jump on. Um, I've just, I've never heard of infraction. And when I search for this rule in the NCAA rule book, this is all I could find. I see nothing about an infraction so that when a guy gives indication of some sort of a hand signal, that that means it's an invalid, invalid signal, hence an infraction. I also didn't know that in, even if it was an infraction, that you can go back and review that. Yeah. I've never heard of that either. So anyways. You clearly thought that, in, in my opinion, I clearly thought the replay was due to him stepping out of bounds. And right. he wasn't anywhere close to stepping out of bounds. And then for them to go back after the fact and – you know, use that replay as a way to say that he used whatever unofficial way to call a fair catch. Is, it's 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 a travesty. And I think what people are not remembering is what this Iowa team is, right? Their defense, their special teams. They have never won a game this year unless they've had a full onslaught of defensive turnovers, big plays, special teams, big plays. And that was one of the top three moments. Like I said, you know, you got 2005, you got 2015, you have that as the biggest moment I've seen as a Hawkeye fan. And for them to be able to take that away, I mean, it's a travesty. It's and it's the most, it's also the most, it's also the most heroic. And, and what Kyle said earlier about putting a team on your back because we've never seen somebody make a play like this with a particular unit that was so helpless. Like, Absolutely. There's never been a unit in such need in a game for a play like this. So, anyways. No, Cooper Jean all year, Michigan State, as you mentioned earlier, you know, he takes the team, puts them on his back, and says, I'm going to get us out of this bad situation we're in. We understand the offense, and I told my wife when we took over, I said, we need maybe 20, 30 yards. And, you know, we have the ability to kick a 57-yard field goal to win the game. You know, it's it's yeah. it's within reason that all we need is two mid-medium two completions, yeah, to get to where we need it. Like you said, Aston Stringa, hell of a game. I was excited to see him get back off the injury list and be able to play. I think we uh, – it shows you how deep we are on tight ends. Um and, you know, a couple of things I want to mention is, you know, guys are mentioning the fourth down. How many times did we not get a first down on third and one? You guys want us to – you got to understand, this is the Iowa team we're playing with, right? You guys are look, watching other teams play, but you have to live within the vacuum that Iowa football is. So do you want us to go for it on fourth and one at the 45-yard line when we've clearly shown we have an inability to get yardage when it's important? So punting – with this team is the right call. I, well, you know. never, uh, Adam. I've never seen, and we've only seen a couple, but I've I've not I've yet to see Deacon Hill not get half a yard on a QB sneak. I've I've yet to oh, see God. that. They've, they've ran the ball th two, three or four sneaks. He's never gotten less than half a yard. Absolutely, so I, two hundred sixty. What they claim. That's that's what I'm saying. So minimal. that's my issue with it. They should be able yeah. to get up there with him, with Hayden Large behind him or not, and get a half a yard, get a foot or get two feet. And that's my problem. I agree with you no, on the whole playing it, looking at it in a vacuum and understand like against Wisconsin, I understood to a point why they kicked the, I understood why they kicked the second field goal against Wisconsin. They were playing with a comfortable lead that kick late in the game last week, extended the lead to a two score game. That that's totally different in a situation like this early to me, it was too early to be that conservative. I don't look at it. I think Kirk looks at it and says, it's too early to take that risk, but that's where him and I completely differ in mindset. Is to me, it's too early to be that conservative when you no, have a two hundred sixty pound quarterback a get a, a, a foot or two. <laughs> well, you're right because you know all you need to do is you know get a push from behind. You have a two hundred sixty is what they claim. The dude looks two seventy five. All I'm two sixty, and that guy is you know he's busting out of his jersey at the top. So. You know, he's clearly 275 with if a half yard push from Logan Jones and Hayden Large giving a push from behind is unacceptable or not capable, then, you know, what are, what are we doing? But uh, what I'm saying is we're working within our offense. I can't stand Brian Ferentz. The, the fact that that guy, I told my wife, he shouldn't have a job tomorrow. I mean, he should, 
Lane Kiffin tarmac is we should do, you know, Iowa City hotel, wherever he's at tonight, he needs to be run run off. I mean, well, the offense is a joke. It's it is. Joke. And 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 again, we we go we have the circular conversation every week and every year now for the last three years. Whose fault is it that you don't have the personnel to have confidence on fourth and one? Whose fault is it? If it's not That's the right. coach's fault, whose fault is it? I just, you know, the 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 finger pointing away from the people that matter bothers me. Adam, I appreciate your phone call. Um, I got to let you slide, but please, please feel free to call in again and uh, stay checked in despite despite the offense. Yeah, thanks, Corey. You're doing a hell Thank of a job. I appreciate the content. Thank you, sir. Appreciate Adam calling in, and we've got a plethora of callers. Again, we await Coach Don Patterson, and we await um, Tom Cakert. Uh, to uh, our viewer, I think it was uh, – let's see. It was Michael in the chat. No, I'm not going to – I cannot put you ahead in line. We have a line of callers. I'm not going to put you ahead in line just because you asked to be ahead in line. I appreciate you being here, but we've got a bunch of people who have been on since the start of the show. So, no, I, I, I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. Let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. By the way, once we get to Coach Patterson, we're going to be shortening calls like I promised. So I'm just telling you right now, if I cut you off early later on, be aware that that's going to happen. Eric with the Super Chat says, how is this allowed to keep happening? This offense is beyond embarrassing. Love to hear anyone defend the Ferentz twins. Thank you for the Super Chat, Eric. Appreciate uh, your honesty, how you feel on the situation. You're not alone. Mike? We've got to talk about how bad Deacon is. Yeah, he, he's not playing very well right now. And um, there's a reason. I mean, not ripping him, but there's a reason why he was going to transfer to Fordham in the offseason, right? There's a reason why he never sniffed the field at Wisconsin. And offenses wasn't very good either last year and then was going to transfer to Fordham. He, he's not a starting – right now, at least, he is not a Big Ten level starter. And he's not supposed to be. He's a backup. The problem is they dealt with an injury, um, but that does not take away from the accountability that everybody involved here deserves and the fact that Iowa's had subpar quarterback play going on four years now is, I think, inexcusable given how quickly things can change over the course of four years. Um, it, quarterback play has been a weakness every single one of those years, and a couple of those years they won quite a few games, and they're probably going to win quite – they're probably still going to win – Nine to 10 games this year. Probably. With the schedule, probably. Anyways, uh, we're going to go to Paul, and then I noticed uh, we've got Coach Patterson joining. So, Paul, uh, appreciate you calling our Iowa Smokehouse line. Thanks for uh, taking my call, Corey. Absolutely. Uh, it It's really hard to win a game when you only have two yards of offense in the second half. Well, it's, it's, not, it's not that it's it, – it should be impossible. It almost should be – like, it should be impossible. Uh, the, anybody who thinks that – go back to the whole conversation about uh, evaluating our staff and the coordinators by wins and losses. Are we really going to sit here and not pee our pants when we say, well, everybody on this staff got the job done? Yeah, the offense only – you know, they had negative two yards in the second half, but we, we win as a team, we lose as a team. And we win, so we're, that's that's good enough. There's no reason to to uh, look at where we're at right now. And for the record, make clear, I am by no means implying that Brian Ferentz is the only problem here. <laughs> okay. no, he's uh, not. He's not the only problem here. Believe me. Oh, and, and you're right. And I, I heard something last week that I think summed up Iowa football pretty well. And that is, as long as Iowa goes to a bowl game, no one – that, that's fine with most of the fan base. I mean, uh, well, w w would you disagree? That is, there is a large segment of the fan. I don't know that a bowl game is the right meter because I was consistently won eight to nine games over the last however many years. So I don't know what would happen. I don't know what will happen. What, what's here's my question, Paul? What's going to happen moving forward, like in 2024 and 2025? If I, if all of a sudden the norm at Iowa, if Kirk's still here and Brian's still here, and the norm at Iowa becomes, can we get to bowl eligibility? Are those those same people that are comfortable with seven or eight wins now? Are those same people going to say, well, man, six or seven wins with this tough schedule? We better be happy with that because we are in a we have a gauntlet of a schedule. Are those same people going to be reasoning that way? 
I mean, I, I wouldn't know, but I mean, we seem to be okay with that uh, 10 years ago. 10, 15 uh, well, years ago, we seemed to be okay with that. Seven and five, six and six, we seem to be okay with that. And we weren't calling for Brian's head then. The Big Ten West has, well, the, the Big Ten West has changed. And keep in mind, this is not all Brian. We just said that. Things were different in 17, 18, 19. Personnel-wise, obviously, there was some carryover from the previous regime. I know a lot of people didn't like Greg Davis and that staff. But it's we've seen a we've seen a steady decline. If you go back to 2019, I know everybody wanted to blame the departure of Chris Doyle. Go back to 2019, the interior of Iowa's offensive line was awful in 2019. So I don't know that you can point at one. Everybody wants to point at one thing. Oh, it's Brian, or it's Chris Doyle being you know gone, or it's it's George Barnett, or it's Kirk. There there are so many dysfunctional things with all of this that I don't think it's a one solution fixes all. I don't. No, I've I never claimed that it is. I don't think it is either. It's just, uh, like I said, it seems Iowa fans are okay at the end of the year, as long as they go to a warm place for the bowl game. Hey, you know what I was told the other day? I was told, uh, Paul, that the Las Vegas Bowl is now in a uh, Big Ten Bowl. I don't there know if you knew this. So that's actually, but that's a low end. So if they'd have, probably have to go six and six or seven and five, that's actually a decent, like that's a great bowl game to go to this time of year. Well, at least in December, January. Go down to Vegas. It's really warm. It's dry. You can probably get cheap hotels. Flights down there are usually reasonable. That's a good place for Iowa fans. Yeah. I mean, that's – and I think that's – I think under Barter, that was the mindset was, hey, we went to the bowl game. What else – what more do you want? Yeah. I think that was his mindset. Now, it's going to be curious with the interim director, is that going to be her mindset? Or is she, is she going to be an actual administrator and say – we're done or you know what what's going to happen here well the only thing I can, i'm concerned about I, I, so far I, i'm really impressed with beth getz and what she's brought to this administration here what two months in my only hesitancy is she is not i don't have any reason to think she's a hawkeye at heart and not that you have to be no but it's not like she's a former legendary coach that's now the ad like a like a barry alvarez um or a tom osborne like she's she's been around here, right? She's been on. Uh, she's been an employee. She's been a part of this administration, but Barta was very much. Uh, well, I don't know what Barta really stood for. It frankly. was his way or the highway. Yeah, and honestly, if the money's there and there's, you know, like you said, there's a there's a standard of wins that keep people coming and keep the money flowing. I don't really know that there was too there. There wasn't much concern with making change, right? No You're fix with. You're Not still broken. selling out games, so apparently right. so, everything but, must be fine. But I'm saying with Beth Getz, if there's not an emotional connection to the job and to Iowa, is she going to go against the grain of what society has been with Iowa football for the last 23, 24 years? Say they win nine games this year and the offense is abysmal. Is she going to go against that grain? I don't have the answer to that. I hope okay. not, but I don't have the answer to that. I, I hope not either, but we'll we'll see what happens. Like I guess I agree with you. I'm just kind of being the devil's advocate of what well, I mean, this is the way we've been. I mean, they tried to get rid of Fran in what was it nineteen twenty? The donors offered to buy his contract. And what did Gary Barna say? No. Two thousand twenty. Yeah. After the whole Ohio State and uh Ohio State ref thing and uh, uh the feud with uh Gary Dolphin. Yeah, I said don't worry. They, yeah, I, there was donors willing to offer to buy his contract out to get rid of him, and what did Gary do? Nothing. Yeah, I don't remember that, but you you could be. There right. was there um, there was reporting. Yeah, there was solid reporting with sources, you know, that said donors offered to buy out his contract. Don't are you telling me there's no donors right now willing to buy out Kurt's contract to get rid of him? And Brian, I mean, I'm I sure the there is. Asked. I don't know. I'm sure there is. Yeah, if they're willing well, to do that for Fran. So Paul, like, I, I have yeah. to let you slide, but I, I appreciate you jumping on. I always enjoy talking to you and feel free to jump back in later if you want. Thanks, Corey. Thank you, sir. All right. Rolling along here. A couple super chats. We've got Don. We've got Tom waiting. Leon with the super chat says just bought the Cooper helmet from CD3. He's going to be another Tim Dwight or Dallas Clark type. What an athlete. What uh, a young man. What a player. What a play this evening. Incredible. John. Minnesota has shown Iowa lately that you can still be a run-heavy offense, but with a modern approach without going full spread. Our offense approach, offensive approach feels lazy. Thank you for the super chat, John. Appreciate that. 
Again, we're recapping Iowa's 12 to 10 loss at the hands of the Minnesota Golden Gophers, which obviously the loss uh, has carried some controversy as well. First, before we get to Coach Patterson, want to thank our sponsors, Brad Van Meter and his team down at State Farm. Call him for a free quote on insurance, 515-256-6480 with low insurance rates on auto all policies, excuse me, auto policies. Right now, give him a call, 515-256-6480 or online at bradvanmeter.com. Also, Iowa Smokehouse. Well, you might want to uh, eat your uh, your worries, your sadness away this evening with some Iowa Smokehouse beef jerky, uh, some meat sticks. Perhaps it's their ketchup, their salsa. It's all good. Use the code Hawkeyes at iowasmokehouse.com for 15% off your order. Again, that's iowasmokehouse.com. Tasting is believing with Iowa Smokehouse. All right, we're going to add Coach Don Patterson into the mix. Coach, welcome. Corey, how are you? I've had better days. I've had better days, Don. Yeah, you and me both. Um, we've got Tom Caker waiting on hold, so I just want to get a quick kind of uh, summary of what we saw. Uh, we're, I'm sure we're going to di- dive into the rule, the, the, the fair catch rule, all of the melee at the end. How do you – first of all, I guess my, my biggest question is how is – do you as a coach mm-hmm. – console Cooper to Gene after this game? How do you talk to him? I, Cause that's literally my first thought when I watched this game, I was thinking a, they got to get these refs off the field safely. And B, if I was a coach, I would have no idea what to say to that young man. Well, if I were in the locker room, I'd simply congratulate him on a, another typical Cooper to Gene game. You know, he's productive in everything that he does. And I'd be grateful to him for giving us another monumental effort today. You know, he epitomizes Iowa football. He's the same guy that's forcing their punt return to fair catch because he's the one that's right down there on top of it. Not to mention covering receivers on the next series of downs and then returning punts, of course, when he has the opportunity to do so. And and uh, with half a chance, he'll give us better field position than we would otherwise have. Don, from your interpretation or your understanding of the rule, based on what you saw in replay, was Cooper to Gene, his waving at his um, blockers, basically, right? Uh, was that an indication of a fair catch from what you know no. of the rule? One word answer, no. Okay. Um, first off, when they were going to review – I simply, like most people, assumed he was close to the boundary. They're checking to be sure he didn't step out of bounds. Correct. That was the only thing that crossed my mind. Right. And one reason I can say I wasn't concerned about an invalid signal, he was nowhere near the football. He couldn't get to the ball. How did you signal for a catch? I guess they didn't say he signaled for a catch. They just said it was an invalid signal. Is that right? Well, that's what people keep telling me. I read the I read the official rule. I threw it up here on the screen for everybody, and we can look at it again. Um, here's the other part that, that confuses me, Don. If if it's deemed an invalid signal, which I've just never heard, I've just never heard of this being called. If it's deemed an invalid signal, what happens? I see no indication in the official NCAA rulebook that it is deemed an infraction or a penalty. I, I just don't see anything. And with the play not being st- stopped. My next question is, is it even reviewable? And, I, I, and and I'll take it a step further. When does common sense tell an official who's watching the playback, when does common sense tell the official that he's clearly not calling for a fair catch? Nobody on the field thought he was calling for a fair catch. We didn't think he was calling for a fair catch. So let's not screw the pooch on this one. When does common sense take over? You're right. Not a single gopher covering that punt. Nobody, nobody in the, no. nobody in their right mind. Not even the tele, not even Paul Burmeister, Anthony Heron, nobody yeah. thought that there was any indication of a fair catch. Nobody. Yeah, the reason they have that rule in effect that you cannot signal a fair catch and then advance the punt. Correct. Exactly. Absolutely. It's simply because you don't want to take advantage of the of the rule that protects you when you signal fair catch, right? You can't advance it. So uh, there wasn't a single Minnesota player in that that relaxed for a second thinking that he'd signal for a catch because he clearly didn't. And it's incredible to me that, let me say it this way. 
very, I, I coached in 425 college football games. Very seldom, Corey, did I ever have to say that the officials affected the outcome of the game. Uh, in this case, the officials clearly affected the outcome of the game because you could boil it down to that one play. Minnesota was not coming down the field, down four or five points, whatever it was. They were not coming down the field with the need for a touchdown and scoring a touchdown with a minute 20 to go. They were not. No, not <laughs> even the most loyal Gopher fan would bet on that. So, um, and, and I made the comment when it happened, Don. I made the comment when it happened. Tell me I'm living in the moment. You've been around Iowa football a lot longer than I have. I thought it was one of the greatest single plays I've ever seen. In the history yes. of me watching Iowa football, from my knowledge, it's one of the greatest plays we've ever seen. Stolen. Here's how I honestly felt at the time. It reminds me more of a movie script uh, that you might see on television than it does a football game. I mean, to, to pull that off under those under that it's circumstance perfect. is pretty amazing. And let me just say this, Don. I made the comment. You probably said the same thing to Lisa as you're in the stadium. I said... Prior to that punt, I thought, well, we need a blocked punt or we need Cooper to Gene Heroics. Right. And again, uh, there was no trickeration here. There was no deception, nothing. It was a fantastic play made by an unbelievable athlete who I believe will go down as one of the best players to ever put on the jersey. Yeah. And shame on Minnesota. Let me take you back in time. 1982 Peach Bowl. We're playing Tennessee in Atlanta, and they have a guy named Willie Galt, who you might recall has world-class speed. Willie Galt was a punt returner. Coach Fry told Reggie Roby, Reggie, at the end of the day, I don't want Willie Galt to field a single punt. Every time you punt, the ball needs to go off the field. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not concerned about your average. I'm just concerned about Willie Galt having no chances to re return a punt. At the end of the day, Willie had no punt returns, and we had a win. Right. And that's precisely what Minnesota should have done with their and last it, punt. And I think and maybe he was trying to. because Maybe they were trying to. They simply didn't get it done. Yeah. Let's face it, the win was tricky. Maybe that's exactly what P.J. told him, is punt it off the field. Because you don't want to shank it so bad that you're giving field, you're basically giving a you know, field goal range to Iowa. With yeah, I don't, know that, I don't know that the punter had that instruction. Because, as you say, even after we filled it at midfield, or minus 40, whatever yard line it was, we're not that far away from a field goal attempt. Right. So I don't know that P.J. even instructed him to put it off the field, but he would have certainly at least thought about doing that because we all know that that there's a real threat when number three fills a punt. Frankly, I was just hoping for a drive much as we had against because I knew that had a chance to go. We didn't get the line drive punt, but we did get a ball that we could field. And let's face it, how many he pulled through several tackles before he broke into the open field. A couple at least. Uh Leon with a super chat. Thank you, Leon. Strength coach hasn't been the same in the last three years. That's I mean, it's that's a fact. Absolutely is a fact, Leon. Thank you for the super chat, sir. Let's bring Hawkeye Reports own Tom Cakert into the mix. Tom, good to see you. Hi guys. Good to see Hi, you Tom. too. Hi, coach. How are you? I'm recovering. <laughs> so, well, Tom, I got uh, lots of info. I got lots of info for you. Okay, tonight, Let, so. let's unpack. First of all, uh, we'll just start with the obvious. What did Kirk Ferentz say following this one? Well, he was uh, is I, I you know the someone sitting next to me goes who's been on the beat for a long time said, "Is this going to be an all timer from Kirk?" And I said, "Yes," and it was. He basically said, "Go ahead and find me." Uh, for what I'm about to say. And he was pretty tame, but he is frustrated because they meet with the officials and they talk to them about, this is waving my hand above my head, is is how we're taught, a uh, hand above the head. Um, the official said that Cooper was making a circular motion with his left hand. Cooper, we talked to Cooper after the game. Cooper says the only hand he uses for a fair catch is his right hand. And that's it. And he was using, uh, you know, it was like he was kind of trying to clear people away a little bit, uh, but use that left hand and just kind of an emotion that was not above his head. 
it was nowhere near as waist no. high. You can see it. Correct. You know, it's it, it's a chest high, I should say, probably at best uh, between chest and the waist. And the, here's the frustrating thing for Kirk because they went to review that play because they were what he was told was they were checking to see if he went out of bounds or not, which is a fair thing to do. Absolutely, because he was right on that sideline. And you could, I, nobody could tell. You, you go back, and especially in a play that's a scoring play, you go back and you review that. That's, and Kirk's like, I'm fine with that. Then they'd go and they try and find something else. And then they make this interpretation based on that, even though none of the Minnesota players quit playing. They played that to the full. You know, it wasn't like they stopped. If they had stopped playing, then I'd say, you know, you got a point here. That didn't happen. Don, so, was real quick, not to interrupt you, Tom, but Don, do you think there was anybody in that stadium, <laughs> anybody in the stadium who watched what Cooper DeGene was doing with his hands, who believed that it was an indication of a fair catch? Anybody in the stadium? Not even P.J. Flex's wife. Not a single person. <laughs> and get, guess what? All the Gopher fans, I see some people in the chat, all the Gopher fans are jumping, ah, you're, you're just bitter about the rules. None of y'all, when you watch that replay back, even if it had never been brought up, Nobody would have said, oh, they missed that call. Nobody would have said that. Nobody actually in their right mind believes that. The Gopher fans were simply hoping that Cooper had stepped out of bounds. But, of course, they're going to be opportunistic with it. So I'm, I'm curious. You, you said, you know, Tom, that he that Kirk made a comment about, you know, go ahead and find me. What exactly did he say that was finable? I don't think anything. Okay. I, I, you know, maybe it's, it's just the fact that he's questioning the officiating will lead to a fine. <laughs> I don't know. So I'm just curious, you, you've you been through this before, Don, and, and this is, actually, I guess, a question for you as well, Tom, because you've been on the beat a long time. Where does this go? Obviously, the game is final. Nothing's getting replayed. Nothing's getting no. reversed. But I would guess that there's going to be some sort of an appeal process with the conference. Is it the conference? Is it the NCAA? How does Iowa proceed with this, Don? Well, I think I mentioned to you one time, Corey, we lost a game to Southern Illinois 54-52, to it was played at Southern Illinois in the last drive, the game-winning drive. Every play involved a clock stoppage. I was pretty sure when the game ended that the clock operator had taken advantage of us playing at Southern Illinois. I was able to time out all those plays in that last drive, and sure enough, if they would have won the game, they would have had to do it a couple of plays earlier. It was all, a drive that covered almost a minute off, off the game clock. And I went to our commissioner, and I said, I'm not interested in embarrassing the conference, anything like that, but I would like a letter from you stating um, the officials affected the outcome of the game. That's what I wanted her to say. Because as you as you already heard me say, Corey, and Tom, you haven't heard me say it, but I, I've said it before, very seldom do the officials affect the actual outcome of the game. They make bad calls here and there, but you can't honestly pin the outcome of the game on the officials. Today you could, because it boiled down to one play. Yeah, and Kirk was um, frustrated by just by the number of reviews today. I don't think he agreed with the targeting call on Carson Shire either. Um, just, uh, just the number of like strange. Let's go to the booth. Let's review plays today that just didn't seem very uh, to make much sense. He was. Yeah, this is frustrated as I've seen him uh, in a post game in a long, long, long time. Yeah, uh, maybe going back to after the 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 um, oh the Jacksonville Bowl when he kind of got snippy with everybody, um, and and you know that was 2014, and I think he was just frustrated with where the team was at at that point. This one was about the officials. He was he's he's pissed. He's just like. He doesn't know what to tell his team. What do you tell your team? And you spoke right. to that too, coach. What do you tell your team? Except you made a great play and they took it away from you. That's all you can tell them. And well, it's, for the record, Tom, I did get a letter from our commissioner. Yeah. And we had it on file. The rest of the stories, we didn't lose another game that entire season. <laughs> Sadly. Oh, by the way, our other loss was at LSU. So we had a pretty good team. And at the end of the year, yeah, we made the playoffs. But truthfully, we would have been a higher seed if we only had a loss to LSU. 
So yeah. it wasn't going to keep us out of the playoffs either way because we won out anyway. But it would have been nice to, to have been 10 and 1 rather than 9 and 2. Yep. Tom, uh, I, I know this is this is one of the most climactic and uh, tragic things that I've seen from a from a officiating standpoint in my lifetime with an Iowa game, but there was a, a full 60 minute game played and uh, the defense was really, really good. I mean, Co- Cooper Jean, I mean, talked about his performance, not only on defense, but on special teams. How about the uh, downing the Tory Taylor punt inside the five early in the game yeah, on the one yard line? Yeah, incredible play. I mean, for, it's for both those guys. Play. Yeah. Um, also, I know people are probably wondering about quarterback. And um, what Kirk said, because we did ask Kirk after the game if he, you know, with the bye week coming up, do you think about going in a different direction? And um, and Coach can speak to this too. But you, you you have to evaluate your players on what how they play, but also what you see in practice every day. And um, that's kind of where he defaults to is what he's seen in practice every day is that Deacon is the 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 right guy that he thinks he should put out there so that's that's kind of where he came down on it again tonight was um that's the that's the guy for for him now will they look at some different things during this bye week maybe i mean you got an opportunity to to um you know go to a joe labus maybe and say hey if you can light it on fire here in the in this week we're going to give you a shot but it's can I just be- ask a question, Tom? Sure. And I want to ask it yeah. to you, and then I'll get Don's opinion. What is so criminal about giving a guy a drive? What is so criminal about even – I don't care if it's Joe Labus or Marco Linez saying, hey, we're going to give you one drive against uh, whoever they play. Is it Illinois? I don't even know who they play next in two weeks. Whoever they play, give North them a West drive. Side. We watched Jeff Brom's Purdue Boilermakers come into Iowa City a couple of years back, put a beat down on the Hawks with three different quarterbacks. Why is that so criminal? Why can you start a guy acknowledging that he won in practice, but we're going to give a couple of guys a chance to shine in a game? It, when you're deathly afraid of, of a guy turning the ball over. But Deacon Hill turned it over three mistake. times today. I know he, he did. And yeah, that, that argument that, held that up last week, game. but not this week. That, co- that cost him six points. Yeah. And cost him the game. It did. It cost him six points. Because I just he can, and, didn't take care of the football. And I understand Kirk's reasoning. Tom, you, you said it last week. That's exactly what Kirk brought up when, when the question was asked last week. Uh-huh. Well, he didn't turn the ball over, and that's that's priority number one. Well, that, that's not pro- – he didn't fulfill that criteria today, and well, it's nothing against Deacon. I have nothing against Deacon. Here's my view on Kirk. Kirk looks at wants this quarterback position to be almost a do-no-harm position instead of go out and win game position. Absolutely. That's kind of – that's kind of where I'm viewing him right now, where, where he's at in the quarterback position. Don, I, I'd love to get your thoughts. Well, let's face it. We had some issues with pass protection today, too. Yes. Uh, but it begs the question, would you be better off if you could have a more athletic QB that maybe has a better chance to uh, avoid a pass rush? And the answer is, yeah, that would help. That would be helpful. Absolutely. You know, if we could find a guy that could extend plays, and is there any doubt? I would suspect most people would say, well, I don't know about our freshman, but Joey Labus, isn't he a little more athletic in terms of avoiding a pass rush than Deacon? I guess it's hard for us to know because we haven't had a look at Joey Labus lately, but let's face it, that's not Deacon's strength. Yeah. Um, you know, he, he's got a really, really strong arm. But it, it's difficult for him to avoid a pass rush. There's no doubt about that. Yep. So, Don, is, is your your thoughts on the potential of playing multiple quarterbacks? You've praised Jeff Brom doing that. I know back in 2021. Is that a here's that... here's the point I, I've made before? Korean produce a great example of that. There was no doubt that day. That day they had one job description for the starter. I can't recall his name. Tom probably remembers. Probably O'Connell. Who was it? Aiden O'Connell. Uh, You're talking about 2021. O'Connell, yes. O'Connell, kind of a traditional pocket passer, not a very good runner, but an excellent passer. They had a set of plays for him. Then they had a different set of plays for the other two quarterbacks. And I'm confident those other two quarterbacks, uh, when they went on the field, they knew the plays we're going to run are those same five plays we practiced this week. That's it. You're going to have a a limited role, but it's going to be a complimentary role to that of Aiden O'Connell. My point being, 
one thing you could do with another quarterback is have a handful of plays, no more than that, for one or the other, and simply insert him into the game. And maybe it's in the middle of the second quarter, and maybe those plays have some success. Let's face it, those are the plays that best suit his skill set anyway. Not to mention you've got the element of surprise because they don't know what those plays might be. And, and as a result of that, they're going to have to spend a little bit of time at halftime, not just talking about how to defend Deacon Hill, but how to defend Joey Labus, because maybe we're going to see Labus again in the second half. That's another argument for going the Purdue, going with the Purdue model and playing a second or even a third quarterback. Yeah, those other quarterbacks were um, the Plummer kid, and then uh, I think it was Tyler Burton was the kid's name at Purdue. Those were the three guys that they played. And Burton was kind of like this uh, runner quarterback. He he was Correct. ran a lot. Yep. Yeah, and I, I'm just curious, like Tom. I know we're not there every day. I know Marco Lenez just got there, but with is there not any ability to be creative and say to a true freshman, "Hey, we got four games with you, anyways. Let's let's get a few plays in here and see what he can do." And hey, protect the football. That's obviously priority number one. We're going to keep that consistent regardless of who's got the football. I mean, I don't know. Again, I'm not there. Well, every day. Just, how about how about how about putting a wildcat package in with uh, with Cooper DeGene? Well, we've been talking about his health, and that's why I know. I, I know him. it's the concern. I know it's the concern, and the fact that they're down. T.J. Hall was not dressed today, and I don't know that he's going to be back. But maybe there's somebody else on the team that you could do that with. Don, my um, biggest problem, my biggest problem right now, and, and this is a, a micro look at the situation with the Iowa offense, is I'm I'm just baffled at the fact that it feels like, at least from my perspective, that there's no desire to really be creative. There's no creative, innovative mind as it relates to game planning and approach. And I, I yeah. maybe I'm just, you know, just Corey. I've mentioned that a time or two myself. Yeah, I, I just don't. I, I don't. <laughs> I, I just don't. Uh, I don't understand that. Um, and I, I I'm certainly not skilled enough or smart enough to go in there and and do it. But I think that's the sentiment of a lot of fans. It just feels like there's not really any drastic measures taken when the numbers and the situation indicate that drastic measures are needed, but they are six and two. I know people don't like hearing that Don. They should probably, and they should be seven and they should be seven and one. Well, we were six and one a week ago and, and here's our next episode where we tempt fate. You might say by playing, um, some people would argue playing with one hand behind our back. I wouldn't call it that. Today, I actually, I give um, Brian and Kirk credit. It's not as if we sat on our very, very small lead. We were trying to make plays. Here's the truth of the matter. Corey, you heard me say in the past, somebody is going to make us play left-handed. Remember that? Uh -huh. We talked about that. Somebody's going to, and Hayden would say it this way, uh, unusual circumstance calls for unusual measures. Um, maybe I'm not saying that the best possible way, but you get my drift. Unusual circumstance requires drastic measures. And by that, I simply mean um, if if I, I was to throw the ball and to protect the quarterback, why don't we dare them to throw? Why don't we load the box to the point where I, how about this for a stat? Either one of you, Tom, you probably know, so I'm not going to ask you. Corey, do you know the longest run we had today? You know how long it was? Run. The uh, longest um, run. <laughs> Probably six or seven yards. Seven yards. Can you tell me who ran that? Ran that ball for seven I yards. I can. Uh, Tom knows. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't Lashawn. It was. Was it Caleb? No. no. Keep guessing. Uh, let's see. Did how many receivers got carries in this game? Um, no. None. So who who are we talking? Patterson about? had three carries, I think. There's only one other guy that ever carried the ball. The Deacon. one that's least likely to Deacon. be our. When did Deacon have a seven yard run? Uh, sometime Scramble. in the first half. I can't recall. Yeah. Here's my point. Okay. Our, our running backs, our three running backs had only 20 carries for the game. Our longest game was five yards with those three running backs. Now, that doesn't mean we were just horrible up front. That simply means. They had more tacklers than we had blockers. We didn't gain more than five yards all day, in large part because they were outnumbering us in the box time after time. 
and they were daring us to throw. And we tried to throw. We threw 20, 28 times, I think it was. We tried to throw, but not with great success, of course. Yeah. And, and by the way, just one, one quick note, and I'm sure it didn't got, get brought up, and you can't ask about every play. I understand that, Tom. But, um, again, I'll, I'll make my comment on fourth and inches twice today. And, you know, early, I understand that. But to me, that's almost reason. Maybe you disagree, Don. That's almost reason for Iowa to be a little bit more, I don't want to say, I don't even know that, that you call that risky. When you're fourth and inches with a 260-pound quarterback, how hard is it? I mean, how hard it you got to work? I know that the spot can, you know, you've, you've been on the wrong end of the official spotting the ball wrong, Don. But I think I think both those fourth and ones were somewhere toward midfield, right? Yeah, they were both around midfield. You're fourth and fourth, yeah. fourth and two feet. Seriously, I know you're you're just absolutely scared to death to lose field position. I get that. Correct. But holy cow! I mean, let me ask. Let me ask you this, Corey, and think back to a week ago. Do you have complete confidence that our defense can stop the other team? The answer is yeah. That's precisely why we ran the ball on third and seven last week. Because Kirk is saying we're not turning it over. Right. We're gonna we're gonna punt the ball down the field. So here's my only point. I didn't disagree with Kirk's decision to punt either one of those. And I'll tell you why. I had the same comment a while back in time, and it was simply this. Even if we converted, maybe it was was it last week or two weeks ago where we had a situation we could go for it on fourth and short, or we could kick the field goal. Remember that? Yeah, that was last week. I made the comment. I think we made the right choice to kick the field goal. And here's why. Who are you to say we wouldn't have to kick it four plays later anyway? In other words, there's a risk involved with converting on fourth down. Sure. And even if you convert, it doesn't guarantee a touchdown. It might be simply another field goal attempt. So take the field goal. I think we did the right thing a week ago, and we punted the ball twice on fourth and one. And I think in both cases, I would have done exactly what Kirk did. Okay. I would have said, you can't drive the length of the field. We're going to punt the ball, and we're going to protect our lead. Because even if we convert with a quarterback sneak, who are you to say we don't have to punt the ball away four plays later? No, yeah, that's fair. We um, only had nine first, nine first downs for the day. So even if we convert on fourth and one, what are the odds we're going to back it up with another first down? Not very good based on the way they loaded the box. And uh, the, the offensive line didn't uh... – uh, yeah, like you said, uh, you you knew that a team was you knew that teams are going to start loading the box and and making Iowa as you said play left handed and Iowa wasn't able to do it offensively again today. And um, Tom, anything I'm missing from from the post game presser? The only thing that is probably going to be bubbling up is that um, usually in the bye week we would get coordinators on Wednesday generally and. Um, we have new SID. It sounds like there's going to be a new policy. Uh, we're just we've been getting uh, assistants and coordinators on a weekly basis on Wednesdays, and right. they're just going to stick to that instead of doing the coordinator in front of us. Um, it's going to be over Zoom on a Wednesday. Uh, so normally we would get be getting Brian Ferentz this week, and uh, we will not be at this point at least. So when, so, who, who's, I, I, I don't know. We don't know. I don't, I don't think we're getting anybody this week uh, from a coach position. We're going to get some players who we normally don't get on Tuesdays on a Wednesday is what it sounds like. New so, SID, but Don, I don't know that that's the best look right now. I agree. I don't, I don't know. That's my reaction. Yeah, Tom. I, it's, I know it's, <laughs> I know it's going to be, um, it's not going to go over well. Yeah. Because I think people were kind of hoping that, um, you know, that Brian would we'd be able to ask Brian some questions. Tom, I'm just um, curious, and I haven't, unfortunately, I've been a part of those Zoom interviews most of the year. And and uh, if if Brian shows up on one, he showed up on one early, correct? He has not this year. Oh, he is not. Okay, all right. No, I don't believe so. So he's going to be eventually. Him. He'll show up on a Wednesday. They've got to make yeah. him available. Yeah, eventually we're going to hear from Brian. But we're not hearing from him this week, it sounds like. Unless they change. Unless they, they could always go in a different direction and reconsider that um, decision. So, uh, and again, I, I just don't, I don't think he's going to change the quarterback. I know people are like, hey, why can't you make Kirk 
change as a quarterback. We don't have the power to do that. Yeah. You know, us, us asking quote unquote hard questions of Kirk is not going to get him to change his mind. You know, it's just, it's just not. So, um, I hope everybody understands that we're going to ask respectful questions. Um, you know, I heard something today that I hope I never hear at a football stadium uh, to any person um, towards Brian Ferentz as he was leaving the field. And I'll just leave it at that. I just it was I was down by the tunnel where the players come in and out of uh, at the end of the game. Uh, and um, someone told Brian that he should be fired and told him to do something to himself. And I don't think that was appropriate. I just, I hope fans, it's one fan, so it's one bad person speaking out, but it's just, you can't tell people to do that, you know? Yeah, uh, I, I don't like the fact that the students are chanting what they're chanting right now, but I also understand it, and I understand emotions run high. Um, and I can tell you the AD was not, ha the interim AD was not happy with the, uh, the behavior. I get the frustration that everybody was throwing bottles on the on the field and things like that. But That's it's dangerous. It's inappropriate. Dangerous. Inappropriate on every level. Yeah. And she was she was there. I was standing literally right next to her when that happened. And um, you know, she was very upset that the students and other fans were reacting in that manner. So hopefully I get it. Everybody's ticked off that Cooper's touchdown gets taken back and and it sucks but um boo just boo and it's Tell also the they stay. And, and tom you know? the unfortunate part of all this is there i won't be surprised if we hear that there have been threats made to these officials and that's the unfortunate mm -hmm. part of where we are in society today um, yep. and and i would plead with yeah. people to use their their common sense and their ability to reason which not many people manifest but um, th there are bigger things than than football and there is e multiple things can be true at the same time tom as i said <clears throat> earlier uh, i think the game was stolen from iowa i think it was stolen from cooper that play was stolen from cooper to gene the moment was stolen from cooper but iowa did not play winning football from start to finish oh, today shouldn't have been in that good. position to begin with the offense shouldn't was been in that position horrid in the second half Tom, I do have one question about have, the ill-fated punt return. Sure. Was the question asked, is there any way of knowing if somebody on Minnesota's bench planted that seed? Yeah, I don't the know. about the invalid signal? I don't know. Uh, that was not asked. I don't think Kirk would know. Um, and we did, Scott Docterman from The Athletic did speak to the officials after the game. He, they did... Um, we did request that, and they they were able to answer some questions. I have not seen all the answers yet, but um. well, yeah, I'll say this: I had the same question, Don, earlier. I'd like to know who prompted that because when Paul Burmeister and Anthony Heron and even the rule, I think the rules analyst jumped on NBC as they were reviewing it, never mentioned the even the possibility that this was going to be interpreted as a fair catch signal. I want to know who put the birdie in whose ear. Was it just somebody Kirk said there was some somebody in Pittsburgh? They have a review office in Pittsburgh of some sort that's looking at all these things. So that's what Kirk said. But is would know. it be would it be I'm not saying it happened, but it would it be a, a surprise to anybody if somebody in the Minnesota sideline said something to the officials and then they brought that up to whoever's Wouldn't be a surprise because we don't know PJ Fleck. PJ Fleck is prancing and dancing all along oh. that sideline the entire game. He wants himself to be seen. Yes. He's he at likes every, attention. Absolutely. He's at every first down mark. Somebody sent me a picture that after the game, there's nobody on the field except PJ Fleck was out on the field um, by himself after the game. It's yeah. weird. Yeah. He's a different cat. I, I don't like him. But, anyways, uh, Tom Caker, HawkeyeReport.com. Tom, hey, thank I'm you guys. Up. Plenty of stuff on your website, so people yep. thanks, Tom. Hey, safe thanks you guys. Back. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thank you, so, sir. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> this is just a, a, a travesty. I, I just, it's just the whole situation's a, a, a darn travesty. Kelly, thank you for my, reminding everybody. We got about 1,100 people watching us live right now between our two channels, Don. So this is the passionate fans that we meet with every single week. This is how people handle this. They're upset. They're disgusted. They're mad at Brian. They're mad at Kirk. They're mad at the officials. 
They're mad at the students for acting the way they did. Uh, they feel terrible for Cooper DeGene. I feel terrible for Cooper DeGene. And uh, I, I think I need to put this banner up here. I mean, RTI Threads has been sponsoring the show all year, all, all season. If you are, weren't already supporting Cooper DeGene's merch line, and of course this is all part of NIL and, and these guys' ability to profit off their name, image, and likeness, head over to cd3lacesup.com and shop the official Cooper DeGene apparel. Um, that guy, uh, not, not that that's going to, not, not that any amount is going to recover him from this loss, Don, because I can't, again, I cannot imagine how he feels. Um, and I don't remember in my, I'm sure you've had situations like this, but I meant that honestly, when I asked you earlier, how in the world do you console him? I don't know that you can. I, it's just, and I know the whole team got this win ripped away from him in a sense, but that young man and just. Uh, yeah, I, I I meant what I put up on the, the banner earlier, speechless. That's how kind of I felt over the last two hours. I'm just, I'm still in shock over this. Yeah, Corey, I don't recall that, that game I was referring to, us against Southern Illinois. I don't recall what that number was in my coaching career. Let's say it was number 350. I do remember saying this to Patty Viverito, our commissioner. I said, Patty, in all these years that I've coached, I can count them on one hand, the games that I felt were absolutely affected by the officials. The outcome of the game was actually affected by the officials. We all know that sometimes we feel like you get home cooking when you're on the road. You feel like the officials maybe favor the, the home team. But you're kind of hard-pressed to say it would, it would make the difference in the game. Very rarely does that happen because it's hard to zero in on one play or two plays that might make that kind of difference. Today you could say that play absolutely affected the outcome of the game. It's rare when it happens. It happens based on my career, not even one out of 100 games. And That's Don, how often it happens. I'm telling you right now that there are going to be plenty of people that watch this stream that say we're just whining, you know, you're, we're being sore losers, you're whining – I don't know how, like, this is as egregious as it comes. I don't know how you don't talk about this. <laughs> this is going to be, I mean, that play, had had the play stood, that would have been the play of the game in college football. One of the, the best plays anybody has made in college football all year. Maybe the, play, maybe the play of the year in college football. I don't know that that's exaggeration, given the situation and everything. So I cannot imagine, given how controversial it was as well, that it will not be a headline on almost every sports network. I am curious how the Big Ten Network is going to handle it. Well, they're in an awkward position because, um, you know, that they're, they're they're caught between Iowa football and and the officials. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Kevin in the chat says it was not stolen. The rule was correctly enforced. People just don't know it was a rule. Uh, Kevin, I prefer to 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 uh, listen to the NBC analyst, former player Paul Burmeister, former player Anthony Heron, Coach Patterson, Tom Cakert, who's been covering the beat forever, Kirk Ferentz, over some person in a chat. But thank you for your input. I do appreciate it. Uh, Todd is with the uh, Super Chat. How to defend Iowa. Nine in the box, two safeties playing gin rummy near the goal line just in case a pass is completed. Expect anything else the rest of the year? Question mark. Well, and... Um, in long yardage situations, we might get something different. But if it's if it's any down and distance that favors calling of a run play, you would expect to have both safeties down. When I say down, I just mean they're lined up at maybe ten yard depth. It's conceivable they're playing pass defense, or maybe twelve yard depth even. But on the snap of the ball, they're coming down, and that does give you nine in the box against a normal pro formation. When you add those two. Thank you for the super chat, Todd. Uh, the teams are going to continue to do that. Andrew with the super chat. I think he missed the chat, but he threw it up in a separate one. Why are we so uh, often explosive on first drives, then nothing for the rest of the game? If we took our opening drive yardage away, we would be averaging like 150 yards of offense. Would we even, would Iowa even be averaging that in the Big Ten, Don? I don't know that they'd be averaging that, frankly. I don't know. Um, and we've talked about the idea that it seems like Iowa has a scripted opening drive or two. 
and then things kind of fall apart. And I, when I say we, I'm talking about the coaching staff. We don't really know what to do. We don't really know how to weigh flow of the game. Um, and we don't, it doesn't seem to me that we understand the concept of play calling, frankly. I know that sounds pretty darn generic, but um, how do you answer a, a genuine fan like Andrew here who doesn't understand why they can seem to move the ball decently well early and then it completely, you know, they had like negative eight yards for the second half before that second to last drive. Yeah. Well, I do know this. Uh, if you look at our defense and our defense is stellar, Truthfully, if they have trouble on any specific possession in a football game, if you go back and look, it's probably the first possession. If you go back and chart all the first possessions versus all the second, third, fourth, and fifth possessions, I'd be willing to bet you that that first possession, we end up giving up more yardage then than on any of those other succeeding possessions. So part of it, I think, is simply the defense kind of getting used to the flow of the game. Um, you know, maybe they're playing a little more cautiously. I certainly saw Minnesota playing more cautiously with their pass defense early. We had some some balls that were thrown and caught where they really were not in position to contest the catch very well. They were too soft. And as the game unfolds, the players tend to tighten down and and play um, a play a, a tighter coverage that that doesn't give up so many yards. Maybe they're a little less likely to miss a tackle because they're certainly not very fatigued. You know, maybe they're a little more on point with their with their um, with their leverage on the ball, things like that. They're not mentally tired as they would be later in the game. So I think that's part of it. It's not just it's not just the fact that we seem to do better with our first possession. I think teams in general do better with their first possessions. I couldn't help but notice uh, who was it today? It was. Penn State, Ohio State. It was Ohio State, I think, that had the opening kickoff. Ohio State goes right down the field, and they do stall out and kick a field goal, but they did drive pretty much the length of the field to leave themselves with a chip shot field goal. So a lot of teams are a little more likely to give up yardage on the first possession than those that follow. I think that's probably true across the board for college football. Um, comment here, super chat from James. He says, question for Don. This might be kind of an unfair question, James, but I'm going to ask you and Don, you can, you, you, you've had tough questions answered before or asked before. Uh, would your offense look like this by the, by this time in the season? You're putting me in an awkward spot here, James. I think it's fair. Can I, can I just say this? I think it's fair to say you would hope it wouldn't look like this at this point in the season. Is that fair? Well, let me say it this way. The way we used to game plan, it's safe to say when you're getting ready to play game eight, you've exposed your players to a wide array of runs and passes. There are things we've done over the first seven games of the season that we pick and choose from to play game eight. And as you heard me say, Corey, maybe we go back to game two and run some plays we ran in game two and game eight simply because the defensive schematic – the two defenses schematically are very similar, and we're kind of crazy not to come back to it because we haven't we haven't run that play in another in the last five weeks. So in that regard, you'd see a more expansive offense than than what we typically run. That's true. I'll admit that. I think that probably is true. All right. So here's I just uh, thank you, Kyle, for sending this in to me. Um, this is a quote apparently from. The uh, pool reporter, uh, I, I guess it was Scott Docterman that uh, met with the officials. Um, the quote to Scott Docterman was, and I quote, the receiver makes a pointing gesture with his right hand and he makes multiple waving gestures with his left hand. If you look at the video, you'll see that. That, hold on, hold on. That waving motion of the left hand constitutes an invalid fair catch signal. So when the receiving team recovers the ball, by rule, it becomes dead. So that is a reviewable element of the game. We let the play run out, and then when we went to review, review shows with indisputable evidence that there is a waving motion with the left hand. One word response, bogus. 
Bogus. Here's okay, my by the way, by the way, real quick, I'm not so this is what in the the official, I'm assuming the official that was the head official today. Obviously, he's not gonna indict himself. So this is his version of whatever. Obviously, that's not a consensus because there wouldn't be the controversy that there is right now. Go ahead. There wasn't one person in that stadium. I'm talking about gopher fans, all included. There wasn't one person that thought what happened when the ball was in, in the air and Cooper was moving toward the ball. There wasn't one person that said he gained an advantage by waving his arm around below shoulder level. He was simply telling him to get away from the ball, right? Yeah. You know, if we're going to go that reasoning, then we can say everybody that's running down the field – if he's running toward the ball, the arms are going like this. Right. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. First off, if you're nowhere near the ball, how in God's name would you be even conceivably signaling for a fair catch? That's impossible. Pointing at the ball while <laughs> waving his arms at his teammates. Pointing at the ball, which is nowhere near him. Exactly. And he's calling a fair catch? Give me a break. Anyways. Well, and let's go back a couple of points. Um, and I will admit that Cooper sometimes signals fair catch kind of late in the play, sure. you know, because he's made the decision. He's so reliable with his fielding. He may signal fair catch, and the ball is only 15 yards in the air maybe. I don't know how high it would be, but the ball is clearly coming down. He'll signal and catch it. That's what a lot of good returners do is – they decide they can sense that the coverage is closing. And if, if in doubt, of course, they'll signal the fair catch rather than than um, be susceptible to a, a turnover. So, but, but if you're not near the ball, then who in the right mind would signal fair catch? You signal fair catch when you have a chance to get to the ball. He had no chance to get to the ball on the fly. No chance. Right? Yeah. Uh, do you know anything about this crew? I do not. Who's the referee? Just so I know. I didn't Lede, even notice. Lede, or it was a name I didn't recognize. I think he's a newer official. I didn't recognize him at the time. I, I know some of the officials because they used to be officials in the Missouri Valley. So I've actually worked with some of these officials that are now referees in the Big Ten. Watcher of the West, thank you for the super chat. I did not get any text with this super chat. So uh, please. Uh, I'm sorry, but I didn't get it. You, you didn't write the message. Maybe that you're just giving a donation. If that's all you were trying to do, thank you for that. Appreciate that, definitely. And I think I just... Here we go. Watcher of the West. Deacon Buffet Buster Hill is as fast as he is tough. Cooper DeGene is America. Uh, thank you, Watcher of the West, for your super chats. Appreciate that. Um, frankly, you feel like... It looks like you're about to say something witty, Don, but... I'm trying to figure as fast as he is tough... I think he's he's implying that he's not very tough. I see. Okay. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to question Deacon's toughness. I mean, he's taken some shots, and he pops right back up. I don't know that toughness is his problem. <laughs> right. And I, 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 I tend to think that Deacon is not Iowa's problem. In fact, far from it. I don't think he is Iowa's problem. Is he part of the problem right now? Sure. But there's a lot of parts of the problem and some parts that are a lot more influential on a macro level than Deacon Hill, who's been the starter the last, what, two, three games? Right. So, Thank you for the super chat, Watcher of the West. Do appreciate it. CJW, the problem with the call is that they never call that, ever. Also fair. Also fair. I love these people. Well, the letter of the law, Don. Let the letter of the law. Yeah. Letter of the law. Again, this is what the official said in, res in response to an Iowa reporter that asked for an explanation following the game, which good on Do Scott Dockerman for doing that. Um, but I have yet to see anything in the official rule book. I read what was in the official rule book. Uh, apparently, it's reviewable. If there's an invalid signal, it's reviewable. I still don't understand when you – I understand the concept of letting a play play out and then going back to look at it later. But why in the world would you let a play like that play out and officials, there, am I correct in saying there's an official always looking at the punt returner, correct? Sure. So without a doubt, they saw this. What do we have to review? 
What do we have to review? Either he signaled for a fair catch or he didn't, which he clearly did not. But if you're going to call it, then call it. This isn't like, oh, did the ball bobble on the catch? No. It, you, you can see it clear as day. It's because no official saw that as a fair catch signal. Exactly. Somebody decided to, to go back to review and call it. Chris Bacon. Thank you for the super chat, Chris. And do we have a chat? I don't see a chat for Chris. Let me scroll back up and see if we had one that's not. Sometimes people throw the super chat in and then they throw in a, a different uh, a different chat. I don't see it. So, Chris, if you have something, uh, feel free to uh, reach back out to me. But I don't see it here. And I'm trying to navigate through dozens and dozens of comments that are flowing through here, which I do appreciate everybody being here. Thank you, Chris, again, for that uh, contribution. Also want to thank uh, Mike Rooney. Mike, thank you. Uh, it says that he ran into me at the Iowa State game. It was great to meet you. Uh, Mike, uh, good to meet you as well, and thank you for uh, the donation. I think uh, Mike went over to, let's see, went over to uh, either Venmo, or I think it was Venmo, either Venmo or PayPal. Uh, regardless, thank you, Mike. And uh, if anybody wants to donate by means of Venmo, PayPal, Cash App, you can do so by means of uh, the description. So there's there's links to all those in the description. And, of course, if you know how Super Chats work, YouTube does take a, a pretty large cut out of those Super Chats. So do appreciate all the contributions. It does help, but uh, appreciate that, Mike. And um, let's see. D. Rolofson says, glad I'm on beta blockers. Upside is 19.5. Let's go, Hawks. That is the number now, Don. And I took a while because I didn't want to take a, a wet take the attention away from what happened today. But I did throw up the points per game tracker above your head to your left. That is where we're at. And that number continues to go down. I think we can say, I think we could say this a couple of weeks ago with almost absolute certainty. They're not hitting 25 points per game. <laughs> is that fair, Don? They're not making 25 points per game. Well, let me do the math. We're at 156 right now through eight games, right? Is that right? Let me, let me, yeah, I can, yeah, 156. That means we need 169 points in today was game eight, so that leaves five games. Yeah. I mean, uh, did I say 169? Is that right? Yeah. That's 34 points a game on average. Well, we're 156 right now. Right. We need 169 to get to 325. Right. Okay. I got you. Got you. 169 to get 325. Yeah. And we've got – Today was game eight. Is that right? Correct. Okay, so with our bowl game would be assuming we're not in Indy, our bowl game would be would be our fifth game remaining. We only have four regular season games left. Right. So in those five games, we need 169 points. That's 33.8 per game. Not, uh, not happening, Don. Yeah, I'll be kind and say I don't think we're going to get there. <laughs> Uh, I kind of had a feeling we were going to get there after watching them put up 24 on Utah State, 20 on Iowa State, um, and then zero against Penn State. It was kind of at that point that I was like, ah, nope, this ain't happening. Yeah. Anyways, uh, let's go back to our uh, call in line, our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. All right, Dave. Dave is with <laughs> us. Dave. <laughs> Dave, are we that uh, funny I'm, to look at? I, I'm all out. I'm all out of Minnesota. I'm all out of uh, Iowa tears. <laughs> see if you can see if you can actually put words together, Dave. <laughs> I, I haven't been able to put words together this whole entire time. Are those tears? Is that tears, water, or vodka? Are. Hold on, I'm going to mute you because you're talking. Are those tears, water, or vodka? Water. Okay. Water. I I, uh, right. I don't drink. I do smoke a lot, and believe me, that's not good, uh, bro. That, that helps a lot with Gopher games. I, I That's going to shorten your life expectancy, you know, Dave. <laughs> yeah. And Dave, uh, well, uh, uh, I guess this has been—it's been eight years, man. I, I finally get to somewhat brag and say we finally won, even though the refs basically cost you the game on that play. But you could also say for Minnesota, heck, Minnesota gave you guys a touchdown. How many? Well, by the way. Penalties? Nobody should be – nobody. Well, that's true, too. Absolutely. Minnesota was killing themselves with penalties all day, Don. We haven't talked about that, but absolutely shooting themselves in the foot. But let me just say this regarding 
Minnesota. Iowa fans should not be upset with Minnesota at all. Now, is it possible that somebody on the Minnesota sideline said something to the officials to get them to even consider that call? Maybe, but we don't know that. I I don't like P.J. Fleck, but it's not Minnesota's fault that the refs decided to no, no, you know, do what they did. And I'll be honest with you, I've had this happen to. I mean, this has happened to the Gophers. 2000, I would say 13, they had a game against um, – they had a game against Colorado State where the guy, it was this really, it was this early September game. It was sun was just beaten down, and the guy went like this to catch the ball. And he had his hand, I, can't, I don't know if you can see, but he had his hand up like this to cover, co- cover, his, uh, to cover his face. Yeah. And he didn't put his hand down, and he runs it back all the way for a touchdown. They said that. No, well, that, there's a ball. specific rule in place for shielding your eyes. My understanding is there's a specific rule in place, Don. There, I, I believe the rule book. I could be wrong on this, but I was thinking the rule book even is explicit about this does not constitute a fair catch attempt. So that's what I'm saying. Correct. If this does not this constitute a fair catch, on. exactly. If this does not constitute a fair catch signal attempt, then neither does this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, 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 was, that to me was was the weird part because I'll tell you the actual truth. What happened that whole entire game? Iowa scores the touchdown on the punt. What we what we thought was the touchdown, and all of a sudden, a power outage hits my my block in the for about two minutes. I had no idea what happened. You know, I. They basically were saying, like, right when they were saying, hey, this, right when NBC announcers were literally were saying, oh, this is taking them a while to actually, you know, look at this, boom, blacked out in my, on my block. And for two minutes, we, I didn't know anything was going, that went on. And I looked on ESPN, the game pass, and then I, I see the oh, – I, Iowa has the ball, but they didn't score the touchdown. What happened? Yeah. I turned it on the game. Finally, was able to watch the game and see them finally stop. And then, then when I saw Waldy make the interception, and this is what the, he's a him and Tyler Newman were probably the two best defenders on the Gophers today. Well, that was um, a pretty darn pretty darn accurate throw right to him. Yeah. Well. <laughs> There's been at least he, you know, finally he caught one. You can only gamble so much. Yeah. There's at least I would say four drops by the, the by the uh, by the Minnesota defense that could have been intercepted. Dave, and there was Dave, drops the whole entire game. Dave, you said in the chat you, you hoped I wasn't avoiding you. I'm not going to avoid you. Nobody was avoiding you. But I will <laughs> say this uh, to Leon in the chat. He says rules in book does say any wave makes it invalid. That's that's I guess that's what I'm trying to get people to understand. What constitutes this as a wave? When a wave is clearly I think defined they probably as saw I because I looked this at is the not replay. A wave. I, I think they probably saw one arm go like this, go like this, and it was barely, barely <sighs> high enough. That it was not high. It was not high enough. Exception to the rule that I that I can see. I, I, like I said, I'm just as surprised as you are. I think every Gopher fan was just as surprised. We're all thinking to, to ourselves, "Oh, okay, here's another loss to Iowa. We're in a game that we could have won." You know. Yeah. And this is Shit. what now, Dave. Seven straight. <laughs> I'll say this to you. Last thing I'll say, and I gotta let you slide. Congratulations. And um, I hope the Gophers go beat uh, Wisconsin in what week thirteen. So, yeah, yeah, I, I, I want I want that to happen. Thank you. And one more thing before I go, because I know you guys are done. Are you going to be on uh, Mark Rosen's late night show today? Mark Rogers. Mark Rogers. Uh, not, not Mark Rosen. I'm sorry, Mark Rogers. I, uh, <laughs> oh man, I don't know. <laughs> but we'll see what happens tonight with the show. If you are, I can, you know, give you a little crap over there, too. All right. Thank you, Dave. <laughs> right, I'll talk Thank to you, later. sir. Appreciate Dave. Good sportsmanship from Dave. I appreciate that. No problem celebrating the win. If we were Gopher fans, we'd probably be celebrating, too, Don. But I think with with the right, reasonable mind, I think it's fair to also say, ooh, probably didn't deserve that. Uh, James in the chat. Problem is, there was no flag, so who actually called it? Yeah, great question. 
And according to the official that ta- apparently sc- talked to an Iowa media member after the game, it was reviewable. I had somebody reach out to me here. I've had multiple people reach out to me here in the last hour. Tony, uh, and I can't get this up on the screen, but Tony sends me an email, and, and I'll just read through this real quickly. He says, the non-call was not reviewable. The most common things to come up that aren't reviewable are penalties. Only these are reviewable, including when not called on the field. Targeting, blocking by the kicking team before its players are eligible to touch, touch the ball on non side kick. A player going beyond the neutral zone while kicking the ball. The number of players a team has in the field. A player making a forward pass or forward handoff when past the line of scrimmage or after a turnover. Or illegal touching of a forward pass or of a kick. Uh, he says back, uh, wondering... If something was a catch or a fumble or if a guy got enough yardage for a first down, they can review that. Want another look at that holding penalty? Tough. So that's Tony, who, uh, uh, again, uh, you know, we we are not talking to any rules experts here. But, uh, you know, again, I think the common the, the common denominator here is we have never seen this called. We can all agree with our common sense even if the, the little part of our brain that actually still renders common sense in society today, that he was not attempting to call a fair catch. And it should have been more obvious when you go back and look at it on replay, Don, that he was signaling to his teammates. That's what's so pathetic about it. Like if, if it had been blown dead in the moment, like think about that. If it had been blown dead in the moment, then we could have looked at it and said, ah, oh, crap call, man. But we would not be blowing it out of proportion like this. It would have been a bad call. But it, we would have never seen the play happen, and it would. they went back after the fact, after it wasn't called, whether it was reviewable or not. He's claiming, the official's claiming it was reviewable, overturned it after the fact in front of 70,000. That's what I think is so disgraceful about the situation. Um, anything to add on that, Don? No, I agree wholeheartedly. All right, let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. We've got uh, Tyler, who's been on hold. Tyler, welcome to the show. Hello. Hey. Uh, I'm from uh, Florida. Traveled to uh, Iowa City this week. Um, took me a long way to get here. Uh, had a couple canceled flights, actually. Uh, had to jump on one to Orlando to Chicago. Anyways, uh, glad, I, glad I could make it and watch the terrible offense. <laughs> yep. Um, you, just, you, just, you, sure, you watched some of that, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, just a couple notes I have down here. Um, I wanted to talk about uh, Deacon Hills, like just absolutely terrible pass accuracy. Um, this is my first time, obviously, seeing him in person. Um, and, uh, yeah, seeing it live is just way worse than I think seeing it on TV. He just throws anything, I think, beyond like 10 yards is just a straight like ground ball basically where the receivers every time they always have to like dig it out of the dirt to catch it. Don, how would you describe his struggles right now? You always talk about a groove throwing motion. I said on a show earlier mm-hmm. this week that it seems like he's throwing kind of from his hip a lot. You know, he had some nice balls today and I thought it was interesting listening back to an interview I did with his high school coach. This was months ago. I listened back to that the other day and he made the comment Deacon can make all the throws. And I believe I believe that's true, Don. I do think he can make all the throws, but he can also miss all the throws because he doesn't have that groove throwing motion. Is that fair? Well, maybe you should qualify by saying Deacon has the arm strength to make all the difficult throws. He, but Don, he made some like that throw to Deontay Vines on the sideline on the run early in the game was impressive, correct? I was more impressed with the catch, even, but well, yeah, both yeah. both were impressive. Absolutely. Yeah. Exactly. But like Tyler said, he's got no consistency with the arm right now. He doesn't have a very compact throwing motion. Uh, You might think of it as a little bit of a wind-up motion. And the bottom line, if it's more compact, it's more grooved, and it's more consistent. I think that's safe to say. It's a little bit of a wind-up motion. Tyler? Uh, Yeah. Do you you have any – thoughts on like the re- because obviously we still had um the receiver struggling to to catch the balls as well i think i've counted probably either four or five drop passes today too um 
the, what what do you think is like the just the common denominator in that? You know, I haven't looked at the TV copy yet, so I won't know until I do. But just sitting in the stadium, um, there were times when there were difficult chances, and um, and the players couldn't quite convert. Uh, sometimes there were defenders nearby, you know, that hit them shortly after the ball got there. And the ball came out as a result of that. So, well, I'll tell you this right now: Seth Anderson's developed a little bit of a bugaboo with drops. Yeah, and I was I surprised because I hadn't seen that out of him until today. Well, it almost make. Well, he did have one. He had one, I believe, last week, Don. But it seems like maybe is there kind of a snowball effect sometimes mentally, where it all of a sudden it becomes harder and harder to catch the football. <laughs> yeah, there's some truth to that. And I feel bad for that young man. He's a great young kid, but he's very new to this level of football, not excusing it at all. He had one drop where, where I think the ball went into the sun along the sidelines, and he dropped it. He had another drop that was just put right in the numbers. But yeah. Deacon, and I think it's also fair, this is a conversation, Don, where we can say multiple things can be true at the same time as well. These guys are dropping the ball more than they should, but Deacon's also got to learn to take a little bit off of some of these throws. At times, yes. Incidentally, Talk about an incredible catch today was Nico. Uh, and with that replay, I fully expected that it would be ruled incomplete. And yet, even with the replay, they ruled the catch. So that told me it must have been an exceptional catch. Well, I'll say this, Don. There were not only Nico, but there were some exceptional catches all around. Exceptional catch by Nico Ragaini, exceptional catch by Deontay Vines, two incredible catches by our young tight end, Addison Estringa, there late, who I hope – gets involved more. He made inc two incredible efforts on those two plays. I know the one he stepped out of bounds first. Right. But, man, uh, quite an effort from those receivers, tight ends, etc. And, yes, you're right, Tyler. There are drops. Those still need to be cleaned up. It didn't feel like that was close to the biggest problem offensively today, though. No. no. I couldn't help but realize several times in that second half, they got out of third and medium or maybe even third and long. Critical downs in general – and the reason they got out of it was because the ball went to the running back. Remember that? Several times. And I think we had him pretty well defended from a wideout standpoint, but the back was thrown um, in space, maybe five or seven yards downfield with some room to run is the point. And I think those passes went on average probably for 10 yards apiece maybe. They, they turned the chains over, that's for sure. And that's one thing, again, that we didn't see today was any involvement in our running backs in the passing game. Yeah. yeah. I, the, my one takeaway on the on the drops was I think it was either second and long or third and long. I think it was second and long. And there was one pass that was just thrown straight to the – I think you commented on it, Corey. And it was just a straight drop. <laughs> yeah. But um but uh my next one I'm not even going to comment on the pun. I mean, we all know we all know that. Um next is I'll just leave you with a question just okay. if you could if you could just give like I guess your rest of the season. I think it's only 4 games left. Uh just your prediction I guess for if like now seeing that Iowa had what 11 yards of rushing after we thought the rushing game was fixed last week. Uh just what your I guess your prediction would be for the rest of the season, and I'll get off of here. Thank you, Tyler. Prediction, Don. It's hard to predict with this team, with this offense. Um, I mean, we all said, I think, heading into this game, hey, it's possible they run the table. It's possible they lose two more. If they go any worse than 9-3, and three, shame on Iowa. Frankly, they ought to go – they ought to win the rest of their games. They ought to go 10-2. and two. But we could also – I think you and I could both, both see them losing at Nebraska or losing – at home against Illinois. Did Illinois pull it off against Wisconsin today? They were up. They did. They came back so, to beat them. So, I mean, that's – that's. Wait, I'm sorry. No, Wisconsin won. Oh, Wisconsin came back. Okay. Wisconsin right. came back. But but that's an indication that Illinois is – you know, they have the ability to win games or at least right. compete. So, you never know. Rutgers is a, a roll of the dice. Frankly, with this offense, every game is winnable. Every game is losable. And we said that even a week ago. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Here's what we better be prepared for. Would it be hard to imagine that each of the next four opponents might try to play us a lot like Minnesota did? 
Why not? Why wouldn't you? Because right. you, you, we saw a one-dimensional offense last week. We basically saw a zero-dimensional offense as the game continued this week. Simply because they lined up to defeat that one dimension that we'd used a week ago. Yep. Yeah. No creativity, no ingenuity. Um, how about this? Uh, we got a name in an RTI Threads player of the game. Don, I, I've got it. I've got him named. He's here. He's 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 on my banner. I'm going to throw it up on the screen. Do you want to take a guess as to who I named the RTI Threads player of the game? Oh. Come on, Don. No. L- look at me. Look at me. Who You know me. Who did I name um, the RTI Threads player of the game? Cooper. Cooper DeGene. Who else? Um, again, just incredible. You know, sitting in the stadium, it's hard to zero in on a particular defender that really had an exceptional game. Uh, it wasn't that difficult a week ago because Sebastian was just off the charts. But I don't, I don't re- recall anybody standing out that much from anyone else on defense. It was a really good team effort, I thought. Jamari did get beat a few times. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. I mentioned to the guy in front of I me, mean, I said, it's obvious to me they're specifically going after Jamari. Yep. In key situations, they did with pretty good success. And Jamari should expect that, of course, because pretty easy choice. Who would you throw against, number three or number 27? And that simply means he's not quite as good a corner as the other one. So he better get ready for any number of other opportunities in these last four regular season games. Michael, appreciate Michael in our, uh, let's see, Michael uh, with the donation here, I believe, Venmo donation. Thank you, Michael. He says, Corey, thanks for keeping Hawkeye fans informed, entertained, and up-to-date on Hawkeye football, I-O-W-A. I'm going to be here no matter what, Don. (laughs) I'm going to be here no matter what. what. Uh, we had a busy basketball season ahead and we got four more games of football. And so anyways, again, uh, folks, I can't stress this enough. Yes. They're sponsoring the show, but genuinely go to the CD three laces up and, uh, com and support Cooper to jeans, merch, his apparel. Um, that young man deserves it. And he deserves to be named the player of the game. Um, I don't know how you don't name him the player of the game when I think you and I agree that that last play was stolen from him, and it was maybe the play of the year in college football was most certainly the best play we've seen out of an Iowa in, in, on either side of the ball, an Iowa player, an Iowa defender. Um, he made an impressive play a year ago, Don. Do you remember at Rutgers, he made a catch over his shoulder on a pick and then returned it for a touchdown. That was a pretty impressive play. It was pretty impressive what he did against Michigan State this year with the catch where he actually read the read the pass better than the defender, got one foot in, also had the return punt for a touchdown in that game. He is one of the – I think he's going to go down as one of the greatest Iowa players of all time. I really do think that's not hyperbole. Don, you've seen a lot of great ones, and you – listen, I am not saying he's Tim Dwight, but that return today was Tim Dwight-esque. It and we was. agree on that. Yes, it was. Uh, Cooper's got a great ability to pick and choose his way down the field. And, of course, he's way above average athletically, too. So that's a that's a great combination. Again, Cooper DeGene, our RTI Threads player of the game. Let's go back to – yes, go ahead, Don. One of the comment, Corey. Got to give a lot of credit to the guys on that punt return unit. We had some blockers downfield that did a good job, too. Absolutely. Yeah, I feel bad for all of those guys on special teams because um, they are making plays as a unit. And uh, – I feel bad. Frankly, Don, you don't want to know who I feel bad for? I feel bad for Deacon Hill. I feel bad for Deacon Hill. Kid's not playing well. He's been put in a really difficult situation. He's playing as well as he can. I have no doubt about that. He's playing as best he feels he can right now. And especially you go out there and, you know, you've you've had booze and fire Brian chance and just nothing's gone your way. You see your teammate make a heroic play. Then it feels like everything comes crashing down and all this pressure is on you and this offensive unit to get 20, 25 yards, but it just seems like a mountain to climb. And then he throws a pick. Right. And then there's a lot of, there's a lot of hate towards him out there right now. And that's unfair. He's not playing well, but man, if if you're going to be mad at anybody, be mad at the officials or be mad at the Iowa coaches for not putting the Iowa players in better position to succeed week in and week out year in and year out. Let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Chris is on hold. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Corey. Hey, Don. How's it going? 
How many hours you guys got in you tonight? Are you got five, six? Uh, Don, <laughs> yeah. You yet? Oh no, I'm at. Uh, I've been on here about <laughs> two fifteen. Don's been over here a little over an hour. We still got about eight hundred people on live. Um, I'm gonna last as long as I can, um, but I don't think any amount of time is gonna help me come to grips with this game. So. Yeah, you might have callers going all night. You need to cut it off at some yep. point. But yep. thanks, guys, for being on. But all I can think about watching that game, I mean, just Cooper, I mean, specialty, like punt returner perspective, I'm a Bears fan. Like Cooper Jean's the best punt returner I've seen since Devin Hester. Has I, Have you guys seen anyone like that? I mean, like, just a lot. Like, if you look at that, tape on replay there's literally six guys within a yard of cooper and he somehow scored a touchdown like that's just can i be on quite honest human. with you earlier yeah. this year chris and I, I may or may not have expressed it on the show or to you coach but i had made the comment that i was a little bit underwhelmed by what we had seen from cooper in the punt return game for, for through the first few weeks of the season and i actually for a while thought yeah is it worth putting him back there i mean he's he's obviously qualified he's good at it I don't know that he's Charlie Jones ask. That's what my thought process was. So maybe don't risk his health in a very dangerous. We're talking about risking guys' health. Having him return punts is a risky thing to do. But boy, I was wrong about that. And I don't know that he is as good as I don't even know that he's as good as Charlie Jones. Don, do you think he's better than Charlie Jones returning punts? It's they they, well, they have different skill sets in doing so. Charlie's already returned one in the NFL as a rookie for touchdowns. So um, really, six to one, half dozen of the other. They're both very capable. But I'll give I'll give uh, the I'll give Lavar Woods and the special teams and, the, and Kirk Ferentz deserves credit for them sticking with Cooper. I think it's worth the risk. Um, I also think it's worth the risk. Maybe you know at some point trying to use him somewhere on the offensive side of the ball. We'll probably never get that. But I applaud them for putting him back there because his skill set. I mean, he's he's won. He won them the Michigan State game, and he should have won them this game, had the right. rest not intervened. It's, it's the truth. Yeah. The bummer about this season, and I mean, it's hard. It's so hard to complain when you're six and one. But I don't know. What do you guys think? The to me, the defense is a top five defense in the country right now. Like the metrics, I don't know. SP plus. I don't know if you guys look at that, but they say they're the number one. De- I was the number one defense in the country. And honestly, from what I watch with how little the offense does for this defense, I I'm hard to question that it's, this is a top three defense. I think we have a top three special teams. I mean, we have everything on special teams. This should be a big 10 contender. And it's just, we're struggling to win a terrible West because of this offense. It's just really frustrating. I mean, I understand industry injuries, but I mean, well, let me say this and Don, yeah. you can comment on this as well. Uh, people early in the year, especially after Utah state and Iowa state had a lot of people say, I don't think this defense is as good as it was last year. It looks like they've taken a step back, which I always find funny because, you know, maybe they have taken a step back. They were fabulous last year and you lose Jack Campbell, you lose Seth Benson, You lose Riley Moss, who's in the league. Yeah, it's going to be hard to be as good as you were last year. But I think one of the things, really the main thing that makes Phil Parker coached defenses so good, and here comes the generic cliche Corey comment, they are so well coached that regardless of who's out there, they first of all, they obviously know how to evaluate guys out of high school. And not everybody's going to become a superstar like a Cooper DeGene or a Jack Campbell, but they understand evaluation. They understand how to coach these kids on game day, develop them, give them the weight room, what their ideal weight should be, et cetera. And they are just so disciplined in what they do, Don, that it seems like there's like there's always going to be some movement based on just skill level and schedule and all these factors. There's going to be movement, but I was always going to be within this little gap, this little space here, this little tier towards the top of college football. As long as Phil Parker is here, and as long as Iowa can, I mean, I don't really know what else to say. As long as Phil Parker's here, you feel like they're going to be able to keep the recruiting where they need it and be able to have this defense be really, really good. Now, are they as good as last year? I don't know. But I didn't buy into those naysayers early in the year who said, I think the defense is taking a step back because, man, they do their job each and every week. Gave up 12 tonight, gave up six last week at Wisconsin, 
gave up 16 to Michigan State, gave up 14 to Utah State, gave up 14 to Iowa State. More, more do you want? <laughs> and that, more 30, you want? Real, that 31 points, I remember you guys talking, what was it, 96 plays that they didn't allow a plus 20-yard play? They fought their ass off to get that. Yeah, I mean, like This is what was... they did against Ohio State last year. It's what they did yeah. against Michigan two years ago in the Big Ten Championship game. And whenever they yeah. get pounded, the defense gives everything they have. It's incredible. Yeah. They understand team concepts because they all understand they must do their job. You don't freelance. You do your job because you're part of the solution. You're one eleventh of the solution every play. It all starts with doing your job. Steve in the chat. Thank you, Steve. He says each quarterback during Brian Ferentz's tenure as QB's coach has seemed to lack pocket awareness. Game doesn't slow down for them. Coaching problem, recruiting, talent. Don, it seems like it's kind of an opposite of – opposite situation to what we see defensively with linebackers and cornerbacks and defensive linemen. It seems like guys get here. And even if they are three to four star recruits, there is sort of, it seems like people regressing. Now Deacon Hill was transferring to Fordham in the off season. So let's not act like he was some five-star recruit, but right. this has seemed, this does seem to be to Steven's point. It seems to be um, a pattern of behavior with the offense in general and, and play callers. So, anyways. Yeah, when did Brian take over as quarterback's coach? 2021? Took it took over as quarterback's coach after the 2021 season. Yeah, so And they weren't good. Listen, they were not good at quarterback during 20 and 21. Oh, no, but no. But I, I you go back to those shows back then. I I Don, you know, I was going on the record saying they need to do something other than Kenny O'Keefe. I have I don't have anything against Ken O'Keefe as an individual, but he ain't he ain't getting it done right now with QB development. And Brian's not getting it done with – let's be honest. He's My not, point, listen. real quick, quarterback development. So this season, apparently the only quarterbacks that's been, that have been developed in this system for more than just the three, four months of the transfer portal were Labus. I guess that's it. But So the fact that Labus can't – surpassed Deacon Hill and he didn't even he's not even he had three years of Brian Ferentz coaching and he can't start for this team I don't understand how I mean that's an indictment on the coaching there I mean that Deacon Hill comes out of nowhere and they have more trust in him than a quarterback that's been in the system for three years that they've raved about for I mean I remember their freshman year they're raving about Labus I don't yeah it just feels like there's a big gap in the quarterback development that really needs to be addressed. Yeah, I, I can't remember who it was that tweeted this out. I think it was, let me find it. It might have been uh, Chad Lystico, the Des Moines Register, tweeted this out earlier. And Don, I don't know how you weigh. Obviously, recruiting is a science, and there's, you know, not only one quarterback can be the starter, you know, unless you're playing a multi quarterback system, which is probably not ideal, but it, it can work. But uh, Chad had, had uh, tweeted out a, recent rundown of quarterbacks that Iowa has landed via recruiting. Now let's listen to this list. I'm going to go back to 2011 first. Jake Rudock, CJ Beathard. I would say both of those were a success. I know Jake ended up losing the job to CJ. Jake transfers to Michigan, had a good finish to his career there. Nick Shimanek in 2013 from Texas. Tyler Wiegers from Detroit. Drew Cook from Iowa City. Ryan Boyle from uh, West Des Moines. Nate Stanley, Wisconsin, I'd say that was a success. Peyton Manzel from Texas, Spencer Petrus from California, Alex Padilla from Colorado, Deuce Hogan from Texas, Joe Labus from Ohio, Carson May from Oklahoma, and then Marco Linez, James Resar, 23 and 24. Seems like a lot of misses in there, Don. I mean, obviously, this is the era of the transfer portal. I get that. But, I mean, you look at guys like Petrus and guys like, uh, I mean, Frankly, I don't want to bring up Drew Cook, but he's an example of really talented genes, Don, and maybe he could have been utilized more than he was. That 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 may be fair. Carson May was a four star at one time. He's gone. Alex Padilla, he's what sitting three seats back at SMU right now. Deuce Hogan ain't playing down at Kentucky. Peyton Manzel, I think, went on to did he go to like Abilene Christian or something? Right. Like Ryan Boyle, I think, transferred to Indiana State. It seems like. Yeah, they're not developing guys, but they're also not evaluating recruits very well at that position. That seems to be – that's more than a, just a Brian Ferentz problem. That's not a great winning percentage. No. 
And I, I can't. I know it's apples to oranges. You can't can look at Iowa's track record with quarterbacks and compare it to Ohio State's because obviously Ohio State's going to be able to get the higher rated guys in general. But like, I'm thinking most most successful programs, most successful offenses. You look at a lineup like that of the last ten years or fifteen years of quarterback recruiting. You're probably going to see a lot of guys that never played. But I'm guessing some of those guys ended up being pretty solid backups or transferred somewhere else and played. Right. And played well. And a couple of these guys did. I think I think Peyton Manziel had a decent career, albeit at a much lower level, as did Tyler Wiegers at Eastern Michigan. But, like, I don't know, man. That just seems like we're not really – we don't have a clue right now. And I, I don't get me wrong. I like James Resar and, and Marco Linez, but I, I don't have a lot of confidence, Chris, and Iowa's ability to evaluate, identify talent at that position. Something that, yeah, something that, and then I'll get off, but something that stands out to me. So, I mean, Beathard, he wasn't a running quarterback per se, but he was very mobile. And that was 2015. We literally went 12 and 0. And since then, we have not started a quarterback. I mean, Cade might be an exception that has been anything but a statue. So I don't understand why we, Bathard, even back to Banks, when we have mobile quarterbacks, that tends to be when we're at our most successful, but yet Kirk and the crew seems very uh, hesitant on playing those quarterbacks. So I really don't understand that, but I'll let Don uh, kind of comment on his thoughts on that, and I'll get off, but good to talk to you guys. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. Well, I know how we felt back in the 80s and 90s. You want a quarterback that we referred to as a combination quarterback. A guy that could run and throw. He didn't. <coughs> excuse me. He didn't have to be the world's best runner, but he had to be athletic enough to extend plays, athletic enough to avoid a pass rush to some de- degree of success. Uh, he could not be uh, a statue in the pocket, you know, because it was simply too hard to protect him. So you wanted a guy. Any number of quarterbacks that we had, they ended up with positive yardage at the end of the season. Matt Rogers is a good example. Uh, Chuck Hartley, even, I believe, had positive yardage at the end of his years, too. Uh, not that we ran them a lot, but they'd pull the ball down and run for a few yards here and there. Or in some cases, it would be a cute draw or an option play where they ended up keeping the ball. Or maybe a naked boot where they ran for significant yardage. But they, they all had the capacity to avoid, avoid tacklers at least to some degree some greater than others, of course, but they all had a capacity to to move in the pocket and buy time. I was just looking. I was going back to the track record of Iowa and quarterbacks. C.J. Beathard committed to Iowa in January of 2012. Greg Davis was hired at Iowa in February of 2012. Um, the reason I bring that up is I just was curious. I'm assuming Ken O'Keefe had something to do with his recruiting. Um, and I'm talking about C.J.'s recruitment to Iowa certainly would have had something to do with Jake Rudock's recruitment to Iowa. He was part of the 2011 class, but I just, I wonder, you know, th- those are two success stories um, that were both ended up being Greg Davis era quarterback. Say what you want about Greg Davis. Quarterback play was better under Greg Davis than it is now, Don. You would know better than I simply working in and don't really have a feel the way things was here. Uh, okay. Uh, Steve, thank you for the chat and Grant, thank you for the super chat as well. And I think maybe missed the actual comment. Let's see. Okay. Here it is. Grant, thank you. Went duck hunting today. It was awesome. Tis the season, right? Grant, thank you for the super chat, sir. Thank you for being here. And he adds with this super chat, I would never cheer for a Hawkeye loss, but my point is find a new Saturday hobby. Hawkeye fans, things won't change until we let the money talk. And I would agree with that to a large extent, Grant. Um, but I think, you know, I don't think people watching it on TV are part of the problem right now. <laughs> uh, I don't think there's anything wrong. And frankly, Don, uh, do I blame you for being at every game? You know, I don't blame anybody for going to the games. I, I don't think you have to, uh, I don't know. They're, 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 how do you, how do you deal with that as a fan? Don, you're more than a fan. You're a former coach, of course, here. And, and I was right. a part of you per se. But what would you recommend to fans that want to ignite change, but they're not part of the big money donor list that, you know, has the power or they're not part of the Iowa administration? How can they ignite change respectfully or try to do that? Yeah, that's a tough one. 
uh, I don't know that I have a good answer for that. You know, they, you're really, you're conflicted because you want to support the team and yet you may not be entirely approving of the way things are going. So I don't know what you do other than maybe phone into talk shows and talk with other other fans about it. And, come, come over to our show, Don. Is that Are you putting a yeah, plug exactly. in? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. How's that for a famous plug? Yep. Uh, Viking Hawk 33. If Iowa goes to Indy, the refs won't need to help Michigan or Ohio State win. That's probably true, Don. <laughs> Penn State's not having either, but that's probably true. Great show, Corey and Don. And Don, let's just call a spade a spade. I love that expression, right? People have given me a hard time for that. They are still in a position to make the championship game. Now, they're not going to win the – listen, any any minute chance of them making the playoff are out the window. Not that that was ever reasonable before, but uh, – why am I hearing an echo all of a sudden? Uh, anybody else hear that? You sound uh, fine to make here. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Viking Hawk 33 for the super chat. Uh, let's go back to our call in line. We've had a caller on our phone line waiting for a long, long time. Thank you for calling our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Who's on the line? Good to hear your voice, Lemansky my voice or not but i uh i guess i appreciate a couple of your comments both both you guys have good comments the thing about putting people in positions to to the best of their ability don you and i have touched on this when lon Olin zach used to pooch punt in 1980 for reggie roby and bear with me and i'll try to be brief it's been a long day but Olin zach played quarterback in high school Right. Olin Zach was in my conference when I was in high school. He actually kicked, uh, he punted, he played tight end. He's a former quarterback. And that same year, Don, I'll refresh your memory. You have Gales, Gordy Bohannon. I think there's a Hogan. Then there's Chuck Long and Lon Olin Zach all are under the passing category, fellas. And so you listeners don't remember that. That's that's identifying talent, and I think Ron Nolan's that could have come in and played better today than than the last three years of backup quarterback. So I watched him in high school, and I guess my point is, I don't believe, and it's controversial. And you can argue with me and say I'm wrong. When you let's say he fair, fair caught that fair caught that tonight, and we need a field goal to win. How special would be be to have a special play for Cooper DeJean on offense, even if it's to mess with Minnesota heads or or some athlete on the Iowa program to even take the snaps. I don't care who it is that's an athlete and show something different in a critical point of the game. And we had Cooper for that tonight. I agree. I think we got robbed. But. I think you got to hit the fire alarm, fellas, because I see one or two more losses headed our way because we are so predictable. I'm not sure Minnesota is the best team we're going to play, and you can comment on my crazy comments tonight. Well, uh, well, Don, I'll let you go first. Don, you have a response to that? I don't even know where to start, really. Um, I'll say this. These four teams that remain, correct me if I'm wrong, right now – Wisconsin has one loss in conference play. We have to, if we win out, we still represent. Isn't that true? That, see, that's why it's earlier. I'm, I sorry. I'm sorry. I'm assuming Wisconsin loses to Ohio State. They right. pick up their second loss. Yes, exactly. You're right. We, that's why Iowa doesn't control its own destiny now. Yeah. How many losses right now does Minnesota have? They have at least two. Yeah, so right right now the standings are uh, Minnesota's two and two, Nebraska's two and two, Iowa's three and two, Wisconsin's three and one. Iowa gets Nebraska still on the schedule. Minnesota does have the tiebreaker now on Iowa. It's incredible. Minnesota right. is not they're, they're not winning out. They play at Ohio State, they get Wisconsin in Minneapolis, they go to Purdue. So at a minimum, they're gonna lose at Ohio State. Um, so they're going to have at least three losses. And you're right. Uh, if Wisconsin loses to Ohio State, Iowa wins out, they're in. Right. 
and um, isn't it mathematically possible that right now, right now, as an example, Minnesota only has two losses. So if they went out and we went out and Wisconsin suffers one loss, then there could be a three-way tie, right, at seven and two. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're correct. Well, uh, let's see. Wisconsin would have to beat Ohio State. Am I correct in saying that? Well, yeah. when, let's say this. When Wisconsin and Minnesota play, somebody gets another loss. That's what I'm saying. So yeah. if there's going to be a three-way tie at, with two losses, it's going to be Minnesota beats Wisconsin. Wisconsin loses to Ohio State. Well, no, I'm sorry. Wisc- I'm sorry. Let me get let me backtrack on that. Minnesota would have to beat Wisconsin. Wisconsin would beat Ohio State. I was not that good. At, I would say. Here's the bottom line. If we went out, I think the odds are at least 50-50 that we represent. I think they're more – if they went out, I think it's like 90-10, Don. <laughs> yeah. I think it's almost assured that they will be in the, the – uh, the Big Ten Championship game if they went out. But I'm with Lomansky. I don't have a lot of confidence right now they're going to win out. And I didn't have a ton of – I didn't have a lot of confidence last week. I said very clearly they could win out, and and I stood by that. I mean, they could have won tonight, should have won tonight, and they should win in two weeks, and they should win in three weeks, and they should win the week after that. They should beat everybody left on the schedule, but everybody on that schedule can beat them because of how bad the offense is. Well, I said this a week ago, Corey. I really thought that – that our defense against Wisconsin was elite. I even said they remind me of our 81 defense. That's statistically that's the best defense in the history of the of Big Ten play for Iowa. Uh, and I did state this during the week: if we match the effort and enthusiasm against Minnesota that we had for Wisconsin, we'll win the game. I don't know that we we matched it. It was still a really solid effort. Don't get me wrong, but last week I thought was exceptional. And um, we tried to match it because it's very helpful to play for the defense. Uh, you know, they they uh, must just for yards in there. Um, you know, we gave up more first downs than what we made, that's for sure. I still think they only had maybe 12 first downs. We had nine, as I recall. But they did end up outrushing us by 100 yards, 102, I think it was. And um, it was for sure uh, – a good effort on defense, but I can't honestly say that it was quite as good as last week. Uh, and offensively, I, I think you have to you have to say it wasn't as good, if only because last week we actually ran the ball against Wisconsin. Now, part of that part of that result came from loading the box, I think, and daring us to throw even more than Wisconsin dared us to throw. Uh, Wisconsin didn't dare us to throw enough, frankly. They should have demanded that we throw more by by being more committed to the box. Multiple people have reached out to me and said they've looked the rule book up and down and they do not believe that that play was reviewable. It was not called a fair catch during the course of the play. And it's not uh, the intent of the rule to allow an official to go back and say, oh, that, that we missed a fair catch signal or an invalid fair catch signal. Anyways, a lot to untangle with all of it. Uh, James with the super chat, six and two, we could be sub 500. That's true as well. Thank you for the super chat, James. With this offense, they played a lot of close games. The nice thing about it is they found an art for winning close games. But boy, hard to overcome. They, they were going to do it again tonight, Don. That's what's crazy. They were going to find a way to do it again. Right. And yes, credit to Cooper to Gene, but Don, you could argue they had no business winning that game today. And yet they put themselves in a position to do so. Uh, anything else, Lemansky, before I let you go? Well, thanks for remembering me. Uh, you guys do a great job. What I don't understand, and it must be that I'm just don't have the coaching experience, but last week we had a quarterback fumble a ball and get on it. I don't know what the odds of that are, but, and we had a, we had a critical, referee call about interception that went our way was called incomplete. So our defense of last week was we're no risk offense. We didn't turn the ball over. So what it tells me this week, we're lucky because there's a beat writer that follows the Hawks that pounded this on his show saying, 
we had that problem last week. We're going to have it this week, and look what happened. We didn't win the turnover mar margin, did we, Don? Minus three. Okay. That's, that's incredible. So, so that's why, fellas, for the first time in two years, and Corey, my members, I try to be as positive as I can be. I am scared to death of no changes, no breaking our tendencies. And that's why the regime change for 2024, I am sliding, and I hate to do this, but I'm sliding like, what hope do we have for 2024, let alone this year? And I'll, I'll go on record. I'm scared to death that we're, we're not even going to win the Big Ten West because I think there's other programs that have a more balanced attack in the three phases of football. And I'll, I'll leave being negative, but if that's our only voice is to speak our opinion and, and ask for more. And I gave Don, my comments are a compliment for your entire career at Iowa. You, you, you know, we turned Linderbaum around from defense to offense. We got a second year center. We turned from defense to office. We can look at our talent and make moves. You did that a lot at Iowa. You could go on and on. I'll get off the air, but this this coaching staff does not does not equal the moves and strategy of Don Patterson and Hayden Fry. It doesn't do that. Plus, they didn't have the Western Division to like the wind behind their sails. I get off and thank you, fellas, for your work. Thank you, Lemansky. Appreciate the phone call. Okay. Um... We're trucking along here. Do want to give a quick shout out to uh, our sponsors. And uh, we talked a little bit about Iowa Smokehouse earlier. They've been sponsoring our call in line. But if you need a great tasting snack and who doesn't, give Iowa Smokehouse a call. Lots of football still ahead, folks, not only in college football, Iowa football, but the NFL. And we've got basketball season right around the corner. This stuff goes great for your uh, Iowa basketball, Iowa women's basketball watch parties. Use the code Hawkeyes at iowasmokehouse.com to receive 15% off your total order. You spend $50 on an order, you'll get free shipping, courtesy of Iowa Smokehouse. And as the uh, picture shows, it goes great with uh, maybe a favorite beer or maybe even a bourbon. Again, iowasmokehouse.com. Tasting is believing. This is an independently owned, locally owned company down in Albia. Also, uh, we talked about uh, State Farm and Brad Van Meter. Give him a chance to uh, save you and your family some money. 515-256-6480. 515-256-6480. Brad was with us during basketball season last year. He's with us during football season this year. Give him a chance. Just give him a call or pro possibly visit his website. He can give you a quote. BradVanMeter.com. You can visit him in person at 4229 Fleur Drive in Des Moines. All right, let's go back to our call-in line. We've got Scott on hold. Scott, welcome to our Iowa Smokehouse call-in line. Hello. Can you see me? You, we can see you. Yeah, so a lot of the callers have already expressed my sentiment, but uh, I live in Omaha, Nebraska. And so for what's worth, I got both Iowa fan, um, friends and Nebraska friends, and I was watching the game with them, and uh, they were as shocked and in disbelief that I play got called back. So it's not just Iowa fans. But, um, and I didn't hear this firsthand. Uh, I was listening to the TV, and one of the commentators said that a reporter had asked Kirk Ferentz, Were you aware that Deacon Hill was 27 of 70 in the previous two games? And Kirk Ferentz says, No, I was not aware of that but I was aware that he didn't turn the ball over. I mean, either he's, you know, lying to the reporter or, I mean, is it possible he didn't know those stats or he doesn't pay attention? I think it's possible he doesn't care, Scott. Yeah, because, you know, I, I come to the – because I'm always wondering, like, why – I mean, you know, Spencer, Deacon, they're just horribly inaccurate, and I think – you know, the reason why Joey Lavis might not be playing is because um, somebody said that, you know, nobody can has firsthand knowledge. They're only listening to what the coaches say that, oh, well, D, uh, Joey Lavis, like, turns the ball over a lot in practice. And I think Kirk Ferentz would rather have a quarterback that has a 20% completion rate with no turnovers versus 
a quarterback that has maybe a 70% completion rate but might turn the ball over because he's taking chances. But then – and so the excuse – of why he was, why Deacon Hill is getting the start over the other quarterbacks is that he doesn't turn the ball over. And here we have an interception and two fumbles. One of them, which basically turns out to be the, you know, game winning field goal, you know, and could have been a touchdown had our defense not stepped up. And even, you know, after Cooper DeGene's run, punt return got called back. You know, we had the ball with the wind and Drew Stevens as a, a really good field goal kicker. So we had to go 18 yards, so I figured get to the 35-yard line. But I wonder, you know, he probably could have hit it even at the 40-yard line. Yeah, yeah. I, made the comment, I made the comment, Scott, that all they needed to get – I think they needed to get him to – honestly, I would have taken him from the 45 – and yes, that would have been like a sixty-three yarder. I would have taken that over a hail mary, because yeah, I think he, he makes those. And I don't know what the wind was doing in that direction, Don, but it seemed like that was the better direction to go based on well, some of the kicks earlier. Correct. One of the field goals that he kicked uh, earlier, I mean, that was uh, oh, what fifty? Was that fifty? And it was with the wind, and that had that was like halfway up the goalpost. It seemed like. Let me say this: I, I noticed at halftime. Him kicking to the north, and he just had it, you know, not with a holder, but just teed up with their little device that they use uh, into the wind at halftime. 51 yards, the ball hit the crossbar and bounced on over. He was good from yeah. 51 into the wind at the second half, at the intermission. So I don't think there's any doubt he had plenty of leg to go out towards 60 with the wind. Yeah, in that so fourth we, quarter. We literally had – I mean, we had – a that was because they put 12 seconds back on the clock. We still had a minute and a half <laughs> to go six yards. And we – you know, like, I am not a fan that wants – that needs Iowa to score 40 points a game. I'm asking them to move the ball 10 yards multiple times and try to do it multiple times in a row. And hopefully that adds up to a few more points than what we're scoring. I have some stats here for anybody who haven't looked at the box score. And I'm just, you know, as you're talking, Scott, I'm looking through some stats here. We've been on, I've been on for almost three hours, but I'm getting to see stats now. Look at these numbers, Don. Uh, 18 yards in the second half for Iowa's offense. 0 0.9 yards per play, 0 0.9 yards per rush, and two total first downs. And yeah. some of that is playing from behind. I mean, it's incredible. It's it's incredible. I, I don't even know how. I mean, Scott, you're laughing because these are these are Don. I'm serious. Iowa, th this offense, and it's been this way now for a couple of years. This offense is a laughing stock among college football analysts and fans everywhere. People see this kind of stuff and laugh because it is nobody else is doing stuff like this. Nobody else pulls this kind of stuff off. Right. I'm laughing so I don't cry. <laughs> and, and Don, when they win games, the fans try to ignore it. And the coaches, I don't know if they try to ignore it, but it seems like they're not real concerned with fixing it. Because, I mean, this has been going on now for three years uh, where it's it's always, you know, it's never been great under Brian or under Kirk, but it's certainly never been this bad. I and mean, this, this is insane. And then you look at the numbers last week. Deacon Hill had 36 passing yards at the beginning of the second quarter. He had one passing yard the rest of the game in the final mm -hmm. like three quarters. That's a, I mean, Don, that's in, insane. I, I don't even there aren't even words to describe it. I don't know what's more insane, what the officials did with the Cooper Gene play today, or this offense that cannot seem to improve, but frankly only seems to get worse. I, I don't I don't understand it. And, and by the way, run game did show signs of life last week. It showed signs of life a couple of games earlier in the year. Um, but you can't be one-dimensional. And it's taken a long time to get that line to, to be proficient against the boxes they were facing. And now they're going to face more loaded boxes and teams are going to force Deacon in this offense to throw the ball. And they have proven, right as of right now, they have proven we can't do that. We're not capable of, of moving the ball downfield effectively. I mean, we talked about some incredible grabs. Think about that. There were some nice grabs in the first half. A couple of those grabs from Addison and Stringa in the second half. 
And yet, look at those numbers. <laughs> those are the numbers. It's just, it's just something. It's it's so obscene. Anyways, anything else, Scott? Before I let you slide. Well, yeah, and you know, I know Kirk Ferentz, you know, talks a lot about execution, but the contrast between our defense, where you know the scheme is very simple, you know, so we can focus mostly on execution and fundamentals, but on the offense, it just and I'm not an offensive guru, so I don't. But it just seems like our offense is so complicated that we spend all of the time just learning it and not actually being able to execute. And, t- and when it comes to like uh, football fundamentals, Nate Stanley, when he graduated and he was like trying out for the, um, or maybe might have been with the uh, Vikings, but he actually Vikings. brought it up that we, that in his four years, they never went over Mc- like mechanics. That and was, fundamentals. you know what? You're right about that. I heard that exact quote. That was not Brian, that was Ken O'Keefe. Well, yeah, no, uh, yeah. I'm, what I'm saying to your point, it's not just a Brian problem. Yeah. I want to make that clear. People think, oh, I've had people this last week. You just hate Brian, Corey. You just have it out to get Brian. No, I'm yeah. It's, I don't have anything against Brian personally. It's He's part of the problem right now. Ken O'Keefe yep. was part of the problem when he was here, but there are other common denominators. Oh, yeah. That go much higher than Brian. Yeah. Because, I mean, unless if you're a, even a five star quarterback, still needs coaching. And I know, like, a lot of people um, were upset with like, that. Uh, quarterback coach out of New Jersey was like Spencer Petras, but it's like, you can't coach somebody for two weeks. And then he comes back to this offense, you know, because in order to become good with the, just the fundamentals, you, you gotta be able to like have that reinforced, you know, during practice, you know? And so anyway, but it, um, yeah, it, but it's almost Kirk France ain't going to listen <laughs> And that's what I think is just so maddening. But anyway, I'll let you go. Always appreciate talking to you. Thank you for calling, sir. Appreciate Scott. And we've got a couple super chats here to get to Mike B in the chat. The Deacon overthrows are killing me. Where's the coaching? His fundamentals are off in crunch time. Well, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, he's reined in some of those the last couple of games. But in general, he's very erratic with his throws, regardless if it's crunch time or not. And those numbers that we just showed in the second half are indicators of just that. But we're not helping him out with play calling, Don. Um, we're not helping him out with drops. I'm not helping him out with protection at times. Although pass protection has been better this year, I think, overall. Um, but, like, again, what are, what's the common denominator with all these things that we say? Quarterback problems. O line problems, receiver problems, play calling problems, schematic problems. What's the common denominator? You figure it out. James, we can't spend 35 plus minutes in the field playing defense and expect to win all the time. Well, that's fair. How many snaps do we have today, Don? How many snaps did Iowa play today? Do you have those numbers? I uh, know we, we got beaten pretty significantly in terms of number of plays. I think it was something like 70 to 56. Here, 56 for Iowa and 69. So not – I mean, they get beat every game, right? We come to expect this, but not as uh, drastic. <laughs> Minnesota's – Don, Minnesota's offense went through a stretch there where didn't they have like four, four and out – or five, four and outs and – or excuse me, five, three and outs in seven possessions? They went through a spurt there where they were awful. They could not move the ball at all. And then third quarter – they made some adjustments, start taking some shots, and move the football a little bit more effectively. Actually, in terms of critical down conversions, we actually had the edge. But but not that, not that we were great. We were four out of fifteen. They were four out of eighteen. Okay, but just just to be clear on this, Don, I want to be, be clear. I want to challenge you a little bit on this. You're right, absolutely right. You're reading me stats. But uh, let me see here. Third quarter. So they break up. They break up these uh, numbers, these stats on the official box score. Here we go. Third down conversions. Third quarter, Minnesota. Um, just the thir- just third quarter, they were three of six on third down, and then in the fourth quarter, they were one of five. But you look at those numbers: four of eleven. Um, that third quarter was big. They converted a few big third downs in that third quarter. The rest of the game, they were bad. But they can. That means in the first half, they were zero for zero for seven. 
Correct. Right. Thank you for the super chat, James Ross. Appreciate this comment as well. Row the boat, ski you ma, go Gophers. Opposite side of the fan bases, but love your passion in college football content. Thanks for beating Bucky. Appreciate that. Those are the kind of Minnesota fans you love to hear from, Don. Passionate about their team, but respect. Absolutely. And for that matter, Dave was respectful earlier when he called in. Uh, Lonnie, Hill is not the answer. Marco can't, can't be worse. I got a tickle in my throat, Don. I apologize. Uh, well... I don't, you know, that's a little, it's simplifying things a little bit, Don, right? Um, yeah, I, we don't know. Yeah, I have a feeling if you were in this situation, you're not there at practice every day, but you would probably, knowing what you do right now without being there every day, you'd probably give the nod to Joe before you'd give the nod to Marco. But I'm all for. I wouldn't even say that. Okay. I'll tell you what I'd do with an off week. I'd give equal reps to all three of them and evaluate them. You and I both know that's not happening, Don. I know. It's, it's but I would go equal reps against equal opposition. That's I what I would do. Lemansky, thanks for therapy, Corey and Don. Feeling better, digesting your wisdom. Watching the USC defense, sanity returning. God bless Phil Parker, 28-14, Utah beating USC. Thank you for the super chat, Lemansky. Always appreciate your support. And, uh, yeah, absolutely to the Phil Parker comment, 100%. Um, okay. Uh, it's our text line. I wanted to read our, somebody from our text line. This message is too long for me to actually throw up on the screen, but, uh, uh, we got a couple people that do regularly send in text messages regarding these games. This is a Iowa fan from Missouri who says, watch Cooper on any called fair catch. I feel that he was pointing to his teammate to get away from the incoming punt. His hand never went over his head for a fair catch signal. If anyone has recorded games, all you have to watch is how what he does when he signals a fair catch, just how he does it. My only other comment is that I am sure tired of being games being decided by the officials. Sorry, this is late. I have recorded your show and I'm watching it for the first time. So um, thank you for that uh, Iowa fan from Missouri. And let's see here. Okay. Let's go back to our Iowa smokehouse call in line. We've got Kyle on hold. Kyle, welcome. Hey, how you doing? I'm good, Kyle. How are you? Um, I'll say this. I feel better than I did two hours. I feel better than I did three hours ago. I'm still sick to my stomach about the whole situation, but I feel better than I did three hours ago because I get to do the show with a bunch of people who share my feelings and love for Iowa football and a great guy in Coach Patterson. So I feel pretty good. That's, yeah, I, <clears throat> I'm going to be completely honest. I'm totally nervous to broach the uh, fair catch thing with you. Um, why? So, um, because, um, I'm just going to say it the way that y'all are interpreting the language just needs some clarifying. So like, I, I recognize it's a massively emotional play. I was at the game with my seven year old daughter. We are jumping up and down. It would have been an unbelievable memory for me to have for the rest of our lives, for her first game to be that way. Um, and I was fuming for 20 to 30 minutes on the way home. Like, how could you make that call if you're not 100% sure it's a fair catch? I want to acknowledge I agree with everything that you've said, like 99%. It was not a fair catch. That is 100% true. Um, but I think that when when you read the, the, the text that I forwarded from, um, from X, um, in your DM, what it's saying is that when it says it's an invalid fair catch call, what it's not saying is that there's nothing that happens or it's not a fair catch. What it's saying is, is that you cannot make an invalid fair catch. That is, you can't deceive by also doing this, you know, like what he did with his arms. And so all I'm saying is, is like, I don't think you should be mad at the refs. You should be mad at the rule. Um, well, oh, it, no, hold on it, a second. I want to make clear. I, I understand that, Kyle. So, but at, throughout this entire time, every time somebody's brought it up, you've consistently said, "But it's not a fair catch." We no, agree, I, it's not. It's it's an invalid fair catch signal, and therefore, no, by it's not, I don't believe it's an invalid fair catch signal. An invalid signal is waving as a waving signal. He was not waving. If we're going to call you, this waving, if we're going to call this waving, then running down the field like this is waving, Kyle. That's my point. But don't you remember the rule length? Like, see, as a coach myself, like, I know 
that the rule book also has a companion case book. And the reason it has that is because sometimes the rules you need interpretation and you need better language. And, okay, so, and what's so the case book say? I, I have no idea. I'm on the road, but I can acknowledge I can acknowledge that what's going on there is that the rule book itself literally said you even you even um, read it that hey anything that's not basically covered by this valid catch is waving, an invalid waving, one when waving Kyle correct waving. but waving's waving. waving's not above your head yeah yeah like okay. you have to define yeah you define waving define waving like I said you're running on the field like this you're running toward the ball on the sideline that's waving. It's, there's got to be a common of, sense element here. I, I like. I, I actually don't a hundred percent disagree with you there, except for you to take the extreme part no, to go. Well, I'm running on the field, therefore I'm waving. He I was mean, what he yeah. like waving. What is waving? What is waving? Like, so can't like fine. Let's define it because you, you did point as teammates. He can't point at the ball. He can't. What can't he do? So because he's in that situation, yes, he communicate with his teammates. He's got to put his hands behind his back. And yell at his teammates. Is no, that no. Like, let's. No, no. I'm not. Like, I think what would be fair is to stop using massively extreme language. Like, wait. Like, running with your arms is obviously not waving. Put your hands behind your back is obviously not waving. But I what see. is waving? If I, if I if I see you on the street on the side, right? Like, what's waving? It's moving your hands. Like, again, I just don't think we should be mad at the refs. What we should be mad at is like. Man, should that really be a rule? An invalid fair catch? But by the rule, if you make any sort of movement with your hand, even if you're telling your teammates down, that's that's called an invalid. That's not what it says, Kyle. That is not what it says. It's not any movement or any motion. It's a wave. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm reading but it. the rules, but the rules expert who came on the TV said it. Guys, that's what's called an invalid, and therefore it's a dead ball. So you just said earlier that you would trust a rules expert. That's literally what he said. And then they went and asked the ref, Scott Docterman, fantastic reporter, actually does his job and goes, asks him. So you have two rules experts who are saying that's what's called an invalid fair catch. He can't do that with his hands. And and then it's a dead There's ball. There's multiple levels of this that need to be looked at, Kyle. There's also the level that it wasn't called on the field. So agreed, agreed. Like I actually wholeheartedly agree with that. So it's, I don't know it's if it's a, reviewable. That's a question mark. Let's see what the Big Ten says on this, okay? Because well, the, the ref did say it was reviewable, and, and maybe no, maybe no, that's I unfair. I don't give a uh, listen. I don't give a cat's patootie what the ref said. I don't care because he's the one who made the call. Of course, he's going to say it's. He, what do you think he's going to do? Tell Scott Document. Well, it wasn't reviewable, Scott. But I, you know, of course he's going to say it's reviewable. But I'm saying because because it was like well, like like know May, that. <laughs> why would we not know that? Why, why why do we know that? Just because the official that ultimately made the decision said it was. Listen, these why are not high school that? umpires, and I deal with high school umpires. Like these guys are very good at their jobs. Now, could there like I will acknowledge to you, Corey, there is a two to four percent chance that he's mistaken and it's not reviewable. I two think it's. Like it's so small. These guys, you know how much studying they do. You know, like it's it. They're very, um, like, it's frustrating when stuff like this happens. But I just, I like, I'm having trouble throughout the whole conversation as I'm riding home, going, ah, gosh, it just sounds like when you when you talk to Tom and as Don was jumping in, like, I actually thought Don, you were really close because you said, well, invalid, and then Corey jumped right in and started talking about, well, it's not a fair catch and. I thought you were going to acknowledge. I, I just at least want it to be acknowledged that what their right. rule interpretation was was that it was an invalid fair catch, and what right. that doesn't mean is that it, it, it that doesn't mean that like somehow it, it doesn't matter. You I can't know. make waving. Does that make sense? I know that. I know that. Okay. Okay. I'm Fair enough. Fair. It's I just that. I'm when, I'm saying when the super chat was put up, like you said, that's not the rule, and and. And I went, uh, but that so, was so at least that was clarified. We clarified okay. that like two hours ago. Okay. Yeah. So, I've listened to the whole thing. Like I, I made sure to listen to every piece. We're on and the even, stage right now. We're okay. All right. Now. Well, can I at least say as much, like just respect you so much. This is like, this sucks yeah, for no. me because I actually don't want to disagree with you. 
However, no, I like the I, entire I, the entire I'm, conversation. I've gotten the sense that you haven't that. Uh, uh, I should say my interpretation, and maybe this is unfair. My interpretation is that every stance you would say, well, it's not a fair catch. And I'd go, oh, I think they're missing it. It's an invalid fair catch. It's not actually a fair catch call, but he's not allowed to wave his hand like that. And I so hate the rule, and I think it's stupid. And I, will, I, will, but, I will agree to disagree with you on, on some things, but here's, the, the, here's how we'll come to a compromise on all this, Kyle. Let's wait to see if the Big Ten or the NCAA comments on it and – we'll get some actual clarity from people who not in the moment, not us emotional people, not the refs yep. who went back to look at it. They weigh everything. My overall stance in this situation is that a couple things. A, I've seen that happen a million times where a player goes like this and then goes up and returns it. Never yes. has been called again. So there's a precedent right. that's been set. Absolutely. Coach Patterson, coach yep. has said the yep. same thing. He's been coaching for, for a, a, well, not a million years, but close to it. And 37. I think you've never seen yep. anything like this. So is it is it in the rule book? We'll find out because I, I kind yeah. of disagree with the interpretation of the term wave. There's another thing. Obviously, Kirk disagrees, but he's biased. We're all biased. I get that. So, yeah, I well, I would acknowledge as a coach, there's a lot of special cases like I think the, that, that I don't really know until unfortunately I go through them. And I think the one thing to acknowledge here um, is that regardless of if we're happy with the if it is a rule, if we can just say that, whether or not we're happy with it, um, and it's a, a good or a bad rule, the sh the stinky part about this whole situation is that the like you're never going to have another situation like this, at least probably not, because they reviewed something different, right? And and that's I, I am very frustrated by that. Like I um, I would love somebody to explain to me. Um, cause like, how often is it like, well, the call stands, it's like, well, you can't look at two things. They can only look at the, the, the play. And so I think that that's frustrating and I would like an explanation. And I think that's fair, but also the unfortunate part about this play was that it was so decisive and it happened to be on the sidelines. So they were able to review it. And then they probably looked and went, Oh guys, shoot, that looks like a wave that would be invalid. And maybe they didn't see that in real time. And that stinks. And I wish they wouldn't have overdone it. And I think there is a conversation to go, hey, should we be able to overrule that with all the great points you brought up with the defense not reacting? But I at least I at least wanted to call in to say at every point I've heard you guys talk about it, I haven't heard you acknowledge that if it is indeed a wave, and, and I think we can disagree on that, and I'm happy with that. But it but they did enforce if it is a wave, they did enforce the rule correctly. And I hate and I hate that that would be the case I if they enforce the, the wave correctly. I, I agree with that comment. I'll leave it at that, Kyle. If it was a wave, it was it, it was enforced. I don't know if it was reviewable. That's still a question. I don't just trust the official. That For said sure. It was. But but yep. I, it wasn't me. that's where you and I disagree, though, because you're right. And I was not clear on that at first. The invalid wave was called. So we're on the same page on that. Let's wait to see what's if anything has said. Regardless, it sucks for Cooper DeGene who made a play and didn't deserve that. Massively. Did not deserve that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Kyle. Thanks, guys. I do appreciate Kyle. Never anything personal. Never never personal. I know people are destroying Kyle in the chat. Be, be kind to Kyle. He's one of our loyal listeners, and I appreciate his perspective. And I was. I, I'll admit that. I said that earlier. I, I was unclear initially. I, I did interpret that incorrectly when looking at the NCAA rulebook. But the definition of an invalid signal, which was called, is a waving signal by any player that meets these requirements. So that's that's the whole point. And so my doubt is that I, I, do, I don't believe that this was a wave. Now, we'll see how it's interpreted. Don, do you feel like that was we, we can get off the subject, but did you feel like what Cooper did was any type of a wave? It doesn't have to be above the head to be an invalid wave. And that's what I was unclear on earlier. But is any was was there in any way was this in any way a wave? No, that's how I feel. But again, um, not everybody's going to agree on that, so I understand. You and I have both seen a lot of football games, Corey. <clears throat> you said a lot of punt returners indicate to their teammates get away. I know, but that's what I'm saying. Nobody covering the punt thought that signal was the fair catch signal. No one. Yeah, yeah I, I don't agree with Kyle's. I don't want to say strict interpretation of that rule, but uh, I understand where he's, I do understand where you're coming from, Kyle. I want to make sure we're clear on that. I do understand where you're coming from and, and I have no problem. People disagree with me. That's fine. Lemansky 
says, love you, Don. Best bye week idea I have ever heard. CCR songs. Send me in, coach. I'm ready to play. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Lemansky. Appreciate the super chat. Leads with the super chat. Thank you, Leads. Looking at the replay, Coop's gestures don't constitute an invalid signal because it came before the conditions described in Section 8, Article 3. Well, <laughs> you know, to go back to Section 8, Article 3, Don. <laughs> Section 8, Article 3. Let me Okay, look, Cooper's gestures don't constitute an invalid signal because it came before the conditions described. Um, um, or, okay, yeah, I, I'm going to have to look at this closer. I think we're all trying to in interpret something that maybe not as easy to interpret. Like, there's people on both sides of this. What I trust more with all this, and maybe that's my fault, but I trust more is the like what you said, your experience, the precedence that's been set. And I understand Kirk is biased. You're biased. I'm biased with all this. But I don't recall this ever being called. I, I don't. I see this happen all the time. I see guys grab the ball after it's been after it's bounced. I've seen this happen a number of times. I've never seen it called. I'm just I'm just saying never seen it called. And I have a problem with that. Um, Go ahead, Don. I was going to say simply this. If a returner is given a getaway motion to his teammates, the ball happens to bounce his way. He feels the ball. And in the meantime, some cover guys clearly relax. They could say, because I thought it was a fair catch signal. Well, if they relax and quit covering, then they clearly have been led to believe that was a fair catch signal. I didn't see anybody in Minnesota's coverage unit relax. Not one. We, were, we didn't dupe anybody with Cooper's movement. None. D. Rolison, Wisconsin's back, backup quarterback, has been 21 of 41, 240 yards, two touchdowns. Our ex Wisconsin QB2, 10 of 28, 116 yards, one INT. Um, is it fair to say, Don, Deacon has not been good, but when you see multiple quarterbacks struggling in the same system, that there's a good chance part of it's the system. I would agree. So, you know, kind of like Cade McNamara. I, mean, I know it's an extreme, but Cade up at Michigan, you know, we, we knew we weren't going to get Cade from Michigan. <laughs> now, we hope that we get it. You know, I, I'll tell you another person I felt bad for today, Don. I felt bad for Cade McNamara. You know, because I keep showing him on the sidelines and you just think, man, that guy's got to feel rotten. You know, he can't right. think about it. It's certainly not his his fault. But, man, he he wishes, you know, er, you have to think that every play is saying, man, I wish I could be out there. And sure. I have no doubt he'd be playing better. I still think the ceiling on this offense is so low with, with everything that it's up against because it's not just personnel. Timothy with the super chat. Thank you, Timothy. Gary Dolphin said they were reviewing hand signal. Interesting. So Gary said that during the play review, apparently, I'm assuming that's what Timothy means, that before the final call was made, uh, that's what they were reviewing. And that's possible. Gary, of course, is up in the booth. So perhaps uh, they, I don't know how close Gary and Ed are to the officials up in the in the press box, where they're at comparatively, which room they're in and, and all that, Don. I don't, do you have any information on that? Do you know where they're situated? No, I don't. So, but thank you for the super chat, Timothy. I do appreciate that information. Let's go back to our um, Iowa Smokehouse call in line. We've got uh, Ryan on hold. We've got the B. We've got TCU Hawkeye. And we've got James. Let's go to Ryan in our Iowa Smokehouse line. Ryan. Gentlemen, good evening. How are you doing? Hey, Ryan. Fabulous. Fabulous. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, I got some flashbacks of the 2006 Outback Bowl game with the officiating, if you remember that classic. And Ryan, by the way, what did you think of our last call? <laughs> be nice. The best. Well, the best part about it is when he said goodbye. <laughs> oh, Kyle, Kyle's not that. Ky no, I mean it's fine. Whatever. Um, we disagree. It, uh, that's fine. It, 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 no, I mean, it, it, you just. I can't believe you'd take away a play like that. Um, it's so. It's anyway. One one question I had. Um, my son asked me during the game. He's fourteen. Hey, Dad, what was it like when Hayden Fry was coach? Like the offense couldn't have been this bad, right? And of course, I told him about how Hayden called the Chuck Long naked bootleg play. Chuck Long was not a real 
uh, fleet of foot quarterback. He was more of a accurate 15 yard thrower, but it was a very creative, risky play and how Hayden was willing to take risks all the time. And I think, Don, you said something earlier and uh, something along the lines of unforeseen circumstances call for unforeseen calls, something along that line. And honestly, that's just something we'll never get. Today, outside of Vines, and maybe Logan, I didn't see a Division One player on the offensive side of the ball at all. Um, and I guess, I guess what's frustrating is we. I, I realize fully, Cade, Eric, All, and Luke Lachey are all out, and that's a major, major lo- losses. But I still maintain with your, and I think you would agree, Don, with your second string. You should at least have capable enough to muster 300 yards offense, move the ball, score some points. Um, it, it, it was just a terrible feeling when you go down two with seven, eight minutes to go and Minnesota's playing the field position game. And it started to feel somewhat insurmountable because we just – Deacon I, – I mean, this is – and uh, coach, wouldn't you agree that when your line is as bad as ours is, that that only calls for a more mobile quarterback? To, I, I, I mean, you can't do worse. We have more margin for error. Yeah, we have zero margin for error. Uh, Deacon is just, I mean, you know, last year we all just were brutal about Spencer Petrus throwing something like 53%. And we're, what, 36% right now, something like that with Deacon? Uh, We can't can't keep going like this. And, you know, we win a lot of games ugly. We win a lot of games with very low yardage. But, you know, when we have no margin for error at all, it's going to come back and bite you. I maintain that the Cooper play, we should be talking about how it really sucks that one of the best plays in Iowa history got taken away from us, but at least we won by 12 points. Even though all Lachey and Cade are all out. You're right. The the, the game should have never been this close. Minnesota's not very good. Uh, They're at home. Uh, Yeah, that's 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 all true in my opinion. And just watch when we play Northwestern, we're gonna play. The, let them play real close to us. We'll probably squeak it out. That's just what. That's just what they they do. I'm worried about the player development side. Uh, a couple weeks ago, and this is where I'm really getting tired of. But like a couple weeks ago, a reporter asked Kirk some question along the lines of George Barnett and. In your mind, Kirk, what makes him such an outstanding football coach on offensive line? And his answer was, he's a tremendous human being. I mean, I'm sure he is, but at some point, we got to actually start seeing some results. And, you know, I, I would maintain that if our line was better, we could run the ball, which would take pressure off Deacon and... If, if he had a few more seconds, maybe he could be a little more accurate. Uh, so obviously it's not all him either, but I don't see the point of not I, – I, I couldn't agree with Don, Coach Patterson more when you said you would give Marco, Joe, and Deacon equal snaps and may the best man win. And unfortunately – I don't know. It'll never happen under this regime. And where do you guys see the end game in all this? You know, obviously, you know, he's not going to make the drive for 325. That doesn't necessarily mean anything from a firing standpoint. But, you know, when fans are getting more and more demonstrative, where's the end game in all this? I have no idea. I, I don't. Uh, 
Ryan, you've probably heard me say it on this show. I, I have no idea what's going to happen at the end of the year. I could speculate that maybe Brian takes another job. Hey, maybe somebody brought this up. Maybe Bill Belichick is no longer coaching for the Patriots and he gets a job in the NFL and he decides to bring Brian on as a favor. He is more high. I'd imagine he's more hireable now because the lawsuit's not hanging over his head anymore. But I, I don't know. I mean, I could also see Brian bringing – I could see Kirk bringing him back again next year because Beth is not comfortable – making a move this early in her tenure. And heck, she may not even be the full-time AD when that decision right. needs to be. We'll see when I, that decision I don't made. know if she has the authority to necessarily. Yeah, I mean, and Maybe. let's be honest, the, the people, the money talks, right? So that's that's part of the reason why Gary, and I'm talking about Barda, didn't do anything even though he has been Barda, uh, Brian's direct supervisor for the length of his tenure here because people keep selling out the games and the donors keep giving the money. I mean, that's how I look at it. I don't I think I don't think it's rocket science. No, I I, I know. Uh I just uh I, I'm I'm getting to the point where I'm getting to the point where I don't think winning this way is gonna be very sustainable, especially when the big West Coast teams join next year. You know, you can kind of get away with eight, nine wins playing, you know. Purdue when they're down, mediocre Wisconsin, Illinois, you know, these kind of folks. But there was no reason to lose today, none at all. And first things first, if we're going to be a running team, we better learn how to run the ball. In 2004, we lost all our running backs and still tied Michigan for the Big Ten championship because we had no choice but to pivot, and we did well. The three times – We had a mobile quarterback. What happened? You had Brad Banks, you had Drew Tate, and you had C.J. Beathard. Well, Big Ten championships were uh, won in the previous two, and Beathard got us to Indy in the championship game uh, in his uh, senior year. So it's it's mind-boggling to me why a, a quarterback like a Deacon Hill who's ginormous, looks like a lineman out there, and obviously is not fleet of foot, why he's such an attractive piece to recruit in. He's not. we got to remember, Ryan, they were – Carson May had up and – we could go through the – let's go through the history of what Well, happened. yeah, because we can't, we can't develop anybody. Carson May, and I'm not saying that this is the one reason why he transferred, but my guess is if they had decided to play Carson May in the bowl game instead of lining up, Sam Laporta as a Wildcat quarterback against Kentucky, maybe Carson, if he had decided to transfer, maybe he would have reconsidered. But when you line up your tight end who's coming off a lower leg injury as a Wildcat quarterback against Kentucky over a guy in Carson May who could get valuable snaps and who was a four-star recruit coming out of high school, bye-bye Carson May. So what happens then? I was in desperate need for a quarterback. They turn to John Budmeyer and say, hey, who do you got? I got Deacon Hill. He's I recruited him to Wisconsin. He's headed over to Fordham. Let's. That's how he got here. He was not like some high recruit out of high school. Iowa wasn't. Now he was a decent. I mean, he was recruited by some good programs, but he didn't make any headway at Wisconsin. And he was headed to what's Fordham, Don? Is that low level FCS? That's a decent F- FCS right now, I'd say. Okay, but my- respect- respectable. Yeah, there, there, there's a reason for that. No, no offense to Deacon, so that's that's where we're at. But Ryan, uh, any any parting comments before I let you? Slide? Yeah, real quick question for for a coach. Obviously, you knew Hayden Fry very very well. You know Kirk Ferentz very very well. Kirk Ferentz was on your sideline right. from eighty one to eighty nine. He's he he knows Hayden. He knows how he thinks. Obviously, they're not the same person, and they have different personalities, but. I, I would have thought that maybe Kirk would have taken a few more pages from the Hayden playbook since, you know, he, you know, talks about him in such reverence. And what would, what would Hayden do if our offense was churning out like this? Because I, my understanding is Hayden would hold coaches accountable. And I'm not saying Kirk isn't privately, but he sure isn't doing much publicly. Yeah, I'd just love to hear your comment on that. Thanks, guys. Right. Well, and looking back into the 80s and even into the 90s, if we had a, a string of games where we were not very productive, 
I know one thing that would be discussed. Coach Fry would say, you know, I'm pretty sure you guys like the jobs you have here, and I'm doing the best I can to pay you, uh, pay you a good salary, and that provides you with a chance to take care of your family the way you'd like to. And it, if you want to stay with that work environment, you need to find a way to be more productive on Saturday with your players. And if that means you stay a little longer at the office, then I guess that's just the way it's got to be. Uh, that's kind of how Coach Fry approached it. You know, he would – and he would tell the players, um, I don't blame you. I blame the coaches. So if you like your coach, then you better find a way to play better than what you have been, and that means you got to listen even more carefully to what your coach is telling you. And that's just the way he was. He would put the pressure on us as coaches to perform. His mindset was that the, the players are student athletes. You know, they're, they're not professional athletes. You know, they go to school and they play football, if you will, as a part-time job. And in that regard, we're the ones that are working full-time as coaches, and we have to do our job to be sure our players have the best chance to succeed. And if that doesn't go very well, then they'll have to make a change. It was a little bit uh, warm in my studio here to wear my Cooper DeGene sweatshirt earlier, but I put it on. So get your CD3 sweatshirt, rtithreads.com and cd3lacesup.com. So uh, great stuff from, from Cooper DeGene. And uh, Kyle is in our uh, chat. Kyle wants to explain his call. No need to explain, Kyle, but he says, my main goal with the call was to clarify that it was that if it was a wave, the rule was interpreted correctly. I hadn't heard that yet on the show. I don't have an official position on it. If it was a wave, if I failed to communicate that, my bad. I understand, Kyle, and I likely did come across differently when I started the show because I was not clear on that, and I think it was you that sent me something, and then someone else sent me um, a screenshot of something else, and somebody brought it to my attention. It was ruled an invalid wave, and so once I realized, okay, that it was ruled an invalid wave, I just have never, it all comes back to, I've never heard this called. And it just seemed so bizarre. But anyways, you've explained it, Kyle, and I'm anxious to see if we get feedback from the powers that be. But it won't won't change anything. Leonardo DiCaprio said, uh, I wonder if this is the – you think it's the real Leonardo DiCaprio, Don? I believe it's DiCrapio. Oh, yeah, DiCrapio. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good eye, Don. Uh, he says, go, Gopes. Don't be sad. Y'all ruined our 2019 I, – I, I, I'm sorry. That's bad reading. I didn't properly uh, stop for the comma. Go Gophs, don't be sad. Y'all ruined our 2019 season. Well, I don't know that you can say this ruined Iowa's season because they still got a chance to win the West. And let's be honest, they weren't going to the playoff anyways, Don. It was so ridiculous that we were, but we were having the conversation because it was a fun conversation to have. So, uh, all right, let's go back to it. Well, before we get to that, I'm going to make sure we we bring this up. The return of Iowa post game with Coach Gary Close. We got about 700 people on here this evening, Don. And one okay. coach, Gary Close, will be joining me throughout Iowa men's basketball season. Uh, he usually joins for most of the games. Can't guarantee all of them. Gary, you know, he's a, a busy guy himself, just like you, Don, and a lot more basketball games than there are football. But he joins me throughout the season right here on the channel from the Hawkeye of the Storm. If you're watching this show over on our sister channel, Iowa Football at the Voice of College Football, swing over to From the Hawkeye of the Storm and subscribe as uh, – we, uh, we have a, a good time with Coach Gary Close, who's – Don, you and him are the best in the business. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, ask for better co-hosts and analysts for the show. And so Gary going to bring his expertise back for another year. And uh, I've, I've thrown this idea out there of trying to expand into some women's basketball coverage. So we'll continue to kind of tinker and toy with that, and we'll see what happens. But um, anyways, thank you uh, for everybody who, who's watched that, supported it. If you want to sponsor it, reach out to me from the eye of the storm at outlook.com that's from the eye of the storm at outlook.com and of course i've mentioned it before uh, let me pull up the banner here so everybody can see it rti threads proudly carrying the official merchandise and apparel of cooper to gene visit cd3lacesup.com they also have deals with zach lutmer carson shire aiden hall their nil roster continues to grow if you want to check out their assortment go to rtithreads.com again that's rtithreads.com and uh, 
great people running that small Iowa business. And but they're boy, the, this stuff is flying off the shelves because Cooper. Uh, well, I think his game speaks for itself. He is uh, phenomenal. So again, cd3lacesup.com for your Cooper to Gene apparel. And Don, did you think the Carson Shire hit was worthy of um, a targeting call? But let me just say what I thought first, and this is not it's going to be an unpopular opinion. I thought it was the right call based on the, the letter of the law. You now I sound like Kyle. The letter of the law is he led with the crown of his helmet. When I saw the replay, I said to people around me, He's going to get, he's going to get penalized for that. And and I know everybody gets excited about a quick, a big hit like that. And he didn't go helmet to helmet, but the crown of the helmet, those are the type of violent hits that I know that, again, unpopular opinion with some people. I don't watch football for those big hits. And those are the hits that can do damage. That's well, my problem with it. And, and the greatest and, damage might be done to the tackler. Sure, absolutely. Oh, because he's he clearly dropped his helmet and hit with the crown of his helmet. Trying to cut back on that. And my only other issue with it, and Carson's a great kid. Um, and this is not a Carson Shire issue. I think this more comes down to again, um, I think probably coaching and something that maybe needs said to players, because we had this issue come up last year against Illinois. One thing you'll see when you watch the TV tape back, Don is after Carson got ejected, he's on the sidelines, and they flashed to him several times, and the camera showed him kind of laughing and smiling with his teammates, which, not saying that he should just be Debbie Downer and you know crawl into the corner of the field and cry the rest of the game, but for me, I'm looking at that critically and thinking, you know, you don't look real upset that you just got a, a crucial penalty and you're done. Not to say that he wasn't, but you get what I'm saying, right, Don? That's Well, that's, the bottom line is you hurt your team. You hurt your team, and it was not his intent, and I'm sure he was bummed about it. But is, is there a sideline etiquette or a sideline awareness that you have to have as players and coaches knowing that, hey, there could be a camera on me? Um, like Spencer Petrus and Brian Ferentz last year joking around after an interception against Illinois. That Don't you gotta have to be aware that there's cameras, and and I don't think that's asking too much, is it? Sure, it's really, um, it's really a question of you. Are you able to say that for all sixty minutes you were a great teammate? If you were able to say that you were, that meant that you responded to any and all situations in the way that was in the best interest of the team. And if he didn't show any remorse, then that's not the right example to be set. It was a big hit, and the crowd loved the hit, um, but. Again, I, I just I can just speak for me. I, I don't like the big hits because uh, if they're legal, fine. But I just, you know, I, I, I'm all for targeting if it's enforced correctly because safety of the game. But I know that's not shared by a lot of people. Let's go to the B who's been on our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. The B. Hey, Corey. Hey, Coach. Hey, uh, first of all, game ball. I took a screenshot here for you guys. Game ball goes to PJ Flex wardrobe attire tonight. It must have been his wife that picked out the tie, but I actually thought during the game, I found myself just mesmerized by his uh, clothing attire tonight. So he got think, the game ball tonight. I think he would like to hear that. Yes, and I I will let him know. Uh, but no, I lost a bet tonight is what it was. I had to put this on as my avatar. So anyway, I... I will admit a uh, question for coach uh, coach beginning of the season. When you for we were first doing the show, you had spoken about meeting with, I don't know who it was with Iowa. If it was actually Kirk or you were meeting with Brian, but you had spent all that time doing analytics right. for a, a period of time. Okay. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. You are in Moneyball analytics, Billy bean. That's how I view you right now. Like, so you, spent all that time working on that. Have you noticed any of your recommendations, your stats, any analytics that you provided to the team? Have you noticed, is there anyone listening to that? And is there a tendency to maybe take advantage of some of the analytics that you gave them that you went, oh, wow, okay, well, they kind of listened to me on this or they didn't on this. Have you noticed anything so far through the season? Yes. Okay. Yes, I have. 
What what would that be, negative and positive, if you could? Well, uh, Corey knows. Corey has an idea of what the analytics look like in the Big Ten. So I'm not giving away any secrets to, to mention that one of the most important parameters you can win have on your side is turnover margin. And in general, we do win on turnovers. Uh, it's unusual. I bet you'd have to go back quite a while to find us minus three in any game. I doubt that we've had minus three maybe since Ohio State last year, maybe. I'm not even sure about Ohio State. But in general, we win on turnovers. Now, I'm not saying we win plus three. We might win plus one, plus two, plus one, plus one, even, plus one. You know, we typically – uh, win on turnovers. That's one thing we do. Here's another thing we do very well. One of the most reliable stats so far this year would be average starting field position. Who has an edge on average starting field position? I don't mind telling you this. Um, up until today, if you won on field position, your record was 21-3 and three in the Big Ten this year. That's 88% win. Doesn't matter if you if your average field position was one yard better or ten yards better. I'm just saying it was better. If you won on field position, you won 21 out of 24 games. Here's what you need to know too. One of those three exception games involved Iowa, and Corey, you probably know who it was against. It was against Penn State. Here's the bad news: we won on every starting field position. That's the only one of the top 15 parameters that we won. Penn State won the other 14. My point is to win on field position does not guarantee a win. You know, you got to win a few others too. It's an important parameter, obviously. It goes a long way in predicting the winner of the game, but that alone will not get you to get you to where you want to be. So that just just to give you an example, and it's no surprise to both of you. It's clear that we have a priority on winning on field position. Today, when we traded punts, on average, we picked up 10 yards. Our punting average was 10 yards better than theirs. Every that's, time we traded that's, punts. That's pretty significant. We both incidentally punted nine times. So over one half a play, that would be four or five punts on either half. That'd be 40 or 50 yards field position. That might be the difference in being in field goal range or not being in field goal range. So um, that step helps us, but it doesn't guarantee a win. And, Don, give us an idea of how big this um, – how much time is taken that you're just giving us a little – obviously, we know field position turnovers are important. Give us an idea how big this, this analytics packet that you provide to Kirk each and every year is once you figure all the numbers up. Well, the only thing I share with him – you've heard that expression, you can't see the forest for the trees, Right. The summary from one week to the next is printed up on one piece of paper. One piece of paper. that It fits on one page. So, obviously, I'm hitting the high points. I'll give you an example, too, of what I'm talking about. I have a prediction model right now that has predicted the winning team 23 out of 24 games. The only exception, Corey, you probably would guess what that exception might be. It was Minnesota at Northwestern. That was a crazy set of circumstances. <clears throat> Let's not forget, Northwestern won the fourth quarter 21 to nothing. Let me say this. If you collapse in the fourth quarter, you deserve to lose. I don't care who you're playing. Um, so that's the only exception. That game of the five parameters that I identified as part of this prediction model, Minnesota actually won three of the five. Northwestern only won two. So Minnesota. So the game that prediction model, that section model last year predicted the winner 50 out of 58 games. And that leaves six ties. But that's the only prediction model I've ever come up with that was 100% reliable over an entire season. Well, this year it's already, it's already failed once. Now, that may be the only failure for the year, but obviously I'd rather it be 100% reliable again rather than 95%, which is maybe where it's going to finish. 95% is good. 100% obviously is better. Is so analytics, to give you an idea. It, it, I'm sorry, Coach, just real quick, just so I understand. Is analytics more available or 
not available. Is it is it more usable, I guess, for a football team versus a baseball team? Do they look at it more for something on the offense or is this a defensive thing? Because how do that how does a team how does a football team It's a good question. It's a good question. I don't deal in analytics as they relate to offense or defense. I deal in team analytics. In other words, who ran for more yardage? Okay. Who who had who produced more sacks on defense? Incidentally, we lost on sacks today too. I haven't even done the analytics, but I'm just aware that we lost on sacks. Okay. One reason we threw for a lesser percentage, uh, not much less, I, I would admit, because we heated up their quarterback too, a lot like they heated up ours. But the bottom line, these analytics, I'll say it this way. If you know what the most important analytics are, logically, you have a better chance to win those analytics. I, I can say this with confidence. That five-parameter prediction model I'm talking about, nobody else in the Big Ten knows what those five parameters are. And I'm sure you're not going to tell them. Only one school knows it's Iowa. That doesn't guarantee we're going to win the majority of those five parameters, but that's our goal. And the players do know what those parameters are, I can promise you. Did the Does the Iowa – does Coach Ferentz ask you for – does he specifically ask you or not Kirk or just the team or whoever is in, in uh, direction of this for overall team analytics, or do they ever get specific about positions or offensive defense? And would you do that if they asked you to do that? Is that just an, do other teams do it that way that you know of? Well, this is just, just the formula that I've come up with, but the thing I know you can do it. It's a lot of extra work. Um, there are only so many hours in the week. A simple example. Could I develop analytics that would indicate what's your winning percentage if you run for 150 yards? You can do that, but frankly, it doesn't have the same value as asking the question, who has an edge on rushing yardage? Furthermore, what if you outrush your opponent by 100 yards? What's that winning percentage? I have a good idea what it would be over the last eight years. If you outrush your opponent by 100 yards, you probably win at least 80% of the time. Guess what? Today they outrushed us by 102 yards. Okay. All right. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Corey. You guys have a great night. Go Hawks. Thank you, Take sir. Care. And you're trying to simplify some of this, Don, because what you do takes hours and hours and hours to right. <laughs> figure. And I think uh, some people in the chat maybe don't realize how involved this is. Um, so... Anyway. Let me give you another example without giving away any secrets. You're aware of this, Corey. If I mention every starting field position before today's game, if you won on every starting field position so far this season, you won 88% of the time. Well, here's the next question for you and for the listeners. What if you won on every starting field position and you also won on turnovers? What might that percentage be? Is it hard to imagine that it might be 100%? Now, I don't know that it's 100%. I have to go back and look. I don't recall, but I do know this. Think of it this way, Corey. I take the top 19 parameters from last season, and I figure out all the combinations involving those top 19 parameters. To save our math whizzes out there a little bit of time, I'll go ahead and tell you there's 171 combinations involving those 19 parameters. I've looked at all 171 of them in all 24 games that we've played. 32 of those combinations still have a winning percentage of 100%. So what I do, 32 combinations means there's a total of 64 parameters listed among those 32 combinations, right? They're all pairs. So the obvious question is, which parameter shows up the most often in those 32 that are all 100%? I'm not going to tell you what they are, but I'll tell you that one parameter showed up in 15 of those combinations. 15 of them. That's almost half of them. 15 out of 32, one of those parameters was the same parameter. Furthermore, four others showed up not 15 times, but showed up five times apiece. Each of them five times. So that, that 15 plus four times five is 20. That's 35 out of those 62 parameters that show up over and over again. How do they show up? In combination with each other a lot of the time. So 
uh, it goes without saying. That's that's another five parameters. A lot of those five parameters are the same ones that were in that prediction model from last season. In other words, the prediction model is still working. It's still identifying the most valuable parameters to win. Does that guarantee you're going to win them? No, but it helps you to improve your chances to win them because your players are aware and how important they are. Hope that makes some sense. Is this Timmy Dwight in the chat saying longest post game in history done? That might be Timmy D. <laughs> Probably not. The Tim, does Tim watch the games regularly? I know he's still, he's a pretty busy guy with his business, but. Uh... You know, I don't know what Tim does on a Saturday night. I suspect he might have more uh, entertaining things to do than listen to us, but I don't know that. I do know he cares dearly about uh, Hawkeye football. Okay, uh, let's go. We're going to have to go pretty fast here in these last couple of callers. Okay. Let's go to our next caller. Thank you for calling Iowa Post Game with Coach Don Patterson. Who's on the line? Fred, how are you doing? Fred? No, it's Trent. How are you doing? Oh, hey, Trent. I'm doing okay. How are you? Good. Good, good. Um, Coach, you know, and Corey, it's, it's, pleasure, you know, it's a pleasure to talk to you. Um, you know, we, we talk about the one play and I, I, you know, I've been watching the show and the stream and every, everyone's talking about that one play guys. We lost this game on the line of scrimmage on both sides. We did not, we could not get a run game going. We could not, we just couldn't get anything going. And, and, and I'm talking about the run game. In the second half, I mean, like third quarter, what was our stats on the run? I mean, didn't we have like minus three yards somewhere along the line late into the third quarter in the second half? Yeah, you know, I, that is yeah. – Second half stats, we've had those up on the screen earlier, Trent. Second half offense, 18 total yards, 0 0.9 yards per play, 0 0.9 yards per rush, two total first downs. So how do you win a football game with that? Well, they almost did because of a Cooper to Gene miracle. But I know, I know, but you can't rely on one play, Amen. right? Amen. Correct. And 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 so if we're relying on DeGene to make one play, uh, then we got more problems than that. And Fair. Cooper is just an amazing player. And yes, it was a bad call. But with to be honest with with you and Coach. Um, do we have to really rely on one play to beat Minnesota? Right now we do. We should have. I right now we do. I I agree. I agree. But we, sh, you know, and then our our quarterback is airmailing all these throws and thinks, you know, honestly think I think he's Brett Favre, or at least he thinks he is. Is airmailing everything, and he's he had a couple good throws today. I'll I'll give him that, but. Honestly, if you could teach this guy to have a little bit more touch and let these receivers go get the ball instead of air, you know, thinking that he's got to throw it 90 miles an hour, we could create some sort of rhythm on the offensive side. But honestly, I think we lost this game on the line of scrimmage. Um, we could not run the ball. And defensively, I, I defensively, I thought we played well, but Man, our offensive line got beat. We could not run the ball. Yeah. That's fair. And true. if and I, I don't and, and our offensive line has really played well the entire year. Well, that's uh, I wouldn't go that far. I was gonna say that's not true. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm they've trying been, to they've made progress. I'll I'm say that. Sorry. They've had I'm they've sorry. had games where they've showed signs of progress on, on with both pass protection and run blocking, but it's been far from consistent. It, I understand, but it it's it was way better than it was today. Yeah. And, Part of our problem today involved extra tacklers in the box. Let's not forget that. And how do you how do you I deal agree. with that, Don? Uh, well, you got to be able to you got to be able to scare them out of it. You got to be able to throw the ball. I should say, effectively throw the ball. I agree. I agree. And then, um, 
when Minnesota started driving, and <laughs> I'm a big time Packer fan, so we we started when they they started to kind of put a drive there in the third quarter. It almost looked like they were playing cover two, <laughs> and, and I, they they started bringing their corners back, and I, I couldn't understand why they did that. And then Minnesota started throwing the ball. And I'm like, this is like watching the Packers because they, they always play cover two. And they, they bring their safeties back like five yards like they were scared. Like Minnesota's going to start throwing the ball. And they started doing it because they were the, our safeties were playing back. Did you see that, Don, or, or what did you see? With all due respect, I don't think, I don't think you – if you go back and look at the game, I think you'll see something different. Uh, we discussed coverage in this game more than any game all season. Right about one thing. Before the ball was snapped, you saw a couple of high safeties a lot of the time. But if you go back and look, I promise you one of those safeties is spinning down into the box just about every play. So we're disguising coverage. We're giving them an appearance that we're playing a lot of two-deep coverage. But if you go back, one safety or the other is coming down a high percentage of the time because we did to them a little bit what they did to us. They didn't run the ball like, like a bunch of up and down the field. They finally got over a hundred yards rushing. Right. Okay. But yeah. it took them a long time to do it. I think it took them 48, 48 running plays to do it. So they didn't have a great average either in large part because we were bringing a safety down to help out. Trent. Uh okay. I, I hate to do this. I got to let you slide because uh, we're running out of time here. But uh, always enjoy hearing you uh, call in. And please don't. I appreciate you waiting on hold. I know you waited a while as well. Oh, no problem. It was a pleasure talking with you all. Thank you, sir. All right. Let's go back to our Iowa Smokehouse call in line. Who's on the line? Hi, Corey. Hi, Coach. This is Destiny Pirate from Okaboji. Hey there. How are you, Destiny Pirate? Hi, gentlemen. I'm, I'm going to jump right into it. Um, the question at hand, and, and I know you guys, everybody's enjoying the show, but everybody's still talking about the call. So I decided to call up an expert and I, I called my aunt up and, and I just want to give a little background on her expertise. My aunt, she was a homecoming queen. Uh, she uh, actually was a beauty queen pageant winner. And, and she said officially, this was not a wave. So because she was a, a beauty queen and a, a homecoming queen. <laughs> she said uh, she said the judges would absolutely say that does not qualify as a wave. Was it like was it like this? <laughs> <laughs> that's the that's the rose queen you're talking about there, Corey. Oh, the rose queen. <laughs> she 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 was the UNI homecoming queen, not not Iowa, but I, I think it. Yeah, I wanted to have it official with all due respect to the previous caller. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, Destiny Pirate. And it's been a while since you called in. I appreciate you calling in. <laughs> it's great to talk with you guys. Okay, now on a serious note, I've got a question. Um, Coach, do we ever take players and, and just for developmental purposes, get them back together with Pop Warner? Now, and here's a question I have. Uh, with, with Deacon Hill, he's throwing high and he's throwing too hard. And I think just a week playing with the Pop Warner kids, I think he, he'd, he'd have to get that touch. He'd have to bring that ball down. Is that, I might be able to get that arranged up here in Northwest Iowa, but it's a little far, far away. Do you think we could do that for just to get that uh, for him? I'm afraid that our balls have to be a little more firmly thrown than that. So you've heard me say before, and I don't, I don't know what the velocity is on, on Deacon's um, hardest throw, but let's just say it's 75 miles an hour. If it's 75 miles an hour, I'm just talking about taking a little bit of pace off the ball and throwing it at 70 rather than 75. In other words, it's arriving on target a split second later than what it might have, but it is more catchable, and that's what we're looking for. Um, watch, watch the guys on TV tomorrow. Watch the guys that are playing in the NFL, and you'll get a better idea of what I'm talking about. If they have to really gun the ball at high velocity, they do it. If they're in position where they can take a little pace off the ball and get it on target, 
they would prefer to do that because it makes the ball more catchable than what it otherwise is. Well, well, Coach, you know, back when we were in school, they'd have us throwing through tires and everything. But what, what's the what's the official way? I mean, what would you do to get him back, get his touch back, get his accuracy? And what kind of drills or practice would you recommend? Well, um, that's a tough question. You know, if you're – we have a drill called seven-on-seven. Seven. You know, that's, that's the pass receivers, the five I'm going against the defensive backs and the underneath coverage too. We just eliminated the defensive line, in other words. And um, and just to make that drill, you're going to be forced with all different types of throws that need to be made. Sometimes it's a really tight window. Let me give you an example. Let's face it, if it's fourth down and the game's on the line and we either make a first down or we don't, you got to throw it somewhere. And now, if, if your best opportunity is a tight window, you have no choice but to gun the ball into that very tight window. Because if you take some pace off of that throw, it might be intercepted and it'll at least be broken up. Uh, on the other hand, if it's an early down, maybe there's a guy running wide open. Well, let's worry more about location on the throw than velocity because he's running wide open. That happens sometimes too, right? So you take a little pace off the ball, you make it easier to catch. Maybe you have to loft it over a defender even. In the case of deeper throws, sometimes you loft it right over a linebacker. Maybe you're lucky enough to have a linebacker that's only six feet tall rather than six three. So now you have a chance to put a little touch on it, elevate it over what Coach Ray used to call the fence post. You know, the guy that's in the way between the receiver and the quarterback. So you need to find touch in those kind of situations because if you throw it with high velocity, he's going to be able to get a hand on it or maybe even intercept it. So does that make sense to you? Those are different throws you might run across from one down to the next in those seven-on-seven seven passing drills. So that's it. there are other drills you can do if you're out there all by yourself. You know, maybe you simply put up a screen in front of a quarterback and you say, okay, I want you to throw the ball to that stationary target downrange. But obviously there's a there's a, a screen in your way. That screen is nine feet high or maybe ten feet high. So imagine that screen takes the place of a linebacker with outstretched hands. You got to touch the ball over that over that linebacker. Because you certainly don't want to try to throw it through it. That's a recipe for disaster. Sometimes you have to throw the ball over a, a defender that's underneath underneath the receiver and you got to use touch to do it. So those are the kind of drills you can come up with. It sounds great. I don't know if it's uh, muscle memory. Uh, my, my armchair quarterback view of it is he's just too excited out there. He, he, <laughs> he's just got too much adrenaline on the field needs to calm down a little bit. Well, I wanted to leave you guys with that. Um, I think there, you know, now that we have an official answer, on that play, uh, I think everybody can put that to bed a little bit. And, and thank you, guys. Thank you, Destiny Fire. Appreciate it, sir. And uh, Chase, thank you for the super chat. He adds, so say it was a signal. Where was the 15-yard penalty for running into Coop? Well, I don't know that that's, <laughs> that's a fair question. Well, if, if it was an invalid signal, Don, if it <laughs> – if it was an invalid signal, uh, how would that affect it? I, I don't know. I, these are questions I can't answer, but uh, fair question, Chase. BH, uh, I'm assuming this is not Bacon Hill. Uh, BH says, I showed up late to the stream. If you guys touched on the quarterback position, I gave Deacon a chance, but after two and a half games, I think Iowa should move to the next man in. Iowa's record rushing 100 plus a game is outstanding. Um, well, yeah, we talked about it earlier. Tom Caker jumped on and basically said that Kirk is not changing based on what their conversation with Kirk was like. I advocated earlier, you know, why not give these guys not only equal snaps against equal competition and practice on, but why not run three quarterbacks out there on game day and see which one does better on certain drives, certain situations. And, um, you know, I, 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 that's just totally a different concept than what it seems like Kirk and the staff agree with. But Donna, is yeah. anything more to the quarterback situation? No, everybody has a different opinion. 
you know, I know Coach Fry. Uh, everybody would like to to know who the starting quarterback is. You've always heard that expression. If you have two, then it means you don't have any. Um, nobody wants a quarterback controversy, but it is a complicated position to play. There's no doubt about it. And part of the solution, I'll say it this way, the best quarterbacks I've been around were all extremely bright, and they were able to process really quickly. And you see the same guys excelling on Sunday uh, for that same reason. They process really quickly. Their mind's going 100 miles an hour. You can see them before the snap. They're scanning the field, and they're, they're getting as much out of the way as possible before they take the ball because they need to have an idea of where they're going to go with the football. And it requires a lot of a lot of preparation, a lot of hard work. And the bottom line, it's hard to play that position if you're not able to process things really quickly from a mental standpoint. That's part of the job. Our last two callers are going to have to be quick because I just hit the four-hour mark, Don. You've hit the three-hour mark. I'm ready to call it a night. But uh, we've got James and Vincent. We're hit James first. Thank you for calling our Iowa Smokehouse call online, James. Hi, Corey. How are you? I'm doing okay. As good as I can do four hours into a show about the game we just saw and the way it ended. And Coach, how are you, sir? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? Well, now that I've had some time to stew over the game, um, as much as I'm upset about how that punt return ended up, we should not never really been in that spot anyway, really and truly, you know, and there's Correct. No, no excuse for it, really. Like, I feel like we're the better team regardless of how our offense is. It's just. I don't know about that. I feel like at least on two out, two out of the three phases of football, we're the better team for Probably. sure. They are so much better than almost everybody they play in those two phases, but they're so much worse in the one phase. That's the problem. <laughs> Let me say this about the it out. That's how that's how sad it is in a game like this, Don. As great as special teams and defense were, it offense managed to find a way to, with the help of the officials to cancel out that play. That's how bad the offense was. Right. Well, you got to remember we also turned the ball over three times now right. that's, that's offense that's and that that's that's six points yeah the defense kept them out of the end zone but it's still six points that they scored yep exactly you know uh, yeah. let's, not, but, let's not forget the timing on the ill-fated punt return here's my point if that play happened in the middle of the second quarter it would be easy for all of us to say there's no way you could pinpoint that play as having a profound effect on the game. The fact that it happened with one minute on the clock, that's the difference. And by the way, let me just say this. Make it very clear. I do not always agree with Don. And Don, I'll say it right now, I disagree with what you said earlier about fourth and inches. And you're the coach, I'm not. But fourth and inches, he sneaked the ball. I mean, I understand. I understand. I understand. Corey, Corey after, you, after you sneak the ball for a first down – you're still faced with that huge I know. hurdle to get over. It's called making another damn first down. Well, that's the, that's the name of the game, Don. That's the name of the game. The, ri the risk reward is that we have a chance to pin them and put them a long way from our goal line. If we, we get and and what what is what what his greatest or special teams has been playing over the last three years now, I would gladly take that over Risking it with your offense. Problem is, Don, when you're going, when you're punting on fourth and inches from midfield, all you need is 10 to 15 more yards to be in range for your field goal kicker. And on fourth and a foot, getting that foot with a 260 pound quarterback should almost be a certainty. So I don't view it as a risk. There's risk with everything we do, there's a risk with every time Deacon Hill takes the snap. My only point is, even if you convert on fourth and inches, you're still not even in field goal range, and there's no guarantee you're going to get in field goal range. But you've got a new set of downs to work with. I, I got one more thing I'd like to point out here. As much as I want to say, you know, yes, that punt return did have an ill effect on the game. All we needed to get was another, you know, 20 to 30 yards and would have been 
well within field goal range to kick for the win. Correct. And it seemed like to me we moved backwards instead of moving forward. Yeah. J- James, I appreciate you for calling in and uh, please stay in touch with the show. Have a good evening, guys. Thank you, sir. Don Deacon ran for seven yards on a QB sneak earlier in in the game, or I guess maybe it was later. That's what that's because it was not third and inches. Don, tell me, no, it was fourth and inches. But tell me, no, it wasn't. Go back and look. I went in more than a few inches. Let's back up. No, we, they, hold on, hold on, hold on. Listen to me. It was right there toward the end of the game, right? They didn't expect a sneak because. We also had a lot of real estate to cover, and the clock was against us. Well, they snuck it on a waist down. They snuck it on a waist down. It was second and one. That's that's correct. Yeah. So we had the element of surprise on that snake versus fourth and inches. I don't buy the. I, I don't buy. What's the percentage? You tell me, Don. In that situation, you give me the percentage chance that Deacon Hill can't get a foot on a sneak on fourth and inches. It depends on who you're playing. It depends on how they line up. Well, you, okay, they're gonna they're gonna pack, they're well, obviously gonna pack them pack at home on fourth and inches. Let's back up, Corey. Think about this. You remember those the difficulty we had on the goal line making inches? Remember that? Those were called quarterback sneaks. Well, first of all, well, let's go back to that. We talk about officiating. What was the official doing on the the first quarterback sneak that was clearly in? What was the official doing when Deacon Hill was four feet into the end zone and they're like they didn't even see him over there and they're calling? Well. They clearly blew the whistle for no more forward progress. They made a decision that the whole time they made a decision that forward progress was stopped. Oh crap! He ended up in the end. I'm just telling you why they spotted well, the ball on the field. I, I, you know, I I forgot about that call. I they forgot about that series. They, but but no, they blew it. You can just stop. Don't. But the good news is it didn't cost us a touchdown. We still scored. That's why we're not complaining about it. But that was a bonehead. Again, bonehead by that officiating crew. But do you think maybe with the difficulty we had down the goal line, you think maybe that was in twice about going with a sneak out in the middle of the field? I'm something to do with it. Well, first of all, the sneak, the first sneak that I wanted him to go for it on, the, the first one, which was my main tripe, if you will, that was actually before the touchdown. I'm not sure. You're talking about uh, on our touchdown first, drive, you're first, saying. The first fourth and inches, Iowa had not scored a touchdown at that point. What yard line were you on? I don't know. I think they were at their – I think they were right around their own 45, maybe the 50. Okay. So worst-case scenario, worst-case scenario, Don, on fourth and inches, somehow, some way, your offensive lineman-sized quarterback can't get a yard and – Minnesota gets the ball at midfield. I trust my defense to get me out of that situation. But the point is, if you punt it to the other end of the field, when they fell on downs, you take over at midfield. Okay, Kirk. Without risk. Okay, Kirk. <laughs> hey, that, des- that decision didn't cost us a game. I'm not saying it cost us a game, but it's a pattern. I'm just saying last week they did the same thing on fourth and three. They go for it, and fourth and inches, they kick a field goal. That one didn't make any sense either. Fourth and three didn't make any sense to not kick a field goal last week and go reverse with Nico Ragaini. I I agree hundred percent. All right, couple notes before we get to our final caller, Vincent, because I Don, I diligently take notes during the game and then I fail to bring them up because we have all these callers and all these things we got did to. I'll just run through these quarter by quarter. So a couple things. Um, early on, I wrote down good things happen when you involve wide receivers. Right, you draw a pi or two. You give Deontay Vines a chance to make a play, build some confidence. So it was good to see them get those receivers involved early. I gave Brian an attaboy for that. Red zone offense is still a disaster. Once the field shortens, we have no idea what we're doing. You get down there, whether it be on a big play from defense or special teams, you better hope he gets over the goal line because we don't know how to score down near the goal line. Too many field goals, not enough touchdowns. Uh, I'm in all caps. Go for it on fourth and inches. I'll stand by that. I understand your point of view on that, Don, but that's what I've got written down. Um, I noticed one audible in this game. There may have been more. There was, and you tell me what's happening here, Don. There was a play where Deacon Hill gets up to the line of scrimmage. Obviously, yeah. didn't like something, and he goes like this. Wait, he he waved. <laughs> he went like this. Well, what did the Minnesota defenders do? They went like this as well. 
What did Iowa do? Ran the ball for a five yard loss. So you tell me what he's obviously calling off a different play. And so Minnes, what's happening there? Well, the advantage you have is you're watching the TV version. So there's no doubt in your mind. He barked out a signal. Even he communicated to his team. You're confident. They changed the play. Maybe, maybe Paul even mentioned that they were changing the play. How do you know it for sure they checked off? That's all I'm saying. Well, all I know is I, I don't know. I guess I don't know that for sure. All I know is he got up to the line of scrimmage, saw something, and then turned around and made that motion to his teammates. And then the Minnesota linebackers made that motion, and Minnesota stuffed Iowa uh, for a four or five yard loss on the run. Yeah, I can't remember the specific play. That was first um, quarter. First quarter. First quarter. It's safe to say we don't, especially with an inexperienced quarterback, um, it wouldn't surprise me if he didn't change a single play today. He certainly didn't change many. Maybe that's when he did change. Yeah. I don't know. I'll, I'll know more when I can see the video. Second quarter, I have written down our screen game is broken. It's broken, Don. They don't, well, we've had a terrible game. percentage. You're right. You don't know that we know how to run screen plays anymore. And tell me, tell us, tell the average fan, what I was trying to do with these screens up the middle, why are, why is every screen play up toward the line of screen, right up in the middle of the field now? Well, you know, it, it all started when we had guys like Lachey and Eric All sure. and Sam Laporta last year. So, you know, you have some kind of misdirection where the, the, the ball appears to be going wide, the thought being linebackers will pursue. Now when we throw the ball to a tight end behind the line, we got linemen in front. Kind of hard to imagine. We won't pick up some decent yardage. But the bottom line, there's a lot of bodies in there, and it's kind of a scary proposition because there's a lot of the off-color jerseys in there nearby too. And um, we've had poor success. I don't know what our tendency is um, for running that play based on down and distance and whatnot. Seemed to me that's the kind of call you might see on third and medium. Uh, you know, we're clearly going to throw the ball a little bit more maybe on third down. But third and medium, we don't have confidence that we can gain necessary yardage with the ball thrown on the perimeter of the field. So our thought is maybe we can throw it short behind the line and then with our lineman in front of our tight end, pick up the necessary yardage. But for whatever reason, it seems like teams have got that scouted out pretty well. We haven't been able to hit one of those in, what, several games now. We've tried, but we haven't hit them. Such an impressive play by Tory Taylor, Cooper DeGene, teaming up on that punt that was downed inside the five. Really impressive stuff. Um, there was a missed targeting, I thought, on um, – I, I believe they – what did they call on that? Uh, they may have called late hit or face mask. I think they may have called face mask. They called a face mask for a guy pulling on Deacon Hill's helmet, pulled his face mask and helmet back, here comes a defender, I thought, led with the crown of the helmet and hits Deacon right, almost right in the neck, and his helmet was off. I and you, have was the, you have the advantage of instant replay, too, yeah. on TV, right? So I, I would imagine Paul even commented that could have very easily been a foul. Did he say anything? Frankly, Don, I've got people I'm watching the game with I sometimes miss. You, you're going to have to go back. You'll see what I'm talking about. But I, I look like a dangerous play, frankly, because when the helmet gets pulled up and all of a sudden guys going right for the jugular, yeah, <laughs> that's not good. And Deacon, anybody who questions Deacon's toughness, he's been taking a beating out there, and he's popping right back up. So I don't question the guy's yeah, toughness. Toughness is not the issue. Um, let's see. Strange touchdown drive. Featured two personal foul calls on Minnesota, a bunch of penalties. They really gifted Iowa that uh, – that touchdown, a fourth down, personal foul penalty inside like the five. They gift them a new set of downs. Uh, obviously, that was huge. Third quarter, what was with Minnesota? Go ahead. Did you have something? I don't know about that because I was confused. I thought we had first and goal. I don't know what the yard line might have been. I thought it was around the five or six when that, when that goal line sequence started. And as I was paying attention, I thought we had a – Maybe not. Maybe it was the third down sneak. I don't remember. There never was a fourth down sneak. Is that right? I don't believe so. No. I think third down is when the flag flew, or I don't even know what they called. I yeah, was trying both, to figure out. Both, both uh, real quick, sorry. The personal fouls, both personal fouls came at the end of the third down plays. So they mm -hmm. were in position both times where 
it's going to be fourth down. Gotcha. What I didn't realize, I was trying to figure out, we had first and goal. How could we get first and goal all over again? And uh, But maybe, did they explain, if it's a dead ball foul and you're on the four-inch line, then obviously a two-inch penalty is not going to change much. Did they actually say, because it was a dead ball foul, we go back to first down? It's an automatic it's, first down. It's an automatic first down in that scenario. Does it have anything to do with what yard line we're on? That I don't know. I, I mean, it, I guess I was under the impression if it's a personal foul penalty, it's an automatic first down. Maybe so. Because obviously we can't deal in two-inch penalties. Right. You can't get you know, you can't get by fouling the team that's on the one yard line just because you know you're only getting penalized a few inches. So it's got to be a provision in there to award a first down, and that's what they did. I've got written down here, uh, third quarter, Minnesota letting kickoffs drop. They had a couple where the ball hit the ground on kickoffs. Boy, that's dangerous. Absolutely. And and that's coaching again because you got to realize in the fall – there's going to come a time when you have to feel the ball that's kicked into a strong wind. Right. You better be out practicing it. I mean, you know what the weather forecast is for the game. You know, three days ago, they knew there was going to be wind. If you haven't done it already, you better go out and practice those kicks as best you can to assimilate Kinnick Stadium. Um, I thought it was a bad overturned call against Minnesota. I thought there was one bad call that went against Minnesota. Um, DeGene was in coverage. I'm trying to think of what the call was. Um, and I didn't have that written down. All I have written down is bad overturned call against Minnesota in the third quarter. DeGene was in coverage. And man, I cannot. Um, so you thought DeGene should have been flagged for a foul? I don't, I don't know. I don't I remember what that was. I don't remember what that was. I'll have to go back. That's bad note taking on my part. I do know in that third quarter, or third quarter, Quinn Schulte, you got to come up with that. Uh, interception on the deflected pass that went straight up in the air. It was a pass breakup by Aaron Graves. You watch that back on tape, Don. Quinn's got to catch that. You got to catch that ball. Yeah. He just simply misjudged it, I guess. It was up in the air a long time. Yeah, it was. Did they score on that possession? I believe they did. They may have because it was third quarter. I believe they were in plus, plus territory even then. I mentioned third down efficiency. They were bad all game except third quarter they were efficient in the third quarter made some big conversions and i think back to iowa state uh, iowa, iowa state not this year but in 2022 the game in kinnick and you'll remember how many third downs that team converted in big moments sometimes yeah. it's those big critical downs in big moments of the game and uh, if iowa's defense ever has a chink in the armor sometimes it's on those critical downs yeah you're right and then uh, I, I did have written down minnesota just killed itself on penalties throughout the game but they, I mean, I, that, those penalties were deserved. Um, you know, the shocker to me, Corey, is that the penalties, I thought they were much different than they were. I believe they had seven, we had six. They had 58 yards, we had 53 yards. It wasn't very different at all. I think what made it unusual is they all showed up one after another there. There were three on that one drive. Our touchdown drive, they had three, right? Yeah, correct. Um Quick shout out again, one final shout out, I should say, to RTI Threads and Cooper DeGene's uh, NIL partner. They're proudly carrying the official merchandise and apparel of the superstar Cooper DeGene, who had this. Uh, I think this game was was taken, but we'll see. We'll find out what the the powers that be say. I'm sure there's going to be some comment from the conference here in the coming days, because uh, I'm guessing Iowa will pursue that, but we'll see. They also have deals with Zach Lutmer, Carson Shire, Aiden Hall, rtithreads.com. Visit Cooper's store at cd3lacesup.com. And yes, folks, he was our RTI Threads player of the game. He feels so bad for Cooper DeGene, but he played his butt off as he always does. Uh, really, really good kid and uh, he's going to have a really good career in the NFL whenever he decides to leave, Don. He is, he is going to be uh, attractive to a lot of NFL scouts. I'll say that. Um, Super chat here from Bobby. Final super chat, I'm guessing, of the night. Iowa is famous for making dummy kill calls and then running against a stacked box. Why is Brian Ferentz running third and one with Jazz, who is the smallest back? Well, we'll say this. Uh, I may disagree with a little bit with Bobby because I think Jazz packs the best punch. Um, I don't care what Caleb's size is. I think Jazz packs the best punch. And nobody was effective today in the run game. And Caleb has not looked very good these last few games. But 
Anything to add to that, Don? Well, just as you say, um, you know, even though even though Jazz is undersized compared to some other people, uh, he plays with a lot of ferocity, and he goes 100 miles an hour, and he can fit through a small space. He's done it time and again. So, um, you know, I don't have any issue with with putting the ball in his hands because he's done a good job of of um, giving his very best to make a first uh, any key first down. All right, we got to go real quick on these last two calls, folks. Vincent, you're on the air with us. How are you? Hey, Corey. Hey, Don. Uh, I'm a bit under the weather, so I probably sound a little nasally. But to answer your question, Corey, the call you're talking about that was overturned was the the Minnesota catch by Jackson. It was initially ruled a catch, and then they overturned it um, to a non-catch or an incomplete pass. But I right. thought it was a catch, too. Because it looked like he had it, and at least it hit the ground, but it stayed in control. So that I, was, I didn't think it would, there was enough evidence to overturn it. Was my right? Point. I I didn't either. And then to answer Don's question, the goal line penalty, it was a personal foul penalty, which constitutes the first down because uh, their safety number twenty seven, after Deacon had kind of rolled over to his back and lifted the ball up, he came in Not and smacked up. it away. Yeah. So the refs real quick hit him with a a p or personal foul. Uh, penalty, not, which, not a very disciplined Minnesota team. No, no. But um, uh, in my own opinion, or my own opinion, I thought um, Iowa didn't deserve to win this game. I'd have certainly taken the win had everything stood with Cooper's return, which was a phenomenal return. Just given the the moment, uh, you know, I'm on the same page as you guys. You, you're not going to find a better in the moment play from a player. Um, to have that kind of result. Uh, but two questions. Um, do we know, is Caleb Brown still with the team? Is he still practicing? Does anybody know anything about him? He was suited up today. He, they're just not playing him then? I guess not. And he signed an NIL deal with us, didn't he? Yeah, but don't be surprised if he's gone. Uh, I don't doubt it. Won't. You're going to see another mass exodus at the end of the season, and not because of um, Iowa culture. It's because of the, the offensive uh, scheme and your offensive coordinator. Um, but uh, the last question was, I know this will probably seem far-fetched to you guys, but who do you see um, taking the place of, of Kirk in 2024? Do you think you were assuming he's walking away at the end of this year? I know I'm speculating on my own part, but if he I, walked I just, away, if he walked away at the end of this year, I would hope that it'd be Phil. Well, and I don't know that it would be because I don't know that Phil would continue. Um, my best guess would probably be someone like Mike or uh, Mike, Mike Stoops, uh, Mark Stoops. Um, but uh, I mean, I've made my my opinion on this known. I'd, I'd rather them go after Phil, Bob, and then you know, then Mark and Brett, and go down the list. Well, I think oh. anybody would be a a good upgrade. Now, to your point about Phil, Phil's a defensive coordinator. I think he's he's very set and content in his position as defensive coordinator. Um, to answer your question, do I think he's gone? I just look at a couple things. You know, he's obviously Brian's not going to have a contract renewed. I don't think there's any question there. Kirk's not going to keep on trucking without Brian there. Is he going to put him in a different position? Yeah, it's feasible. It's possible. And does Kirk stay? It's that the probability is there. But if you look at the college landscape in general. We all know the Big Ten divisions are not going to be any more after the season. You've got four powerhouses from the Pac-12 coming over to the Big Ten. We're just not going to be able to – Kirk's brand of football, excuse me, is not going to be able to compete in the Big Ten with how he uh, plays football. So uh, for me, from an outsider's perspective as I'm looking at it, is this an opportunity for him to say, hey, look, I, my run is done? That probability to me is certainly there, given the fact of what's going on with Brian and him not getting contract renewed and also with the college football landscape changing in general with the Big Ten via Washington, USC, UCLA, and Oregon coming over. There's just no way his brand of football is going to be able to keep up with it. So do I see him well, walking away? Yes, I, I do. Vincent, did you did you watch my show uh, week twenty week two twenty six of my podcast? Uh, refresh my memory a little bit. I, I watched all on, your stuff even in rerun. Oh, I appreciate that. It was on uh, 
this potentially being Kirk's final season. And I ran through my reasons why I think it could happen. Now, the people that I know that are more connected with Kirk and Don, you're well connected with Kirk. I don't think Kirk talks retirement with you very often or ever, but people no. I've connected with that feel that they understand the situation. Don't feel like this is going to be Kirk's final year, but I kind of went through the criteria criteria and a lot of what you just got done saying, Vincent is exactly what I brought up NIL transfer portal, the new big 10 having to go out West, the Brian situation, which has become more and more awkward. They have a potential of winning a lot of games still this year. They win 10 games, go to the championship game. That's a successful season. You can go out on top, so to speak. Right. A lot of reasons for that. Uh, no, I, yeah, I, I, I guess I agree with a lot of those points. Um, do I want Kirk to walk away? No, I'd rather him just get an offensive coordinate. Uh, Urban Meyer said it best this past week. He had to sit down with Jerry DiNardo from the Big Ten Network and Urban Meyer said it plain as day. He's like, I always got one of the best defensive coordinators that no one really gives credit to in Phil Parker. And if you put Phil on a team that's got a serviceable offense, uh, doesn't matter who it might be, but you're talking uh, national title national title contenders. That's just the reality of it. That's Correct. the same thing with Iowa. That's the frustrating part for fans is we get so irritated with the stagnant offense, and it's not just – a lot of people want to blame, blame it on players or position coaches. And, yes, there's those things are there. Don's alluded to that very much so. And one person who's not put under the gun a whole lot that I think should be is Kelton Copeland. Because when you're coaching receivers, you need to be able to coach your receivers not only to catch passes but also to gain separation to get open for your quarterback. And if we're not doing that for the QBs to have targets to throw to, you got to throw Kelton in there just with a Gary Barnett, with a Brian Ferrett. So there's many things there at play. But more importantly, it is scheme and the schematics of how we're doing stuff offensively. Anyway, I know you got to get to the next caller, but just a couple things I wanted to point out. Gentlemen, thank you so much for taking the time for all of us fans um, uh, here, especially going four hours into it. And, Don, I'll let you kind of end with this. Even if you have players that are considered D2, like we keep hearing, or players that aren't as talented at some other schools, you can always approach your offense and scheme differently to have a productive – and not stagnant offense. And I'm sure, Don, you can attest to the same thing. You may not have your four- and five-star recruits at skill positions across the board, but if you've got football players and just just football players, you can still scheme to make your offense productive. And I'll let you guys – I'll end with that. Corey, Don, thanks for the time. Thanks, Vincent. Don, I don't, I don't see anybody in the country – I don't see any other offense behave like Iowa's. I don't see anybody. At every at any level in, in the FBS, like any conference, any team, everybody, it seems like everybody's offense is better than Iowa's. And the stats bear that out, and my eye test bears it out. Right. <laughs> Just and then, and then they said about Mayor Bryan, and some people said it about Hayden Fry. And it's the ultimate compliment to any coach. He can have his players and be your players. And then if you traded players, he would take your players. And the players that you inherited from him, he would win that game also. Yeah. He can take his players and meet your players. He can take your players and meet his players. That's what great coaches can do. Bobby wants to know about the dummy kill calls, Don. Well, I don't – I mean, I haven't seen the TV tape, so I don't know if we killed anything or not. I think maybe um, the one. Maybe, maybe the one that I brought up earlier, but I'm not aware of – Well, he says a dummy kill call. Does that mean we didn't kill the player or, or not? Yeah, I'm assuming I'm assuming he's talking about killing the play and optioning to whatever the audible run is. So that's, that's a live kill call. You kill the play and you go to another play. So that's okay. yeah, I don't typical. know. Now right. you know people might have a dummy kill also. Uh, you know, I do about audibles a lot and what we used to do in time, and we'd really mess people mess with the other people. Um, I'll give you a specific example. Uh, we had one of our old coaches that was on the Northwestern staff some years ago, and he knew all of our – our audible system was pretty complicated, but he knew it. He was one of our coaches. So when we played Northwestern, here's how we started the game. We said, irregardless. And I don't even mind telling you what the system was. I can give you an example. We would have a live or a dummy number followed by a live or a dummy 
color followed by another number. Pretty complicated stuff. So imagine this. One white five might be alive, might be dummy. He doesn't know. All he knows is, is one a live number or not, right? The first digit. One white five, he knows that white's a pass, and he's signaling we're going to throw the ball, and then we run the ball. At that point, the coach knows one is a dummy number, right? They checked the white five, except the one must have been a dummy because they ran the ball. So now he's ready for us. We come back, and we call two white fives. And usually the live numbers were odd or even. Okay, so one was a dummy. That means two's live. Now he's confident that it's a pass. He signals pass again. We run the ball again. Now he's thinking, okay, it's not odd. It's not even. It must be a high-low situation. So the low numbers must be dummy, right? So that means the high numbers must be live. Now we come back with nine white nine, nine white nine. Now he's for sure convinced it's a pass, right? Because it wasn't odd or even. It has to be a high number versus the dummy numbers that were one and two. So now he's certain it's a pass. He signals pass again, and we run the ball again. So now he's thinking it's not odd, it's not even, it's not high, it's not low. I don't know what it is. At that point, he surrenders and gives us one of these, like, okay, you got me. I don't. I give up. And then we started running live audibles after that. But we had to, we had to show him that the information he thought he had was invalid. And at that point, he gave up. And then we ran some live audibles. But that just gives you an idea of the, how advanced some of this stuff can be. Let's hit our final call of the night. We're going to have to kind of keep it short. Trevor, <clears throat> welcome to the show. Hey, how we doing? Doing all right, Trevor. How are you? So everybody's talking about the punt. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. But, I mean, we really shouldn't even have been in that situation in the first place. Correct. I mean, we can't score 12 points. That's so, correct. actually 13 points. So, I guess th my question is, like, we all know where we go from here. Do we think it's going to happen? And I'll leave it at that and leave. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Trevor. I mean, I think Trevor's talking about a staff change. Uh, I made the comment about, I mean, we, I, I don't have any, re I don't really have any faith in anybody to do what needs to be done as it relates to the offense moving forward. I don't. Ultimately, I just hope. I just hope that the, the people that have the power to do that, whether that be Kirk or Brian, Beth, the donors, that they make the right call. But I don't have faith. I don't have confidence. I would not. Would I be shocked if they average 20 points per game for the rest of the season or 18 points per game for the rest of the season? Brian's back. They, they run the same offense next year. Nope. Because they're going to win nine games this year, Don, at a minimum, I think, with this offense. They're going to win them. Now, they ain't going to win them next year with that schedule. I think that's fair. They're not going to do that. But. Right. Now, I won't are you sure we can win three? Are you, are you sure we can win three out of four? That remain. Because, uh, well, frankly, I'm not sure. I think they can win three out of four. They can play Northwestern. They play Illinois at home. They play Rutgers at home. Those are basically three road ga uh, home games because Northwestern's going to have. And we play Minnesota at home, and we played well, Minnesota at home. I know, but they should have won. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're, the caller's right. We should have never been in that situation, and you know, that's that. Don, I'm done. Uh, anything else to add before I we kind of parting shots about the bye week? No, I think the bye week comes at a good time. Let's not forget, maybe that's one reason that Minnesota found a way to beat us today is they had the advantage of an off week, had the advantage of more than a week to prepare for our game, things like that. We've got that advantage going forward. Maybe it's unfortunate that, correct me if I'm wrong, our next game is at Northwestern. Is that right? Yeah, give me some early thoughts on the Wildcats. I know you obviously were impressed. They beat this Minnesota team, came back from – what, 21 down in the fourth quarter to beat this Minnesota team? Yeah, I haven't really studied that video. Of course, I did the analytics. What I do remember is they got outscored 21 zip in the fourth quarter. I think I think Minnesota made a mistake. For what I heard, they went with a lot of three-man rush, a lot of prevent defense. We know what prevent defense does. It prevents you from winning, right? At some point, it prevents you from winning. So I think they went ultra-conservative. Northwestern started hitting passes. 
No pressure on the quarterback. They gained some momentum in the fourth quarter. They paid for it. So, um, so I don't know. I don't know what happened today. As I recall, Northwestern gave Nebraska a good game, right? I think it was pretty close. Yeah, I can pull that number up. Um, I was surprised that Northwestern was able to score 21 in the fourth against Minnesota. I mean, not just the fact that Minnesota gave it up. I just, from a skill position standpoint, where Northwestern has been and with all the problems they faced here in recent time, I'm, I was just surprised they were able to do that. So Northwestern today, uh, they played North Nebraska, and it was 17-9, Nebraska with the win over the Wildcats. And it was in Lincoln. The game was in Lincoln. Yeah. And um, I was watching the scores as they were posted, and it was close throughout. You know, it was a hard-fought game, and and the win didn't come easy for Nebraska. Um, yeah, I don't know what that means other than it's kind of hard to imagine. I know what Vegas is going to say. Vegas is going to say odds of Nebraska beating Iowa are – 10% or something, 15%, 20%. It'll be a pretty small number. We're supposed to win this game, especially coming off a of bye. They were supposed to win today as well. I know. But let's not forget, the Vegas official Vegas line was, what, three and a half points? I didn't see yeah. that. I was surprised it was that close. Yeah, well, they know more than we do sometimes as far as they, that, they knew what they were talking about, didn't they? Yeah. So Iowa will try to stop the Wildcats. That game will be in Wrigley Field in two weeks. So they'll get a bye week, and it'll be an interesting week. Yes, the assistants apparently not going to be meeting with the media. So uh, that's interesting. That's usually something they do during the bye week, but Tom Kaker said that's not happening. So we'll, of course, have Iowa postgame with Coach John Patterson after that game. Don, you're you're good to go for that postgame, right? Two weeks? I lost you for a second there, Corey. I know you do a Missouri Valley game at some point, but you're good in two weeks, correct? Yes, I do a Missouri Valley game this next weekend, Northern Iowa at Illinois State. Okay, well, be sure to tune in and listen to that. Lisa in our chat, former Miss Iowa, says, uh, thank you, Don and Corey. Um, and she added earlier that uh, she can confirm from being a former Miss Iowa winner, Don, that it was not a wave by Cooper DeGene. <laughs> good to know. <laughs> All right, thank you, Lisa. Thank you to everybody. We've been here for over four and a half hours. I said we were never going to do that again, but I've never seen an ending to a game like we saw earlier today. Uh, Iowa falling to six and two in the season with a 12 to 10 loss at the hands of the Minnesota Gophers. Keep it locked right here, folks. We've got coverage throughout the week ahead. Iowa women's basketball. I'll give you some reaction take tomorrow after their exhibition. Talk to you very soon right here from the Hawkeye of the Storm. Have a great night.